Good afternoon. At this time, can the host please start the live stream? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Immigration. At this time, we ask that everybody please silence all your electronic devices. If you wish to testify today, you can come up to the sergeant's desk and fill out one of these testimony slips. Written testimony can be emailed to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Shahana Hanif, Chair of the Immigration Committee. I would like to thank everyone joining us for today's oversight hearing on the resources and services for newly arrived asylum seekers. I wanna thank our speaker, Adrian Adams, my council colleagues, representatives from the administration and public for being here, and members of the public for participating remotely. My colleague, council member Ressler, repeated the lines of the poem, The New Colossus, at our rally this morning, but I think they deserve repeating. The most famous line is, inscribed on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But the next line is perhaps even more powerful. Send these, the homeless, tempest most to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And as the representatives of New York City, it is our job to make sure New York City is a sanctuary to all people and that is what this hearing is about. New York City is home to almost 3 million immigrants, 40% of our city's population. In fact, 60% of New Yorkers, myself included, are immigrants or children of immigrants. We pride ourselves on the diversity of our city and value the contributions that the newest immigrants arriving can make to the tapestry of New York. Now, as we see other states send asylum seekers and migrants to our city without notice, it is our responsibility to respond with sw swiftness and empathy. Many of these migrants have traveled through harrowing situations to finally arrive somewhere they can seek refuge and build new lives. We are here today for a few reasons. First, it is important for us, the council and the public, to better understand the resources and services that are available to asylum seekers and migrants entering the city. Additionally, it is essential that we examine this administration's approach to providing these services. While in many ways, city agencies have done admirable work in responding quickly to this unprecedented crisis, it is clear that in other ways, we are failing to meet the basic needs of recent arrivals. Every few days over the past two months, we have seen headlines about migrants who have not been provided shelter, food, or other necessary resources by the city. Fortunately, community-based organizations, mutual aid workers, have stepped in to provide some of these necessary resources. We've also read stories of migrants who are isolated without sufficient mental health care or in-language communication. The tragic suicide of an asylum seeker in city shelter earlier this month illustrates the consequences of lack of resources. Most recently, this administration has announced it is placing asylum seekers in tent camps called HERCs. This is being done with seemingly little, if any, planning or collaboration with elected officials, other community representatives, impacted people, stakeholders, or even their own agency personnel. We are in an emergency, there is no doubt, but I wanna make it clear, this is not how we address the thousands of people coming to our city as asylum seekers. The Orchard Beach location is in a flood zone in the middle of hurricane season. It is outside as uh, cold weather approaches. It is in a transit desert. It is being constructed by a contractor that built Trump's xenophobic border wall. In this hearing, we will be asking this administration why it is pursuing this course of action. The administration has also stated that despite the right to shelter being law in New York City, this will not apply at the Orchard Beach sites and future hercs. 
This raises serious concerns about the conditions in these facilities. I disagree wholeheartedly that the, with the administration circumventing right to shelter, and we will be asking questions regar regarding the consequences of this decision. The migrants arriving in our city have already run the gauntlet of crossing the border to arrive in the US and in New York City to access the security we can provide. It is incumbent upon us as elected representatives to examine how this administration is or isn't complying with the law and to ensure that migrants and asylum seekers have safe places to stay, adequate nutrition, health care, and legal representation while they endeavor to start their lives and contribute to making our city a vibrant and welcoming destination. How much of the city, state, federal funding the administration anticipates to receive uh, is used to providing housing, food, and legal services to the migrants? What have been the conversations between Mayor Adams and the state, federal elected officials to get the stuff done? We have many questions for this administration on how it plans to fulfill the city's obligations to these recently arrived New Yorkers and look forward to hearing their testimony today explaining their processes and plans. I want to thank the committee staff for their work on this issue. A lot of work went into getting to this afternoon's hearing including Jayashree Ganapati, Senior Committee Counsel, uh, Jean Florentine Kabore, F Finance Analyst, and Jun Young Ahn, Community Liaison. I would also like to thank my incredibly smart, brilliant staff, Chief of Staff Nora Brickner, Legislative Director Alexander Liao, Communications Director Michael Whitesides, and everyone working in the background to make this hybrid hearing run smoothly. Now I will turn it over to Speaker Adrian Adams to give opening remarks. Thank you so much, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adrian Adams, Speaker of the New York City Council, and thank you all who've joined us today. Thank you, Chair Hanif, once again, for convening this important hearing on the resources and services for people who have recently arrived in our city seeking asylum from other countries. Over the past few months, it has been reported that thousands of people have arrived in New York City seeking asylum from their home countries to escape desperate economic conditions, political violence, and other crises. This scale, the scale of this migration reflects a dire situation. New York was already suffering, I'm sorry, New York was already offering solace to people seeking asylum when the Texas governor began sending others to our city in an act of political th theater that is disgraceful. We have heard heartbreaking stories of people sent here after being lied to with promises of jobs, housing, and other resources, despite no coordination with New York City. So let me be clear, it is despicable for any governor or government official to politically exploit vulnerable people for political gain, moving human beings around as if this is all a game. I assure you, this is not a game. These are human lives, families, and children these political stunts are dehumanizing and they're shameful. It does not escape me that those who are sending vulnerable people to other states without any real concern about the impact on these lives say they are people of faith. I can tell you as a person of faith, the contradiction is glaring. The rhetoric employed by some false claims that those arriving here in our country seeking asylum are illegal, as if this somehow suggests they're deserving of mistreatment, I want to make clear on the record once again, which no one who comes to this country to seek asylum is here illegally. Under federal law and as a signatory to international laws protecting refugees, this country has an obligation to offer protection from those fleeing persecution, and this legislative body will strive to ensure that they receive the necessary resources to pursue their claims while in our great city. New York City has a responsibility to live up to its values as a sanctuary city, 
and this council intends to help ensure we meet this moment with the compassion and effectiveness necessary in providing the appropriate support to those within our city. We understand that addressing this crisis is challenging and it's complex. It requires significant coordination across city government and support from our state and federal government partners. Many of our city's nonprofit organizations have been working tirelessly to provide resources to individuals and families, filling important gaps. Our city agencies must effectively work together and with all stakeholders to fulfill the comprehensive needs of those seeking asylum here. There are serious concerns that the necessary planning steps to ensure adequate housing and resources for those that need it are lacking, leaving major gaps. Our goal is not to point fingers, but rather ensure our city's efforts are effective at meeting the scale of this crisis and improved through learning. On September 22nd, the administration announced in a press release in its intent to open humanitarian emergency response and relief centers, with the first one to be located in Orchard Beach. Yet, there are many questions about this plan that remain unanswered which many have echoed since the announcement. While additional information has slowly trickled out, there remain many outstanding concerns and questions, including about their role, location, and suitability. These centers are not replacements for temporary shelter, and given the strain on our shelter system, there needs to be a better understanding of the city's plan to provide shelter. Furthermore, shelter is just one aspect of support that is needed, so I'm very eager to hear what other forms of assistance the city is providing to those seeking asylum, how this is being done while budget reduction measures are being pursued, and how our city government is responding and intends to successfully respond. It is also helpful to identify challenges that the response effort is facing and can be resolved through collaboration. The city's resources are being pulled from all angles, so it's going to take careful planning, meticulous oversight, and ongoing transparency to ensure that appropriate services and resources are provided and that no one slips through the cracks. I hope that through hearings like this one today, we will highlight the real people that have been impacted by this crisis and the supports they need. We also hope to receive greater insight into how the city is providing resources and how the council can continue to support and improve upon these efforts. We will continue to conduct oversight hearings on this issue to increase transparency and awareness in order to ensure the city's response lives up to our values and the great expectations we have of New York City's government. So I look forward to hearing the testimony of the administration. Welcome again. Before you begin, I would like to also give my thanks to the committee staff for putting this hearing together and all of the people who are working in the background and in Cyberland. I now turn it back over to Chair Hanif. Thank you, I'll pass it to Jayashree. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Speaker. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jay Sriganapathy. I am counsel to the Committee on Immigration. Uh, I would first like to acknowledge the council members who are present with us for the record. Uh, I see council member De La Rosa and Krishnan and, sorry, council member Ung. <laughs> um, before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that is joining the, us via Zoom that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. I will be calling on public witnesses to testify in panels of four after the conclusion of the administration's testimony and the council members' questions, so please listen carefully for your name to be called. Council members, you will be called on for questions after the full panel has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes. Please note, for the purposes of this hearing, we will be allowing a second round of questioning. For public witnesses, once your name is called, if you are joining us via Zoom, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. So please listen for that. For fairness of all testifying today, all public testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. When the sergeant announces that your three minutes are up, 
we ask that you please wrap up your comments so we can move on to the next person. If you do require interpretation services, please let us know. We do have Spanish language interpretation available for this hearing. I will now swear in the administration. Uh, I believe today we have with us the Mayor's Office, in, Office of Immigrant Affairs, Commissioner Castro. Uh, we have from New York City Emergency Management, Commissioner Zach Iskol and Deputy Commissioner Jake Cooper. We also have uh, for question and answer support from Health and Hospitals, Dr. Ted Long. Um, from Department of Homeless Services, Molly Park, Deputy Commissioner, first Deputy Commissioner. Uh, from Department of Education, we have Senior Executive Director, Melissa Ramos. And from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we have Executive Dir Director, Rishi Sood. Um, I will first read the oath and after I'll call on each member from the administration to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the, this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Castro? Commissioner Iskol? Uh, Deputy Commissioner Cooper? I do. Dr. Long? I do. Uh, com Deputy Commissioner Park? I do. Senior Executive Director Ramos? I do. And Executive Director Sood? Um, council member, you may begin. Oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner Castro, you may begin. Good afternoon, uh, Speaker Adrian Adams, Chair ha ha Shahana Hanif, and members of the Immigration Committee. Thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Manuel Castro, and I am the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. I am joined by Sasak Isco, Commissioner of the New York City Office of Emergency Management, as well as my colleagues from Health and Hospitals, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Homeland Services, and the Department of Education, who will be available for questions and answers. Our city, with approximately 15,000 asylum seekers arriving in a very short amount of time, is currently experiencing a complex humanitarian emergency that has been exacerbated by the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, and others who are looking to use this situation for their own political gains. In the beginning of the summer, asylum seekers were arriving in New York City individually and in small groups. Many arrived in the region, particularly in Washington, D.C. bound buses chartered by the state of Texas and Arizona. Not finding support in Washington, D.C., asylum seekers, many of them, found their way to New York City. As of August 5th, uh, my office, along with other city agencies, began to uh, welcome buses at the Port Authority bus terminal. However, today we are now seeing an incredibly high number of people arriving on buses coming from the border. Between four and nine buses arrive every day at Port Authority. And other buses and asylum seekers arrive at other bus terminals, shelter intake centers, and airports throughout the city. Hundreds of people are arriving every day. These individuals range from single adults to families and children. Many have been in the U.S. for only a couple of days before being bused from the border to New York City. But unlike previous groups of migrants and asylum seekers, those arriving now are less likely to have a friend family member or sponsor contact with whom to, to reside. They are arriving to New York City with little more than the clothes on their back. In response, New York City has launched a multi-agency effort to address this unprecedented humanitarian emergency. Unlike the governors of Texas and Arizona, we have welcomed asylum seekers with humanity, showing them the respect they deserve. On August 1st, Mayor Eric Adams launched an emergency procurement declaration to rapidly procure shelter and other services for, see for people seeking asylum in the United States and arriving in New York City. In addition to the supports provided at the shelters and through the education system, we opened New York City's first asylum seeker resource navigation center. The center operated by Catholic Charities of New York through a city contract, 
is supporting individuals and families who have arrived in New York City on or after January 1st, 2022. The center serves as a central place where newly arrived asylum seekers receive free and confidential help to assess a variety of important services and resources that will help them integrate and thrive in New York City. The Navigation Center provides families with access to everything from healthcare to education to immigration, legal services, orientation, so that they can build a life in New York City. These services are also available across, as I said, our shelter system and through our education system. The center is located at the American Red Cross headquarters, and it's open weekdays to provide individuals and families with in-person free and confidential help. New York City government agencies and community-based organizations are on site helping with case management and connecting to critical services. The Navigation Center is accessible by appointment currently. Community-based organizations and city shelter caseworkers are scheduling appointments for asylum seekers. The city will provide asylum seekers with information about the Navigation Center as they arrive by bus, as well as in shelters and through community-based organizations in the five boroughs. In the coming weeks, the city will release information about the satellite sites where asylum seekers can access similar or additional services throughout the five boroughs. Finally, it is critical and paramount that our local government, the state, and the federal government work together with our administration to further confront the challenges of this complex humanitarian emergency. However, in the interim, we will continue to advocate for the necessary tools to support arriving uh, asylum seekers. Such, such resources will include opportunities to access federal government assistance via FEMA's Emergency Food and Shelter Program, the Community Development Block Grants, and the Emergency Solutions Grant. Lastly, we will continue to urge USDHS to provide asylum seekers with expedited employment authorization. We just can't do this alone. I don't know when this humanitarian emergency will end, but what I do know is that in New York City, we have been and will continue to be a welcoming city, a city of immigrants, and will continue to come together to support those seeking refuge and will be a beacon for hope for so many around the world. We have, and under this administration, will continue to welcome asylum seekers from every corner in the world and ensure, working with our council members and our colleagues in government, that these, arri these arriving, newly arrived immigrants will have the support they need to thrive in our neighborhoods. Lastly, I want to thank my entire team at Immigrant Affairs for going above and beyond to help those in need and to all the city employees who are stepping up to remind the world what New York City is all about. Unlike Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis, New York City will always stand on the right side of history, and I think we've demonstrated that so far. I want to also thank the community-based organizations that are here today, especially Team TLC and the volunteers that have been working tirelessly every morning to welcome asylum seekers from the first day we began working with them at, a, at Port Authority. I want to thank the New York Immigration Coalition, the Hispanic Federation, Mesteca, and other organizations that are here who have also been co collaborating with us at our Welcome Center at Port Authority to make sure that asylum seekers receive the welcome they deserve. I also want to acknowledge Pedro, who is here today, who will be testifying. He's an asylum seeker who recently arrived in one of the buses uh, that we're welcoming at Port Authority. He's here with Team TLC. Uh, I want to thank him for his courage and for being here to give voice to asylum seekers who've been through so much. I just want to say in Spanish, gracias, Pedro, por su valentía, por estar aquí con nosotros. Es un orgullo poder testificar junto a usted. Uh, lastly, as many of you know, I myself crossed the U.S.-Mexico border when I was five with my mother. And 
I just want to express that it has been the honor of my life to be able to welcome asylum seekers, as I wish my family would have been welcomed here when we arrived those many decades ago. And you have my commitment to continue to support asylum seekers and fight every single day for immigrant communities in New York City. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, and if I may, Commissioner, it's also been one of the honors of my life to be able to work alongside you in this work, so thank you. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to take a minute and uh, recognize the loss yesterday of FDNY Lieutenant Allison Russo Elling um, and express my sincere condolences and sorrow and grief for her family, her loved ones, and the men and women of the FDNY EMS. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Speaker Adams, Chairperson Hanif, uh, and members of the committee, I am Zach Eskel, Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. And I am here to discuss the coordinating role that New York City Emergency Management is playing in the current surge in asylum seekers in New York City. First, I want to briefly explain our role in city government and in emergency response. New York City Emergency Management helps New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The agency is responsible for coordinating citywide emergency planning and response for all types and sizes of emergencies. It is staffed by more than 200 dedicated professionals with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise, including individuals detailed from other city agencies. As the coordinating agency for the City of New York, emergency management functions as a general facilitator when it comes to emergency response. We ensure that resources are available for our sister agencies to complete their core competencies and serving New York's and what can be New Yorkers in what can be their worst days with compassion and cultural competency. The recent influx of asylum seekers seeking refuge in New York City is an incredibly challenging task, and it's a great example of collaboration amongst our city's agencies. We are facing a humanitarian crisis, and it has never been clear that we need to that we need to help and support them. Emergency management continues to coordinate between the incoming buses of asylum seekers and providing logistical support to the operations of the Asylum Seeker Resource Navigation Center. The center, which opened on August 25th and is operated by Catholic Charities of New York through a city contract, streamlines city and nonprofit services into a one-stop shop. It serves as a central place for newly arrived asylum seekers to receive free and confidential help, accessing important services and resources that will help them integrate and thrive in New York City. Emergency management is also coordinating with city agency partners at the Welcome Center located at the Port Authority. Those arriving can receive light medical care, water, PPE, and COVID testing. EMS is also located there in the event that someone needs emergency treatment. Individuals can also receive information for shelter in the event that they do not have friends, family, or a sponsor to lean on. Emergency management is also coordinating the opening of humanitarian emergency response and relief centers. The first in Orchard Beach will serve adults and will likely open next week. These centers will be operated by emergency management and health and hospitals, completely outside of the DHS shelter system. They will be the first touch point for arriving asylum seekers by immediately offering shelter, food, medical care, casework services, and a range of settlement options, including through connections to family and friends inside and outside of New York City, in addition to, if needed, direct referrals to alternative emergency support or city shelters. All spaces will be safe, secure, climate controlled, and are built to withstand weather year round. Emergency management has an emergency contract that will provide for wraparound services such as food and water, clothes, diapers, and other care products, and other human service needs. This is a true interagency effort, and we continue to work with our partner agencies, as well as contracted partners and provided providers to provide comprehensive on-site services and referrals. We do not know when the influx of asylum seekers will end or when it will slow down, but we are here for the duration of this event. New York City is a cultural mecca enriched by its diverse population, and a second home to those who make the difficult decision to leave their home country in search of opportunities. 
Emergency Management is proud to assist in this humanitarian effort. It is not only our responsibility as a city to help them adjust and regain their livelihoods, but I believe it is an incredibly important investment in the future of New York City. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, Council Member Jen Gutierrez, for joining this afternoon. Um, thank you so much, and I've had the honor of um, being at the Port Authority on several occasions and having to see exactly how uh, the welcoming is taking place and seeing your leadership, Commissioner Castro, on the ground very, very early hours of the morning and um, inviting asylum seekers in with grace and dignity and love. I've seen the work of TLC, I've seen the work of the New York Immigration Coalition, the South Bronx Mutual Aid, um, NICE, Mesteca, Masbia, and so that is also, all of that is also informing the questions I'll be asking, but I wanna begin with Commissioner Iskall and our right to shelter. So again, um, the mayor shared that right to shelter protections will not apply to the HERCs. I recognize that these are extremely challenging circumstances and in so many ways our city agencies have stepped up to meet the moment. However, I wanna share that I wholeheartedly um, disagree with the decision and that we should be doing everything we can to provide asylum seekers with decent conditions that meet bare minimum standards. The right to shelter is a right that applies to everyone in New York City. No amount of legal gymnastics can justify what's happening here. The administration is carving out asylum seekers from this basic right. Can you share specifically which elements of right to shelter protections under the Callahan Consent Decree will not be in place in the HERCs? So let me start by saying the city is 100% committed to meeting our legal requirements under Callahan and right to shelter. And the HERCs are not a replacement for right to shelter or the shelters. Um, nor are we carving out a population from right to shelter. Uh, in fact, what we have identified with this population is there are distinct needs that need to be met um, when they get off the buses. And right now we are trying to meet that at the Port Authority Terminal, um, and that is not the best place to do it. Um, you've been there, you've seen the operation. Uh, the teams there are doing great work. Um, but the buses come in. Uh, we immediately try to provide people, sort of see if there's people that have immediate medical needs. Uh, and then we basically are, are putting people into one of three groups. They're either meeting up with their family members, they are getting reticketed somewhere else, or they're going into our shelter system. And we have about 45 minutes to an hour to do all of that work. And that is simply not enough time. It's not enough time to provide them the care and the concern, in your words, the grace and dignity and love that they deserve. And so these HERCs are really set up not to replace the shelter system, but to give us the space and time to do that operation correctly to make sure that we are figuring out what the needs of people are, to welcome them with a shower, a warm me meal, meet their immediate medical needs, and then figure out what the next step is going to be for them. Whether that is the shelter system, whether it's reticketing somewhere else, whether it's uniting them with a family member or a sponsor, that's the purpose of that operation. By no means is it there to replace or somehow prevent them from entering the shelter system, and anybody who wants to go into the shelter system can still do so. So just to um, get back to the original question, the right to shelter protections are in place. Absolutely. For the single adult HERCs, um, will beds be at least three feet apart? We are so we are still uh, figuring out the exact spacing of the beds and also of showers and those types of facilities as, the, as it's being set up. Could you repeat that one more time? Yes, we're still figuring out some of the placements of where beds and showers and those ratios right now. So that's no, right now you're unsure if they will be three feet apart. Again, if you're referring to Callahan, anybody who wants to enter the shelter system is able to do so. 
Will beds be at least 30 inches in width? Um, I can get you those details on what the beds will actually look like in the spacing. I'm asking these questions, and I've got a couple more, um, because a photo was released sharing what this tent city would look like. And based off of that photograph, it does not seem like um, we're meeting the right to shelter. On I don't know what the calendar. photograph is that you're set up. The facilities don't have beds put them in yet, so those are not photos from the facility that we have set up. And again, I'm happy to share more information about the size of the I mean, beds that would be great because it, the construction is in place, and right now, you don't know if beds will be at least three feet apart. You don't know if beds will be at least 30, width, 30 inches in width. I don't have that information on me, but I'm happy to get it to you. And then will basic um, clean linens be provided, like pillows, pillowcases, blankets, sheets? Yes. And then will there be one shower per every 15 residents? That's the objective, correct, Dr. Long? Yes. Yep, that's the objective. Will there be one toilet per every 10 residents? It, it might be 16, but again, I can get you those exact it might numbers. Be. It might be 16, but I can get you those exact numbers. 16 residents? And then will residents be offered a way to store or lock their personal belongings and valuables? Yes. Okay, could you share a little bit more about where? I'm, I'm happy to provide more of that information. Yep. Do you have a sense of? We, we're going to be using lockers um, and other types of storage facilities. Inside? The yes, inside the facility. And then how will you accommodate migrants with disabilities, including physical, mental, and cognitive disabilities at these sites? I'll turn that over to Dr. Long from Health and Hospitals. Thank you. Yeah, hi, and I just at the outset, I want to thank you for convening us together. These questions are really important for us to hear now so that we can effectively plan all of this together moving forward. Um, as New York City Health and Hospitals is going to be operating the new emergency humanitarian uh, shelter, um, sorry, centers, we, we take very seriously um, making sure that everybody feels comfortable. So per ADA standards, we're going to have an actual an ADA coordinator so that anybody with disabilities can have somebody that they can talk to and we can make, we're making sure that all of the facility um, requirements are going to meet ADA standards, but more than that, to make sure that people that have disabilities have somebody that they can go to and discuss what their needs are so we can make sure that everybody's comfortable and all needs are met. Does that ADA coordinator exist at the moment? They will exist prior to it opening. Okay, so right now, as we are welcoming asylum seekers over 15,000, what has, how have, how have um, those with disabilities um, received accommodations? So the, <coughs> excuse me, the Department of Homeless Services shelter system, right, which is, has been serving uh, the bulk of the asylum seekers that have come in thus far. We, we certainly don't. There may be others who are with uh, friends and family who have never come into the shelter system, but the 15,000 refers to those who have come to, this, to, to DHS. Um, we have a range of accessible facilities across our system. Not every shelter, certainly, but as, <coughs> excuse me, either a family or a single adult comes into the system, we will assess their needs. Um, if there's uh, an obvious and apparent need, so for example, somebody in a wheelchair, we will immediately place them in an accessible facility. If they are ne have needs that are less obvious and apparent, right, for example, they need a refrigerator for medication, um, we will work with them to document that and, and place them in a, in a site that can accommodate those needs. And then moving on to um, families, will families with minor children be given private dwellings? So we're still in the process of setting up additional HERCs and identifying locations, but the answer to that is yes. Do you have a location for? We do not at this time. When will you have that? Uh, you know, we're working on it as quickly as possible. Um, we are still looking at locations um, that provide uh, the ability to house families with young children um, with privacy and in non-congregate settings. Um, and just to have this on the record, can you commit to not placing families with minor children in congregate settings? I can tell you that we do not want to place families in congregate settings, yes. 
you do not want to, but it, you're making it sound like there's a possibility that they might. I, I can tell you this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis, right? And that I can't tell you what is going to happen in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, but I can tell you this administration is 100% committed to not housing children in congregate settings, yes. And then how will adult families with minor children be served at HERCS? So this, the details of the family HERCS are still being worked out. And will couples be able to stay together? Yes. And then just continuing on um, our right to shelter, the administration has justified circumventing right to shelter by saying um, placement in the HERCS is voluntary um, and that asylum seekers can choose at any point to utilize their traditional shelter system. I wanna um, dig in here a little bit. Isn't centralizing intake and wraparound services on Orchard Beach effectively coercing people into foregoing their right to shelter? Not at all. The purpose of the HERC is to figure out what people's next move is. And I think we should be clear, too, that somebody entering the shelter system is not necessarily a success if their goal is to get to Miami, or their goal is to get to San Antonio, or their goal is to link up with a family member. Um, and the HERCs provide us that mechanism to do that. If somebody's next destination is a shelter, we will get them to a shelter immediately. Of the asylum seekers who've arrived, how many have um, had another destination to go to? It's 22%. Could you give a number? So there's been just over 15,000 that have entered the shelter system. Uh, subtract 78% uh, and there you go. <laughs> What mechanisms are in place to ensure that asylum seekers uh, know that they have the option to bypass the HERC system and utilize a shelter system where they will have superior conditions? So we are providing a legal orientation uh, to asylum seekers when they enter the HERCs. Um, Dr. Long, anything that you'd want to add to that? No. No? Okay. Wait, could you repeat that one more time? Uh, we are providing a legal orientation to asylum seekers as part of the intake process. And I think it might also be helpful uh, for Dr. Long to explain the intake process and what we're doing actually when folks arrive. Um, the work that Health and Hospitals is doing is truly remarkable um, in terms of the care that they are providing and the compassion and the way that they have set this up. They truly are world class. So Dr. Long. This is a crisis and we at New York City Health and Hospitals raised our hand to want to do our part to help. So I'll walk you through the experience of an adult, not just single adults, but adults that would be coming into one of our new emergency humanitarian centers. So uh, right now, you're going to, the buses are going to Port Authority. You'll get on another bus to come to one of our new humanitarian emergency centers. You'll get off the bus and you'll be greeted by a comfort team. We know that you've come a long way to, to see us here in New York City. We're gonna offer you food and water before we do anything else. Next, we're going to get started on the mainstay of what we do at the Humanitarian Center. We're going to start with case management. Uh, our goal is to figure out where you want to go and do everything in our power to help you to get there. So we're gonna start that on day one. And you know, as Commissioner Iskell said earlier, right now that piece is being done in 45 minutes, as you know, at Port Authority. What if you wanna get through to a relative and they don't pick up the phone? Then, then you've lost the opportunity there. We wanna give a full 24 to 96 hours for us to do everything in our power to again get you where you want to be. Uh, once you start that process, we're also going to orient you to a variety of other things on site. I was just there myself this morning. Um, so yes, we do have, we're going to have cots in separate areas. There's going to be one area for um, single men that are adults. We're going to have one area for single women. And we're going to have one area for couples or people that are adults, maybe a mother and an adult child, something like that. Um, we're going to orient you to where you're just going to be uh, staying, but during the day, we're going to have a dining hall that's going to have three hot meals a day um, that's all going to be um, well, with South American cuisines with multiple options for people with multiple dietary preferences. We're going to have a recreation uh, room just to make sure that people can uh, hopefully take an opportunity to, to, to get a breath. They've gone, come a very long way. Um, we're going to have iPads, we're going to have phones so that you can try to reach out to family members. And the purpose of this 
short-term stay, and I, I actually think the, the speaker said this very nicely, is we want to be, uh, provide compassion and effectiveness to achieve the goal of the unique needs of people coming into our city, individuals and families seeking asylum. And one of, their, one of their goals, we know, is to get to different places either inside or outside of our city. 45 minutes of Port Authority is not enough time. 96 hours with a strong focus and us doing everything in our power to help them, I think, I think we stand a much better chance of being able to make the difference for them that we seek to make. We're also going to be providing some other services, which I'm happy to talk about now or, or later, um, uh, at the Humanitarian Center as well, including medical care. How many uh, staff or personnel will be there to administer this form or process? So we're going to have hundreds of staff there, um, but not just our staff. Uh, last night, I personally reached out to several of our mo some of our most engaged, and thank you for joining us today to our community-based organizations. You're, you, are, you are your communities, and we want to make sure that this is not just our staff, it's a combined effort. If we work together at all this, we're going to have a stronger response. So the, if uh, you're at one of our humanitarian centers, it may be a member of our staff that's talking to you, it may be a doctor that's talking to you, or it may be a community-based organization that's talking to you. And I'm proud to uh, be a New York City resident knowing that that's our approach. It's not just, you know, outsourced staff. It's, um, it's uh, really New Yorkers there stepping up to take care of our own. I'll pass it to our speaker for questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all again for your testimony thus far. Dr. Long, you really just hit on something that I was going for first. So you just hit on that. I was going to ask for those, the majority that have never gone to Port Authority to see what it looks like when an asylum seeker steps one foot off of the bus, I was going to ask you to take, that, take the room through the process, and you just did that, so thank you. <coughs> Let's talk about Orchard Beach. Orchard Beach is a remote part of the city. Right? Um, it's not serviced well by public transportation, so I think the vast majority of us and probably of our, our New York City wants to know why this location was chosen. I'm happy to take that. Um, Thank you, uh, Speaker Adams, for your question. So my team has now looked at over 60 locations across the city. Um, and I want to start by saying there is no perfect location to do this work. There simply isn't. Um, there are uh, some that are filled with um, warehouses filled with uh, chemicals and equipment, asbestos. There are places that have programming that we would have to displace. Um, there are places that um, have a whole host of other issues. And so our team has to go out and go through a process of making sure that the spaces meet these needs. Orchard Beach is only the first of probably many other HERCs that we might have to establish. It's also the one that we could build the quickest. And the intent is not to keep the HERC in Orchard Beach going for a long period of time. Um, but again, we don't know how the needs are going to develop. Uh, we are well aware of many of the concerns of Orchard Beach in terms of transportation. Uh, we are working with the state uh, to uh, create transportation options for people to get to the 6 train um, from Orchard Beach. We have a request for them to provide bus service uh, from 5.40 a.m. to 12.40 a.m., um, so 20 hours. Uh, throughout the day to provide that option for people to have transportation. Does it look like that'll be set up by next week when you're due to go, go yes. live? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And we have other transportation options as well to transport people to shelters and other places that they might need to go through shuttles and other services. Um, in addition to that, I know there's a lot of concern raised uh, and uh, Council Member Hanif brought this up about um, the flood zone. Um, so there is different types of flooding that we have to prepare for. Um, there are coastal storms, there is flooding caused by tides, and there is flooding caused by rainfall. When you think about a coastal storm like a hurricane, uh, you generally have three to five, maybe six days in advance to prepare. And if we are evacuating zone one, a hurricane evacuation zone one, we are evacuating about 500,000 people. If it's two zones, it's about a million people. And so the plan would be to take the asylum seekers and put them into our coastal storm shelters, just like we would anybody else. Uh, the, uh, the buildings that, that are being constructed up there, I don't like using the word tents because they can sustain 90 mile per hour winds. Uh, they actually 
drill down um, a few feet in order to place them in the ground. These are very sturdy structures. Um, but they can remove the panels, they can remove the tops, and they can withstand um, significant weather events. Uh, in terms of um, tidal flooding, uh, king tides, you know, coupled with a nor'easter, we are setting up um, what are called tiger dams, which are flood mitigation efforts um, to protect that site in the case that that would happen. And then in terms of rainfall, uh, flooding from rainfall, the entire city is in a flood zone when it comes to rainfall. We learned that last year uh, during the tragedy of Ida. And so for those types of events, we will have to deal with rainfall no matter what site we use if it's outdoors. Yeah, I, I appreciate your response. This, this, though, is different in that we are actually accepting hundreds and thousands of individuals here. So we are responsible for them, whereas you and I have a choice of going home, knowing that I live in Southeast Queens in a flood zone, by the way. But that's my choice to be there. Um, so we are actually bringing people into our house uh, and, and possibly susceptible them to hazard. Uh, did, the, did the administration consider any other locations prior to Orchard Beach? As I said, we have looked at over 60 locations, and we are continuing to look at s other locations. And it's our hope that at some point in time we displace Orchard Beach to another location. And as I have said, um, you know, we need help in finding locations. Uh, we are looking for places with over 150,000 square feet. That's essentially the size of three football fields. Um, if there are places in any of your districts uh, that come to mind, we would love your help in identifying places where we could do this work. Okay. Now, we know that we have heard uh, from our Bronx Borough President with regard to this location. So uh, her concerns are our concerns as well. Were there any conversations that were held with elected officials in the Bronx or with any community organizations with the Bronx prior to choosing Orchard Beach? Um, we spoke to them uh, the day of. So there really wasn't any preliminary discussion, you know, l let's have a talk about this, let's have a session about this? Not, not for Orchard Beach, but we will make sure we do that in the future for other locations. Okay, that would be my strong suggestion. Um, I think you told us this already, but let's just hear it again. Are asylum seekers required to be processed at the Orchard Beach location? They are not. They are not. Okay, um, how is this communicated to them? Has it been made clear to them um, that they have other options or how will this be communicated to them? As far as the process is concerned and what happens. That for the intake. Yeah, so as part of the case management that we're doing, we will make sure that that is clear. Again, our goal in doing this is if you want to get, I don't know why you want to be anywhere other than New York City, but if you do want to be somewhere other than New York City, we want to do, make sure that we're helping you to get there. Um, we're seeing a lot of, and uh, Molly can share more about this, but we're seeing a lot of um, individuals and families seeking asylum that are coming into our city that really are trying to get the families in other places, and it's really hard to navigate. And it certainly, as you, as you know, um, uh, uh, Chair Hanif, we can't do all of that at uh, Port Authority. We have to have the right space and the right technology to be able to effectively get you where you want to go. M maybe you could share some examples about why this is so important. Sure, and these are all anecdotal, but we again and again see cases where families have been separated. So sometimes these are, you know, a, a father separated from wife and child. Um, they end up on separate buses, sometimes end up in separate cities where there's a lot of family reunification that needs to go, uh, needs to happen, or, or fam people who were intending to go to places other than New York City and because of the way the busing process happened from, from the border, they arrived here even though they would have liked to get off someplace in between or, you know, as was mentioned, you know, be in Miami or, or elsewhere. So we try and do that, um, that work as well of, of connecting people um, and either to their families that, from whom they've been separated or to the, the locations where they would like to go. That's something that we do at shelter intake when we can, but um, much like the situation at the Port Authority, right, when you, the, the, our intake centers were not designed for 
um, what we are seeing. We've, we've had a 30% in uh, increase in the shelter census in six months. Um, typical intake at, say, 30th Street for single adult men is 60 people a night. We're getting 300, 400, 500 people coming through there on a single day. Um, so our ability to do that um, at the moment case management is, is also very limited. So I think having this, um, this moment to pause and help, help individuals uh, identify what their right next step is, is gonna be really useful for, for the individuals, but also for the, um, for the homeless shelter system. And I believe you mentioned 22% uh, is, is, the, is the number of those that are going elsewhere other than New York, correct? Yeah, so uh, I think one of the things that you're seeing is, especially the buses coming out of El Paso, and you have to understand, we don't control the buses, right? We don't control where the buses go. We don't control where they drop people off. Um, we don't know if we're gonna be able to get the charter companies to go to Orchard Beach, or if we're gonna to have to transport people from Port Authority to Orchard Beach, or if it's gonna be a mixture. Um, but a lot of people are getting on those buses from, uh, from El Paso because it is the only way out of El Paso. And so we even had somebody, correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Castro, that left El Paso for, to, for, to New York to get to San Antonio um, because it is just easier to get anywhere from New York than it is from El Paso. We believe that there's probably a lot more people than 22% that are looking to get to other locations. Yeah. So when, when a person or persons, when a family decides that, you know, New York is not my destination of choice, I'd rather be in Connecticut, I'd rather be in Massachusetts, we then, we then put them on another bus and send them off to that location. There's a variety of processes, but Commissioner Castro, do you want to talk about how that's currently done at, at Port Authority? I have to say and acknowledge Team TLC who's here today, who's been doing this work since before the situation started. We've learned a tremendous amount from, from working with them at Port Authority. Um, and who, you know, they've been really instrumental in being able to reticket people to different destinations. And frankly, this is a way to relieve uh, the, the resource heavy uh, and, and um, yeah, the resource heavy uh, process of having to reticket someone, as was mentioned, or, or I should mention that the largest population of Venezuelans live in Florida, for instance. And so the majority of people arriving are from Venezuela who want to be with close to family and friends. So to reticket folks to Florida, it would take a bus or even a flight. And we don't want the, the, the expense and the brunt of that to, to be on the nonprofits. Instead, we want to pay, be able to pay for that and coordinate that effort and allow nonprofits to provide other types of support uh, to these individuals. Understood, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question before I do. I just want to acknowledge that we are being watched by former immigration chair, Carlos Menchaca, uh, who I served with for many years in this council. Hi, Carlos. Uh, he is in El Paso with his family right now too, and he's very interested in this hearing as well. Um, we know that we have a maximum of 96 hours that, that uh, we're dealing with for the asylum seekers at the Orchard Beach location. So how are we going to track this? How, how are we tracking the maximum hours that individuals will be uh, retained at Orchard Beach? So I'll turn this over to Dr. Long in one second to answer that, but I just wanna be clear, the goal is 96 hours. Yes. This is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Understood. And you know there are some estimates in terms of the tens of thousands of, of asylum seekers who could come here. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that we are, we're setting that expectation. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Long? Yeah, so, I, and I think, as Commissioner Eskel said, if it looks like it's going to take 100 hours, 110 hours, 120, whatever it is, to get you where you need to go, the whole reason we're doing this is to help you and get you where you need to go, and we're going to get to know you while you're there. Um, so there's not a hard and fast at 96 hours that triggers something to happen. It's good to set a goal, though, so our goal is, instead of, again, having the concentrated amount of time, which I want to say you've done God's work at Port Authority, 
Um, you know, I think we've done everything possible there to help people, but we want to do more built on the great work that uh, our not-for-profits have done so far at Port Authority. Um, and we want to give ourselves 96 hours to do that work. Um, if it looks like it's going to take longer, though, we're not going to shy away from doing what we need to do to do the right thing for the individuals and families uh, that will be staying with us at our humanitarian centers. Thank you very much. Um, I do have another meeting to go to. I appreciate your testimony here today. Um, I would like for my colleagues, and I'm going to be watching after uh, my meeting, for my colleagues to, and I know they will, uh, to, to touch on the stress of the system, because that would have been my next line. If, if I had the opportunity to do another round, I would go into the stress um, on our current system. But I do thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker, for your excellent questions. So I want to um, pick up on uh, the reticketing. Um, Commissioner Castro, so I know you gave a shout out to TLC. Is TLC effectively covering the costs, or do you have, does your agency have funding to cover the cost of the tickets? Yes, Team TLC and uh, sometimes other nonprofits cover the cost of reticketing. Um, DHS has resources uh, to also reticket, as, as Molly mentioned. Uh, we really want to centralize things, however, and take uh, you know resources that we now have available to be able to reticket uh, at the humanitarian center. So, as of this week, um, has Moya reticketed any? No, the the city does not reticket, and initially, uh, as you you know. Uh, uh, initially, it was very difficult for us to reticket individuals because we did not want to be caught in the same, you know, type of uh, loop that Texas and others were, you know, sending folks out to other lo locations. Um, but we figure out how to do that, and as I said, or as Dr. Long said, we want to make sure to be to have the time uh, to support families. Uh, to get to their next destination. That's something that's really difficult to do at the Port Authority with the short amount of time we have there. And has DHS covered any cost of tickets? Yes, DHS has a program, a longstanding program actually, that, that facilitates um, people's move to friends or family elsewhere in the country. Um, we, early on in this process, in, as the emergency started to, to build, we made some changes to that program. We used to require um, some forms of documentation that weren't possible for the asylum seekers, so we have streamlined the documentation requirements, um, and we, we have used that. Um, again, it's, it's challenging to use it in the, we do do it, but it is challenging even in the immediacy of DHS intake, which is, while not 45 minutes, still a uh, high volume and, and very focused process. So um, it is something that, that happens more at the shelter system, so after people have already um, made it further into the, into the process. So I think this, the perks present an opportunity to connect people with that reticketing earlier in their experience with New York City. So as of this week, how many um, people, uh, how many people's tickets has DHS paid for? I'm going to have to follow up with you on that number. Um, and then Commissioner Castro for the gracious work that TLC has done to purchase tickets. How, do you know how much money has gone into uh, reticketing? Uh, from Team TLC, I believe it's in tens of thousands. We'll have to, we'll have to connect with Team TLC. Uh, again, uh, they've done a tremendous amount of work with little resources, mostly with volunteers. Uh, so, you know, we're working with Granny's Respond, who's their fiscal sponsor. Uh, $60,000, I'm told, that it's cost Team TLC to be That's able to a lot do of this. money. Yeah. Um, does the city plan to reimburse them? Well, we're working with Granny's response uh, to get up to speed to be able to contract with the city. As you know, it's uh, it's you know it, it it's an involved process. Uh, Team TLC does not have a 
501c3 currently, and so they'll need to use Granny's response. Who is their national umbrella group to be able to engage with city contracting processes? Got it, okay. Uh, Commissioner Iskall. So I just wanna come back to the right to shelter stuff again, and you know some of what you've outlined during our earlier conversation contradicts right to shelter. And so I just wanna ask on the record, yes or no, will the facility meet the right to shelter requirements? The facility is not a homeless shelter. The facility is a humanitarian emergency response uh, So can you response plainly and say yes center. or no? Uh, our shelters, our homeless shelters run by DHS meet all of the requirements of Callahan because they are homeless shelters. These are not homeless shelters. They don't fall under Callahan. But where we meet the requirement of Callahan is anybody who wants to go to a homeless shelter is more than welcome to do so. But these are emergency relief and response centers because to meet the needs of this humanitarian crisis. Got it, so they won't meet the need for right to shelter. They, they are humanitarian emergency response and relief centers. They are not homeless shelters. Um, what mechanisms are in place could you share to ensure that asylum seekers know that they have the option to bypass um, the HERC system and, and utilize the shelter system? I mean, the, the whole purpose of the HERC, right, is to figure out where people are going next. So one of those destinations is the, is the homeless shelter system. So by nature, the entire mission is organized around figuring out where they are going to go next, whether it's a homeless shelter, whether it's a family, whether it's reticketing to another place. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the organization that we're setting up. Can I uh, so could you Dr. Long, do just you add this clarity to, add to, the, to the mechanism? Yeah, so as part of case management, when we're asking you if there's any friends or family that you'd want to stay with inside of the city, outside of the city, we're also going to at talk to you about shelters. Because if you tell us on day one that the place where you want to be is within our excellent shelter system in New York City, you don't need to wait four days. The 96 hours, while well, I said earlier, we want to make sure we give ourselves plenty of time to do everything we can to help you to reach those family members. If we can uh, find out where you want to go in one day, whether it's to a family member or it's to, into our shelter system, you can, uh, we'll, we'll get you there that day. We'll get you there the following day. You don't need to stay in the humanitarian centers for any amount of time. Uh, so that's going to be a key part of, uh, of our discussion with all the individuals and families that are coming into our city, because our goal is to get you where you want to be. Understood. So if a person at a HERC decides they want to leave the HERC, um, how are they logistically being transferred to uh, the DHS system? Uh, by shuttle vans. By? By, by vans. By, by vans. shuttle vans. Yeah. Um, and like, how are, like, who are they communicating with? Like, what's the kind of on the ground? Give us a picture of what, what's, what it's looking like on the ground. Well, I'll start and then actually this is a good example because what I'm going to say is we do a warm handoff to DHS. Um, so once we identify that if where somebody wants to be is within our shelter system, the mechanism will be in a van, but we'll have a warm handoff in coordination with our DHS shelter system so that when they're going to the intake center, they'll know they're coming, that sort of thing. And Molly can share more about how the warm handoff is going to work. Sure. So DHS is standing up a centralized intake site for uh, for asylum seekers so that what has been happening thus far is that families are going to one site, their fa traditional family intake site in the Bronx, single adult men go to 30th Street, so on. What we are doing is, is consolidating all of that for the asylum seekers. So we will have one location. We will have staff that are specialized in working with the asylee population. We will build relationships between the on-the-ground staff at the HERC and, and at the, the sanctuary intake site so that we are able to uh, plan for who is coming in, um, do the, the very basic shelter intake, which streamline that because we are getting information, um, facilitate those family reunifications that I mentioned because right now those are happening on a very retail basis they are they are challenging a lot of um, families are here without phones so we are we're sort of patching that together so um, the information shared will will help us do that and then um, and then be able to make a placement within the DHS shelter system and then I'm assuming that this mechanism as like there's this warm handoff um, this is language accessible there are folks who are speaking in the language is comfortable um, by our asylum seekers, 
Could you share a little bit more about how staff is going to be trained to provide compassionate care? Fighting for the. Um, so I'll speak on the humanitarian center side, and then I'll turn um, to Molly to speak more on the DHS side. So language access is crucially important, and I say this as a primary care doctor myself. One of the things that I've, uh, that makes me proud to work in New York City Health and Hospitals is I have patients that speak tens of languages where I practice in the Bronx. Um, our language line for health and hospitals um, has over 250 languages and dialects that it offers interpretation for. We're going to be offering 240 languages and dialects through our interpreter service that we're going to have at the humanitarian centers, but that's only a piece of it. Um, we are looking to, again, work with our community-based organization partners who also speak the languages of their communities, of the people coming to seek asylum. We're uh, setting the goal of having 85% of our vendor staff that we um, are bringing on uh, to be bilingual. Um, so we're, we, and we're going to have interpreters on site. We're going to have sign language capability as well. So we really want to make sure that there's no barriers to people feeling comfortable and being able to have, an, uh, to use the speaker's words again, an effective experience to let us help them get where they need to go. Um, and then in terms of making sure that we're meeting them where they are too, just to say a couple words about mental health, um, because it goes hand in hand. Uh, when you come through the front door, we want to be able to speak with you in your preferred language, but we also want to be able to identify everything that you've been through. So we're also not only making sure that our staff are bilingual with uh, interpretation services, but also uh, we're training our staff in mental health first aid so that we can identify, and again, this is what we do on the healthcare side. We, it's, we want to be able to identify who is not just in a mental health crisis, but who's suffering from a mental health issue that we can begin to address there and bridge them into wherever they need to be. So we're going to be training our, our staff in mental health first aid. We're going to be training our staff in trauma-informed care. We're even doing a special training this next week starting at the Navigation Center. Uh, we have in New York City, um, we're proud to take care of people that su have survived torture at Bellevue and, and uh, Libertas Clinic uh, at Elmhurst. Uh, we offer, we've offered this care for years. The leaders of those clinics are going to specifically come to train our staff to make sure that we can uh, offer that sort of training in compassionate care wherever we are, which includes in our centers. Um, and then finally, we are going to make sure that when you come through the front door, as we're speaking to you in your preferred language, as we're seeing what you need from a mental health perspective, that we are, are going to be able to connect you with NYC well um, as well, which is something we have uniquely in New York City where we can actually have you speak with a mental health professional almost instantly, either in your phone, we'll be providing Wi-Fi, or we'll have uh, iPads and phones there as well. Do you want to more? Sure, thank you. DHS places a similar premium on, on language accessibility. Um, many of our provide DHS staff and provider staff are bilingual, um, but recognizing the really unprecedented nature, we've done an $8.2 million emergency solicitation for enhanced uh, um, interpretation services and are deploying uh, interpreters to two critical sites to make sure that we are meeting people's language access needs. We do use the language line as well um, to be able to serve specialized dialects or if there isn't somebody um, available at the point in time recognizing that we're you know, a high volume and 24-7 operation. So um, really a premium there. Um, I'll come back to some more questions around mental health services. Uh, but on the language access services, $8.2 million, could you share how that's being allocated, how that's going to get spent? Um, we're actually really trying to be as nimble as possible. This is uh, you know, th actually the landscape of what we, the universe of people we are serving now looks different than it did even when we put the solicitation out a few weeks ago. Um, this is, I think, the last time that we testified here. Um, we were saying 100 people, 100 asylum seekers a day coming in the system. It's now more like three to 500 people a day. So um, we are identifying the sites with the highest demand, which certainly is intake, um, but also the sites that we are, um, the shelters that have the highest population of asylees. Um, and we are, so we are deploying uh, the interpretation services as needed, but again, really trying to be nimble. And then for, for the providers, like let's say like the people doing the interpreting, um, these are paid, paid folks. Correct. Okay. Um, can the administration guarantee that nobody will be held at a HERC overnight when they've made it clear um, that they prefer to utilize the shelter system? 
Um, that's the intent, yes. We'll hold you to that. And then can you guarantee that nobody will be referred to the HERC from a shelter intake or other DSS, DHS facility? I think there could be unique circumstances where somebody is in a DHS shelter and needs to be reticketed, but that's not the intent. And again, I think one of the things that I just want to emphasize here is this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Totally. And that there is a lot that we don't know and there's a lot that we're going to learn. And there are going to be things that we have to adjust on the fly based on a lot of things that are outside of our control. Um, but the intent is that this is a one-way street from the HERC to the shelter system and not from the shelter system back to the HERC. What will you do to um, prevent that, where somebody at a DHS facility is being taken? Uh, I mean, it would have to be something wildly outside of our control where that occurs. Uh, you know, this is, not, this, this is not something that we are intending to do, and, you know, DHS has a lot of the, our own capabilities to do some of this work on their own. I want to give an opportunity to my colleagues for some questions. Councilmember Gutierrez. Thank you, Chair Hanif. I have several questions, so I'm just going to try to read them through. Um, my first question is how soon after uh, a new neighbor arrives and you realize you need to connect them to legal services, how, what is that gap between the time they get to Port Authority or in, in this instance, Orchard Beach, how many hours between their arrival and are they connected to specifically immigration and legal services? Well, so um, when they get to our humanitarian center, we're going to be providing them legal information um, you know, from the outset. If there are identified needs or if they wish to speak with a lawyer, we do have legal services that we provide at our navigation center. And to be clear, our navigation center, both for p individuals and families staying at our humanitarian centers or for individuals and families in our DHS shelters, the navigation center will still continue to exist and provide all of the services it currently does. The services are not necessarily brought to them after you give them the information. It's then up to that person to then locate where these services are. Uh, they would have to come to, if they wish to speak with one of the lawyers at the Navigation Center, as Commissioner Castro said earlier, uh, there's an appointment-based system for getting them into the Navigation Center, and same is true for anybody at DHS, in the DHS shelter as well. And can I assume that the appointments are being facilitated by some of the staff at these centers? Um, I don't want to assume they have internet connection or a phone nonetheless. Uh, well, yes, you, your, your assumption is very safe. Uh, that will be provided by our staff. And in addition to that, we will have Wi-Fi. Perfect. Um, now, and this is for Commissioner Castro. Um, has the city been thinking long term on the realities of eligibility for some of these folks? Asylum, I've worked in immigration before. Asylum is incredibly difficult to secure. I know that you are making strides in trying to expedite, just even being able to have some of these folks secure working papers. But in those instances, not everyone is necessarily coming from, from Venezuela. And I know people have very different reasons for, for migrating. Have you all thought about um, what is the long-term plan for some of these folks? How can we keep them safe? How can we continue to, to just connect them to resources in those instances where they don't qualify? Yes, and thank you so much for that question because it's, it's a really important uh, issue for us. I, you know, we've been you know, thinking about this since before uh, asylum seekers started to arrive in a city. As you probably know, the federal government does not provide legal uh, representation for uh, immigration. Uh, immigrants uh, arriving to our country, and so they are left to rely on, on themselves and local governments who do provide resources. New York City happens to be the, the city government that provides the most resources when it comes to immigration legal services, and there will be several touch points at which asylum seekers will be able to connect with uh, legal support, but the reality is that with tens of thousands of asylum seekers arriving who will need legal assistance, uh, you know, we might not even have enough uh, 
lawyers uh, to be able to work with one of the, each of them in their particular cases, as you mentioned. Uh, asylum seeking cases can take years and are incredibly difficult to work on. Uh, but we're committed to meeting the most uh, immediate needs of asylum seekers as they arrive, which is an orientation of what the asylum seeking process is yeah. and how to go about applying for work permits and connecting with legal services in our city available to all immigrants here. Can I ask you, uh, Commissioner, mm -hmm. just a specific question mm -hmm. about folks, uh, specific that are arriving from Venezuela who have no consulate mm -hmm here um, mm -hmm. that may have lost documentation along the way. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best way or what is a pathway for folks to uh, retain some of those identification documents that they're going to need to even begin an asylum case? What, is some, what are some of the things that we can do in our districts, um, but what are some of the ways that we can also help you in doing that job? Um, it's, it's specifically for folks from Venezuela, it's incredibly difficult for them to retain some of these documents. Uh, yes, and, and you know we you know we thank um, the city council members, uh, Council Member Brewer, for their advocacy uh, with our federal government to uh, support asylum seekers uh, be able to get expedited work permits. For instance, it'll take a whole lot of advocacy, uh, you know, at the federal level to make sure that asylum seekers from Venezuela, for instance, or other countries where there are not enough resources here uh, to get their documentation, but at the border they do get uh, documents that they can use to travel within the country and to um, support them um, in their immigration processes. One of the first things we did, um, because we realized that people's documents were being taken at the border, is work with IDNYC to accept those documents as, as, uh, as points to be able to process their IDNYC. Thank you. I have um, one question for Commissioner Isco. Um, so um, with the announcement from the administration for PEGS, and you mentioned earlier that the idea is to flush these, the, 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 the tent situation at Orchard with hundreds of employees. Where do you see that trade-off happening? For example, in my district, my emergency shelter um, has had a really difficult time uh, employing folks and empl employing folks that either uh, can speak another language or can provide these services. So where, where is the pathway for your agency there to be able uh, to take in hundreds of new staff members to be able to serve folks? And, and how do you see the trade-off happening with proposed cuts that this administration is pushing every agency to make? Yes, so these are being done under, co largely under contracts um, with some additional support from the National Guard, from health and hospitals, uh, from community-based organizations. Um, but I think if, if your question is specifically about how are we, about the funding for this, is that what I'm understanding? I'm, I'm curious about the funding and what the plan is to employ hundreds of people in one time for to be able to do these services. Yeah, so that is largely being done through the contractors um, that are providing uh, most of the services there. They're doing the hiring. We have a staffing contract. We have a uh, building contract, um, a maintenance, uh, that's a building and a maintenance contract. Uh, but also in terms of the funding, there's a lot of conversations that have been taking place with the state and the federal government um, around funding. And the cost, can you share what, what you are all into? Uh, we're still sort of analyzing the cost, but happy to get something to you. Okay, my last question, Chair, I promise. So I have a keen curiosity and connectivity in some of these centers. Um, I also, when you say language line, we had a whole joint hearing here at the City Council about some of the shortfalls of language line. Um, so I'm curious, um, and I heard firsthand from a lot of medical professionals saying that it, they have to use their own cell phone because uh, there are bad spots in the hospitals that they're serving patients in. So I'm curious if you have all um, kind of figured out connectivity in Orchard Beach, for example, or any of these new locations that you're looking at, um, kind of how important, where is the priority level there? If the only the only thing you are using for language access is language line, which is not perfect, um, um, what what is that process for you all to ensure that kind of there are no weak spots that we will not have people who just cannot be connected to language line because there is poor connectivity in these temporary locations? And that's it, Chair. So actually, I, I want to start with um, saying I think you bring up a really important point that um, language, line, lang language line serves a purpose, but um, having an in-person interpreter um, for many people is a, uh, is a preferred option. So we are going to have in-person interpreters at, the, um, at our humanitarian center. 
for those that speak different languages that we don't have in-person interpreters for or bilingual staff for, because again, that's a very important emphasis for us as well. Um, we uh, New York City Health and Hospitals have used language line for many years. Um, I have a patient that it's, uh, I see in the Bronx uh, that, that um, she speaks a, a, um, an uncommon dialect. Uh, she's from Africa. She always smiles when she sees me because then she says as soon as I get uh, language line up and running that I'm one of the only people she can talk to. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've, we have a lot of experience using language line. It's not, uh, for anybody that would prefer to have an in-person interpreter or a bilingual staff member, that will be an option, um, but we're going to make sure we set up language line as we've seen it succeed in our 11 hospitals and 57 community health centers for many years at New York City Health and Hospitals. Thank you so much. I'll now pass it to uh, Councilmember De La Rosa, followed by Councilmember Brewer. Um, you have five, three minutes, but there will be a second round. Thank you. Um, well, let me just say that as a civil service and labor chair, we just had a hearing on the municipal workforce and we understand how stretched most of the agencies have more than 5% vacancy rates. And I'm concerned about how we continue to do and manage through this crisis with proposed pegs. So do you see the proposed pegs um, as a barrier to you being able to serve our new neighbors? No. You sure? I know you're not supposed to ask us for more money, but are you sure you're going to be able to carry out the services? That you know, we at emergency management don't get to pick the emergencies. We have to respond to them, and we have to meet the need. All right. We well, we look forward to having that conversation because from the conversation we had last week at the Civil Service and Labor Committee, it seems like we are at a crisis point with the municipal workforce, and I can probably guarantee you that most of your staff members in your agencies have been working undescribable hours, um, even though they won't say that on the record. Um, so I also have a question as far as the intake process. Um, there is obstacles that exist with the DHS intake process for documentation. One of the things we've been hearing from our providers about is that, for example, if people want to be considered a couple and, and go to a family shelter, they have to be married or in a domestic partnership. And it is incredibly difficult for these people that have their partners, they come from another country here, they have no documents to ha go through the process of being in a domestic partnership in order to uh, qualify. Is there any exceptions to the rules that can be made for some of the traditional uh, intake processes? For example, there's also a question about whether if these people can provide you a list of where they've lived before, before right? That's a common question in the intake process. Are any of those things being taken away um, in this scenario? Yeah, thank you for that question. So for families, both families with children and adult families, um, what traditionally happens is um, somebody comes into intake, they are given a conditional placement, and then there is an eligibility review. What we have been doing for the families who, who come um, who are asylum seekers is people are remaining in that conditional pro status for right now, understanding that they cannot provide all of this, that same documentation and that the same eligibility review process doesn't, doesn't apply. As we are standing up this separate intake site that I referenced earlier, um, we will have a streamlined and somewhat different intake process, recognizing that, again, that to your point that we cannot request all of the same documentation and uh, housing history for people who are coming from out of the country. So if they are not in a domestic partnership, are they being required to be in a domestic partnership? And does, does that include LGBTQ plus couples? So right now, people are staying in these conditional placements. We are neither there, so they are in shelter. We are neither finding them eligible nor ineligible. And we will, um, and we are working with them. In many cases, actually, people are getting domestic partnerships. We're, we're working with I know, with the staff. nonprofits are helping them through those processes. But they should be exempt from having to do that. So we are. In order to get shelter. For this, for this standalone asylum uh, intake site, we are going to have streamlined rules with lower documentation requirements, yes. Okay, if you could update us on when that comes to fruition, because they're here now, right. and they have had to go through this process. So, so nobody is being found ineligible for lack of documentation right now, but we are, um, 
launching that streamlined intake site as of today. It is, I will note, we are starting small, so people are still going through traditional intake sites, um, but we will be, we should be fully up and running there by mid-October. Final question, following up Ch Chair Hanif's um, line of questioning. Is there a script that staff is being trained when a person is, is taken to the Orchard Beach site? Um, is there a script that staff is being trained on to inform people that they can reject uh, staying in the hurt? Is, and, and do you have like what that script looks like? Yeah, so I mean, just to be really clear on it, because it's an important point, if you want to go into our um, excellent DHS shelter system, we will They're not you. excellent. They're not excellent. They're not wanna, excellent. We want to get you where you want to go. Um, and if it's that day you tell us where you want to go, then we will get, we, there's no reason for you to stay in the HERC any longer than you wish to. Um, so uh, the answer to your question is, will our staff be trained to let people know what their options are and that they could select to go into one of our DHS shelters um, as quickly as they wish to? The answer is yes. Councilmember Brewer. Thank you, and thank you for all your hard work. Um, I'm always focused, as you know, on the working papers. So I guess I know that you are, the mayor has tried, the government has tried, supposedly our delegation has tried, I wanna get an update. And then I wanna understand, I think it's great that people can get the municipal ID. What does that get you? And then since I'm like a broken record on this topic, people say, well, Gail, why don't you use the paid internship? Because sometimes you don't have, need working papers they have parole status, they can work. Paid internship might give them the ability to be uh, able to work. I don't know about paid internships. I'm just trying everything to get the, these amazingly talented individuals working. And I can't take any more calls of people asking me, I have jobs. So can you help me with the ID? Does that get you anything while we're waiting for the feds? Mm -hmm. Do we need an act of Congress to get the working paper? Somebody said the Ukrainians got an act of Congress. We need an act of Congress now. It's, it's very mysterious. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, we're, we're fully in agreement with, with you, Council Member, and our, our team at the Federal Legislative Affairs is uh, in D.C. working with Bristol's the White House. Bristol's working hard, I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, as you know, we're working with a congressional delegation to see what options we have. Unfortunately, uh, asylum seekers can't use, cannot use IDNYC as work papers. That's what I thought. Um, what I could say is that we have a tremendous group of nonprofit organizations that work with, um, uh, with asylum seekers and other immigrants, you know, uh, with informal sector work, right. like day laborers and domestic workers. Fine. And asylum seekers are going to these agencies like NICE and Mixteca and others, and they've received assistance there to get uh, health and safety training and so on to be able to connect with work. No, I know that, but I'm just trying to get to the next step. Yeah. What's with this paid internship? Does anybody know anything about that, or is that just Jose Ortiz Jr.? Uh, yes, I we have everybody. an upcoming meeting with Jose uh, Monday. Because actually. my understanding is paid internship you can get without the working paper, so Jose needs to get on that. Yes, we're, we're, we're having, we have an interagency inter meeting with Jose on Monday to discuss our options. I'll call him this weekend, tell him. Yes. Next is the faith-based. So, you know, I'm focused on these churches, synagogues, and mosques. They all have space. Nobody goes to church anymore, in case you don't know. And so there's just tons of space. The Catholics, the Episcopals, I don't care, they all got space. But they need showers. So you gotta bring the truck from the Brooklyn with the showers. They have kitchens and they have bathrooms. So I'm trying to figure out, St. John has got space, St. Gregory's got space, I got all the saints, they all got space. <laughs> what are we doing to get that space? Um, so Councilmember Brewer. I know we've had this conversation, but I'm- uh, And, and one of the things I love talking else. about is that you, um, always have a lot of work for us to do. I always get a list of items to do when, when I have the opportunity to chat with you. Well, guys, I saw him last night in an event and I started up. <laughs> she did. And, um, and I, I, we are going to start looking at those spaces and we'll see if we can make okay. them work. Uh, and we have a, a list apparently has been sent from a couple of different faith-based organizations, so yep. I'll make sure you get both of them. I just, they want to help their I'm, I'm, community yep. and then you'd have all your problems really addressed. Yep. Okay. 
Next is storage at the Port Authority. Ruth Messenger calls me every minute about some storage room. Do I need to call Rick Cotton to get the storage room? We have a storage room at, at Port Authority now. You do? So we do. You, how come she calls me like five minutes ago and asks me about, could you please I, tell her that you have a storage room? I will put it on my Thank Gail you. Brewer to-do list. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> LGBTQ, when I spoke yesterday to, I mean, Covenant House is trying. When I spoke to the city, they said there were a couple other places, but there are a lot of young people who need support. What are we doing with that community to support them? A very special community, young LGBTQ or anybody, but they're very special and it's hard. Any suggestions for that community? Well, I'll say that um, our, you know, uh, our team at H and H has been done, has been doing a tremendous job at checking off things on our wish list uh, for the humanitarian centers. One of which is really providing assistance to LGBTQ communities. Uh, in, in, in a way that, you know, uh, that provides extensive uh, case management, right, to connect them to appropriate, you know, shelters and services. And this is why we want to move to this, this uh, humanitarian center uh, strategy that allows us to provide more resources. Okay. It really is... Uh, but we're, what are we doing now for the LGBTQ? I can, I can chime in. Um, I think this is an example of, of the interagency partnership that has been going on because the, the teams that have been meeting individuals at the Port Authority are really proactive about flagging people um, with a variety of, of particular needs, but, but including LGBTQ individuals. And then DHS works to make sure that we are getting an appropriate placement. Um, as you know, we have some LGBTQ specific shelters. We are using those where appropriate. I think they're all full, Molly. They're all full. Sometimes there are vacancies. We are using those vacancies where appropriate. If people have particular safety needs, making sure that they that you know we're accommodating with a single or double room. Where I'll let you know out there in the in the buzz world, it's a big issue. You know, people are asking me why is more being done. Just so you're aware of it, right. that is such a special community. You don't want them to get bullied. You don't want them to get hurt, and you need to pay a particular attention to them. Okay. Appreciate that feedback. Okay. Thank you. And then finally, the Mexican food is too spicy. They want Venezuelan food. I'm not kidding. Are you uh, no, are you I, I know you're not, not kidding. Uh, do you want to speak to the menu and also some of the work we're doing at the HERC mm -hmm. uh, for the LGBTQ community? Yes, so um, uh, d yeah, to go with the latter question first. So we, we've actually, we have d designed a menu, um, which, uh, and you can give us feedback once the humanitarian center actually opens if uh, the food, if you're getting feedback that's still too spicy. Um, but we've designed it to be um, a South American diet with, again, multiple options, three hot meals a day in a dining hall so you can reconnect with people around well, that's you happening well. now. Uh, no, so when it we open. It will happen. Yeah, so when we open the humanitarian center. I will let you know when the complaints have, have stopped. And then just finally, when you have, I know this whole issue, you can't tell people that there's a shelter coming to their neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. I got it. Guess what happens? People find out, elected officials don't know, there's drama. Everybody wants to help. I wish they helped New Yorkers. That's another whole story. But they do want to help asylum. So it would be helpful because then if you could tell the community, they're coming, this is the shelter, it's from the asylum, can you help? It's a suggestion. I mean, if you put New Yorkers in your neighborhood, they all start screaming but everybody loves the asylum. So help, because then, you know. So we have opened 39 emergency sites yep. since the middle of June. Um, we are doing what we can to give advance notice. I will say we are moving extremely quickly. But we move fast too. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I am well aware that some of those notifications have happened day of. It is not an attempt to hide information. It is okay, because we are moving as fast as we possibly can to make up the Molly, the agencies are afraid. They get afraid to call us because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble with their contract if they call elected officials. So you just have to send them a note. Okay. Everybody, it's okay to call elected officials. It's okay to call the community board. Shoes, clothes, pampers, diapers, you know, right. all that stuff. I, I, I cannot stress enough, though, that we are moving just Okay, but tell people, quickly this, where we tell are. Tell the agencies it's okay to call. Thank Absolutely. you. A memo to that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Brewer. Um, just to pick up on what Councilmember De La Rosa asked about the script, I'm grateful to hear that there will be one. Um, can you commit to sharing that script 
uh, with the council? So the trainings will have elements um, uh, of, you know, the, there will be an introductory script and then case management, uh, as, as you well know, goes in different directions. So we train our case managers, as we do with our social workers, uh, to listen first and then see where the conversation goes. I'd be happy to share it, to commit to sharing with you the, the relevant sort of introductory parts of the script. I just want to make the point to, to uh, set expectations that this is not a one-size-fits-all. Case sure. management's really hard, and that's why we're setting up these centers. No, I understand that, um, and sharing even just the preliminary would be great for us. The, the introductory, introductory parts. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd now like to go into learning a little bit more about the vendor selection for the creation of the HERC on Orchard Beach. Um, we had received information that uh, the vendor selected to construct and operate is SLSCO. Is this true? Um, SLS is one of two contractors that are working up there. They're not the one doing the construction and maintenance of the facility. They're doing a lot of the wraparound services and augmenting and working with the H&H &H team. Who was contracted to do the construction? Uh, a company called Garner. Could Garner. You, Gardner? Garner. Garner. Um, and is this a, a unionized vendor? Uh, or I are can, unions consulted? Uh, I, I can find out and, and circle back with you. Um, and then could you just clarify a little bit more what SLSCO is, is going to be doing exactly? So um, SLS is going to be helping us to uh, run the facilities management of the site. So I'll give some, um, some specific examples. Once again, you've come through, we've offered you initial comfort care, um, you started your case management work, um, we're going to have showers available for you. We're going to be providing towels, we're going to have everything in the showers you need that needs to be maintained, cleaned. There's a, b a body of work there. Um, we're going to have a variety of other services, like we're going to have laundry service, uh, which includes a fluff and fold. Just because you know, you've come a long way, it, it, I, I don't want to diminish the importance of having clean clothes that you feel comfortable in. So that's going to be something we're offering there too. And then a variety of other um, you know, services that are included in the operation of the center itself. So that all, everything we do requires staff to do it. Um, and the vendor SLS is focused on uh, the staffing piece of providing the staff for a lot of the services like the ones I mentioned. So I'm asking uh, specifically about SLS because this company received over $2 billion to construct uh, former President Trump's border wall. And it's pretty explicit on their website. This isn't like something they're hiding. Uh, under projects, you can um, see that they've got several border walls that they've worked on. Um, we should be working to build trust with asylum seekers, and the agreement to contract this particular company <coughs> raises a lot of problems. So SLS has also done a ton of work with us throughout COVID. Uh, they are one of the city's emergency contract providers for COVID. They ran many of our vaccination sites. They helped build a number of our COVID field hospitals. Um, and they also, uh, you know, their audit that the comptroller did was a fantastic audit. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that we were comfortable working with them for an emergency. And as you know, with emergency contracts, it's a different contracting system than it is when you are going through the normal contract and procurement system, which because we are dealing with an unprecedented humanitarian crisis, we simply do not have time to go through the normal procurement process. So we worked with a vendor that we have been working with over the last couple of years through COVID. Did you and, that all has, know? and that has performed well under those contracts. Did you all know that this company um, had created walls across this other? I was states? not aware of that until I saw the uh, until I saw the report yesterday. Um, well, will this uh, revelation um, end our relationship with this company? It will not. Why are we working with a company that has profited? from xenophobic policies. As I said, this is also a company that the city has worked with throughout COVID, uh, setting up vaccination sites, running COVID field hospitals, um, and we have done tremendous work with them in the past. And it's one of the reasons we are comfortable working with that company in this emergency as well, where we have to circumvent some of the procurement policies and procedures that are usually in place for contracts. I get that, but um, Commissioner, does it not raise a problem to you that this company has literally Built I'm not happy about it, but I will also tell you, as I said, this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. There's a lot of things I'm not happy about, but that's the nature of dealing with an emergency. And then, you know, on the construction front, um, 
I know you're not sure if um, unionized labor was contacted, but um, I'd be hopeful that. Again, I just want to emphasize again that this is a this is an emergency, and that there's a lot of things that we would normally do if this was a normal process or we had time. Um, but this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis that we are dealing with. I get that. I get that. Um, but I'm not quite understanding why we won't uh, use unionized labor. I mean, are you telling me there's like issues around? I, I will circle out to back them? with you about Garner and, and SLS. Okay, I want to go into understanding um, just some of the budgetary questions that I think many of my colleagues and I have. Um, how much total funding is anticipated to support the newly arrived asylum seekers? So we're still scoping that out and happy to get back to you with some of the numbers. Do you have a. a and I think there are some number? things that have already been done through Moya that you could speak to, right, with the, some of the, the legal services, Navigation Center. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> To operate the navigation center, we've invested 6.75 million. We've also issued an RFP for 5 million to expand legal services. Um, that's more than any other city has done. So, you know, I'm very proud of what we've been able to manage to do, and more is coming. Um, I think, you know, we're going to continue to invest in services, uh, and I think, you know, our, our OMB uh, office will will share more detailed uh, explanation of how much this will cost, and we look forward to the federal and state governments to support in this process. Absolutely. Um, any of the other agencies spend expenditure already or anticipated? Um, while I really don't have total figures, given how rapidly um, we are expanding, right, I, I mentioned we have opened 39 emergency sites since June. Those are largely in commercial hotels. Um, commercial hotels are an expensive place to provide shelter simply because we are, we're paying hotel, we're paying nightly hotel rates as well as paying for security, for food, for social services. So, um, you know, this has been a very significant increase. It will result in a, what I would anticipate to be a very significant increase in the DHS budget. Um, in order to meet our, our legal and moral mandate to provide shelter. So you're unable to share any specific kind of numbers right now? Um, it has been a very rapidly moving target given how quickly we have been uh, adding sites. So I know I don't have a cumulative target at this point, but, um, but we are working with the Office of Management budget, recognizing that this is a very significant hit to the DHS budget. Can we um, receive just how much has been spent by agency up to date following this hearing? No, absolutely. Could I get a yes or a no from the other reps here? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then um, I know you're still scoping, but will this funding be included in the November plan? Are there discussions for, I know, the upcoming? Yeah, these discussions are ongoing. Okay. Um, uh, can you list um, all relevant state funding that the city has received up to date? I cannot, but what I can tell you is that we've been, we've had very active conversations with our federal partners and our state partners. Um, they have expressed a willingness to help especially with finances, um, and we are going to hold them at their word. So f for NISM, zero at this? I, I'd have to get you a number. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know. Any of the other agencies? Well, so far, as far as I know, the city has covered all expenses related to this humanitarian crisis. We're still awaiting from, you know, word from the federal and state governments. Families with children shelter is traditionally claimed a portion of that it comes from the state, but um, the extent to which we are going to be able to claim is going to depend on individuals' immigration status, so that is something that we are going to have to work through at a very detailed level with our state partners. 
And what I've been told is we have gotten bus resources at the Port Authority, MTA buses, to help trans people to the shelter system, but that is it so far from the state. How much is that? I don't know what the MTA costs are, but it's, it's generally two buses a day. There are times where they give us more buses based on the number of buses we're receiving from, the, from El Paso or from Texas, and based on also the times. So there have been some times where we've gotten buses overnight where the MTA has had to step up and provide two additional buses. Okay. Um, can the agency speak to any state funding that I'm is sorry. pending? I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, just one thing to add. And we, we also have a, a, uh, a commitment for the National Guard as well um, that the state will be providing at least for the first 30 days. Do you know the, the dollar amount for that? I don't, but I, I can get that for you. Got it. Thank you. Um, so for any state funding that's pending, I know National Guard, or are there any agencies anticipating funding coming in? We hope. Right. Yeah, no, this is just to better understand like how coordination has occurred, is occurring, and then because when I've talked about this and when I've heard commissioners talk about this issue, um, we've talked about this coordinated effort, and so just trying to understand if any support, monetary support, has been provided thus far. And I think we can say certain for all the agencies that there's really active conversations going on with our state partners. Great. Exactly what form that looks like is still in the to be determined. So I'll, I'll list three concrete ways that the state has helped us so far, and we have had very productive and supported conversations by the state, but the reason I think you're hearing a little bit of uh, silence on the um, humanitarian center side is it hasn't opened yet. Um, so as we continue conversation, as it actually opens, uh, then I think we'll be in a better position to answer your question. Three concrete examples, are, are, though, are um, the buses that the Commissioner Eskola is referring to, the National Guard, um, and even trailers on our sites that have a monetary value as well. So the state's done a lot to support us so far, but as the center actually opens, that's where we're going to be able to uh, better analyze the costs and uh, better answer your question. Would also add, right, we're not in a state budget season right now, so I think a lot of that will play out later in the year as as the state is, is doing its next budget. So it's just the wrong point in the season to be able to put specific numbers on that. Okay. Um, and then um, can you talk about any relevant federal funding acro across other agencies? So uh, the federal government has the Emergency Food and Shelter Program that is run by FEMA. Um, there is, uh, hopefully will be a supplemental to provide additional funding for that. I believe Congressman Espaillat has been working on that. Um, but that is the primary mechanism for funding these types of operations. So just to clarify, have we received that? I believe we have received some funds in August. It's, it's distributed quarterly and it's based on reimbursements. It's not based on forward expenses or projections. I could get you the exact number of what we have received to date. Um, and I think the next disbursement is at the end of October. Okay, great. That would be helpful to have. Um, any of the other agencies anticipating federal dollars? Or have you rejected federal dollars? I sorry can safely tell you we have not rejected <laughs> any federal dollars. Great. I, I was just going to add that the FEMA funds uh, referenced were a multi-agency uh, request, so it reflected the spending from all of the agencies that had incurred costs. But through June thirtieth, um, because it is done on this quarterly basis, so um, that was relatively early on in the in the emergence of the emergency. So so the numbers to date are gonna be relatively small. Okay, and then what's the cost associated with the current navigation center? Well, as I said, 6.75 million to operate. That's through a contract with Catholic Charities. Um, we will be uh, re-granting to uh, other nonprofits across New York City to serve as satellite uh, navigation centers. Uh, and we've entered into a, an agreement with the Red Cross uh, to, to lease a space through, I think, uh, 16 months. Yeah. So 6.7 million to Catholic Charities, how are they utilizing that? They're operating the, the uh, navigation center uh, by coordinating staffing and intake 
at the navigation center and convening um, many of our city agencies to be on site to provide support as well. Uh, they're going to be regranting uh, to a number of different nonprofits, which they will announce soon. Uh, that was included in their contract with us that they would do, so that we are also expanding out to the five boroughs to make sure that people connect to the navigation center. And at, is there a timeline for them to use the $6.7 million by? Through this fiscal year. Through this fiscal year, okay. Um, what's the anticipated cost for future HERCs? It depends on the location and, um, and the requirement. So, you know, those are all things that we have to spec out and it's part of the assessment we have to make based on the locations that we're looking at or, or the resource that we're looking at. What's it costing to build out the one on Orchard Beach? I can get you the exact number. Um, and then different sources estimated that it typically costs $135 per day to house a single adult in a shelter, $190 per day to house a family. What's the estimated cost per migrant in terms of staying at the centers and using services? It's, uh, I don't think it's a, it's, it's not apples to apples. Um, and it depends on, you have to remember that we're also seeing more numbers of people throughout that month and hopefully part of this process is that you're helping relocate people with families, friends, sponsors, or getting them to further destinations. Um, and so it's apples to oranges, not apples to apples, but uh, as we start to understand the cost better, and part of the reason that for that is there's a lot we don't know. And so next week when we open, we're gonna start scaling our operations. We will figure out that there are some things that we need to continue operating there there are some things that we are no longer needed there. There are some things that are needed but may be better served at the navigation center or elsewhere. And so as we continue to build and learn, uh, we'll have a better sense of what those per person costs are, are over the first 24 hours or 96 hours, and potentially also what some of the savings might be um, because we're helping people um, get to another destination. Just to add on there, I think one of the things that's different in terms of the unique needs of individuals and families coming into our city to seek asylum is they have different health care needs. So health care is a human right, and that is true. We make sure that they feel that is true at all of our sites. So as we're thinking about their health care needs, we are going to be tailoring the services in a way that makes sense for what the, the issues that they're presenting with. So that makes it a little bit hard to compare to your statistic because uh, we're going to be tailoring our health care needs, which we are doing now, so we'll know more as we move forward. Great. I'll go into some questions about health. Um, are asylum seekers being screened for COVID-19 and monkeypox upon arrival? So upon arrival, um, are, and just to back up for a second, so this is well, one of the reasons why we were um, excited to raise our hand in New York City Health and Hospitals to help the people coming into our city seeking asylum is we know that there are going to be a lot of healthcare issues and we feel very um, proud and confident to be able to help them. So when you come through uh, into the, um, into the uh, center initially, we screen you for communicable diseases. That includes things like COVID. Uh, I also would say at New York City Health and Hospitals, we've run the New York City Test and Trace, now Treat Core for the last two and a half years. We've done millions of tests in thousands of locations, and we have unique models for um, instantly getting you access to Paxlovid if you have a positive COVID test and you're positive. All of that will be true there. Everybody is going to get COVID tests when they walk into the, the center for the first time. Anybody that's, that is positive will go into an appropriate isolation um, part of the facility, and anybody that's positive that's eligible will get Paxlovid, 100% of the time. Now, uh, other communicable diseases, for example, that we screen for are like tuberculosis. Uh, uh, diseases that, uh, communicable diseases like um, MPV or monkeypox, along with other ones, we uh, elicit through uh, asking you what your symptoms are. So there's no test for somebody that doesn't have a rash for uh, MPV, for example. So it's a little bit of a different process there. But uh, we have a communicable disease medical screening process that everybody will go through, including, again, COVID testing everybody. Where are they uh, receiving those vaccines? I'm sorry, the vaccines for? For, um, if they are, for COVID um, or any of the other sort of screenings that you are conducting. Yeah, so uh, if somebody is screened and tests positive for COVID, they'll get treated for COVID instantly if they're eligible. We'll have clinicians on site, actually we'll have uh, clinical teams on site 24 seven around the clock 
because of the people in the isolation part of the, uh, of the centers. We'll make sure everybody is safe at all times. Um, anybody that, uh, again, is positive for COVID, will be, as it's eligible for treatment, will get Paxlovid. Anybody that wishes to have a COVID vaccine, we currently offer an array of vaccines at our navigation center, and we're going to assess in this adult-only population uh, what the need for vaccines are. One of the main uh, reasons we've seen um, individuals and families needing vaccines coming into New York City is actually MMR. Now, we take for granted, hopefully everybody in this room uh, has had an MMR vaccine. If you haven't, let me know. Uh, we'll get it for you today. Um, because everybody should have the MMR vaccine, but people coming from Venezuela, we've actually been giving out a fair amount of MMR, but that's a requirement in order to get into our, um, into our DOE schools. So we've seen a need for that among children especially, uh, but of course we will not have children at our first center, so we want to make sure that we're tailoring the vaccines that we would have there to the needs of the population. And, and Chair, if I could just add uh, to build on what Dr. Long s said about what's going on at the Navigation Center, um, there are certainly an array of medical services and vaccines being provided there, um, but what we are doing is connecting all individuals, adults and children, to primary care appointments. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these vaccines, including uh, some that Dr. Long um, started uh, mentioning, are multi-dose vaccines. And so the uh, goal is for people to be connected into healthcare services and primary care on an ongoing basis so that they can uh, receive, whether it's COVID, influenza, MMR, or other vaccines, um, with a healthcare provider, uh, you know, who's going to be their, their healthcare provider in the future. Great. So the Navigation Center has a sort of clinical setup for care, and then the HERC will also ha similarly have a clinic setup. Correct. And I, I can go into a little more detail for you. So right now, we have clinical teams at Port Authority, uh, but those clinical teams are doing medical triage. They're determining if you need to go to the emergency department or not. But we've seen several emergencies, and uh, we've, we're very thankful that we've had teams there that can immediately get people where they need to be. We're also doing COVID testing at Port Authority. At our navigation center, we're doing comprehensive assessments for children and families. We're doing uh, three days of a variety of medications, ranging from a few of an infection in your feet, which we're seeing too often mm -hmm. because of the travel over. We'll start your antibiotics right there. Or if you uh, are out of your hypertension or diabetes medications, we can actually hand you uh, several days as we connect you with the next day primary care appointment of whatever medications you're on. We're seeing a need for that as well. We also are offering comprehensive vaccines ranging from COVID to flu to MMR to tetanus, you name it, at the Navigation Center today. And we're seeing which ones, in, uh, like I said earlier, we're seeing a lot of need for MMR among children. So we're doing that so that we can uh, get our, uh, the children coming into our city, into our DOE schools as fast as possible. At our humanitarian center, as part of medical, there's a medical screening process that happens when you come in that determines who needs to go into isolation and who doesn't and who needs to get treated immediately for COVID. Then we do a comprehensive assessment. We're gonna have the same ability to do three days of a variety of medications, including antibiotics, including chronic disease medications, um, and a variety of other services. Is um, COVID testing happening uh, at Port Authority? Yes. Could you share how it's happening? I mean, I've been there a couple of times, but it did, I, I saw the triage, the medical triage team, and I've spoke to some of those folks, and they had described exactly what you shared. Um, but how is the COVID testing happening? For people that are coming in with symptoms, so we're seeing about one out of every five people coming into Port Authority has cough or related symptoms. Um, so we are um, performing rapid antigen tests at Port Authority so that we can know immediately um, if individuals have COVID, and then we could take the appropriate action, which now would include uh, through your New York City Test and Treat Corps, connecting you instantly to treatment in a variety of ways. If I can chime in, um, for those who come to DHS shelter system, and this is true for asylum seekers and or anybody else, if for those coming into the single adult system, we're doing uh, rapid PCR testing, um, that is across the board whether or not you are symptomatic. Got it. Um, and then I want to know if for folks who are receiving any sort of uh, care and then continued care for anybody coming in with an autoimmune disease, uh, issues that require specialized um, uh, attention, are we making sure that these folks have um, health insurance or under the NYC care? Like what, 
walk me through yeah. that process. Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Chair. It's a very important one, and um, we're working really closely uh, with health and hospitals, certainly, but also a lot of other partners in the city, uh, including Metro Plus and our own health insurance enrollers at the health department who are stationed at the Navigation Center doing health insurance enrollment. Um, certainly not everyone qualifies for health insurance, um, but what we do know is that we're lucky to live not just in New York City, but in New York State, where health insurance eligibility does include individuals who are uh, uh, largely in this population what's called permanently residing under the color of law or PRUCAL. And the fact that uh, many of these um, asylum seekers have been uh, paroled into the country makes them eligible for health insurance. So we are doing uh, everything we can to enroll them into health insurance. Uh, sometimes it takes a few weeks for that eligibility to become, uh, to go into effect and um, for that health insurance to sort of become permanent. Um, but in the meantime, we're doing the direct connections to care, and as Dr. Long mentioned, a lot of times that's next day primary care appointments. For the individuals who are not eligible for health insurance, certainly they are being enrolled into NYC care and getting a provider at health and hospitals. That's really great. So, you know, we've talked um, in recent days about the young mother, the woman who um, died to suicide. Um, what proactive resources are being provided to asylum seekers from the point of arrival to the shelter system, to the HERC, um, around their mental health uh, protections, rights, services available? I'd love to start with that because as we've been um, working hard to design the new humanitarian center, uh, the devastating event that you're uh, referring to has been on the front of all of our minds. Um, and mental health uh, is, it needs to be a cornerstone of everything that we do. People have gone through um, many times hell to get here, but now that they're here, we want to make sure that we take the best care of them. So I'm going to re uh, restate a couple of the things I, I shared earlier, but then happy to go into more detail as well. So when you come into our center, we want to make sure that the staff that are immediately seen, you have mental health training. That's done best with something called mental health first aid. That, na that enables our staff to identify, again, not just who's in crisis, but who could have mental health issues and have brief interventions. Uh, we also want to make sure that our staff are um, trained in trauma-informed care and a, and a special training as well from our survivors of torture clinics so that we can make sure that whatever people are going through, we can identify it quickly and get them connected to wherever they need to go um, to, uh, to uh, wherever, based on whatever their condition is, wherever they need to go, which could be one of our survivors of torture clinics, again, at Bellevue Hospital um, and at, uh, at Elmhurst Hospital. The other thing which we wanted to make sure was uh, available at the um, new center for everybody coming through the door as well is um, if we've identified that you're depressed or you have anxiety, um, if you have a phone, we are going to get, give you a brochure about how to use our free Wi-Fi service to uh, connect to NYC well. And uh, Rishi could share more about that in a moment. We also provide phones and iPads if that's a better way for you to connect with NYC well, which is a unique New York City program to give you instant access to be able to talk to um, a mental health uh, professional that can help you to work through however you're feeling in that very moment. You don't have to wait for an appointment. In addition to that, as Rishi was saying earlier too, if we're identifying problems, mental health and other, we've built pathways within our system to give you expedited access to care as well. So we, we have reserved templates for people to come into our clinics so that we can connect them to primary care first and that's your doorway to getting connected to everything else that you would need. But I think it's just important to state that with the trainings that I was referencing, if we're not doing the trainings, we're not going to identify the problems mm -hmm. and we're not going to be able to help. And that's why it's so important to us. Are you able to share how many folks are receiving um, either therapy or uh, mental health care through um, NYC Well or counseling? Uh, we, I don't have numbers on that right now, Chair, but we can certainly follow up on that. And I do want to you know, just highlight that um, this is a very, very significant uh, issue in terms of the number of people, unsurprisingly, given yeah. the journey and, and, and the trauma um, that they have gone through. And so that's why we um, are, are providing psychological first aid and emotional support at the Navigation Center itself, not just actually to uh, the asylum seekers, but also to the staff working there. The staff working at the Navigation Center, the city staff, the other staff are doing really really hard work and they also need uh, psychological uh, first aid and, and mental health support. So I agree with um, everything Dr. Long highlighted um, and we, I just want to reiterate that um, all of us at the health department are deeply saddened by the loss and thank you for bringing that up because to us it's a reminder of the obligation that we have, not just at the health department but across the city, um, to do everything we can in our power to protect not just the physical health but also the mental health of all of the asylum seekers. Do you want to add on? Sure, I can speak to the, the process at, 
at DHS. Um, so families with children, there is, uh, at the PATH Intake Center, there is, is a healthcare provider there who's doing an initial assessment um, within the Families with Children system. There are caseworkers and social workers at all of our standard shelters. Um, for single adults, they come in, there's some very initial, at intake, there's some initial medical um, triage, but then individuals go to a three, through a three-week assessment process that includes um, comprehensive medical screenings, including both physical and behavioral health needs, um, and for individuals in the single adult system who present with particular mental health needs, um, they, they may be referred to a mental health shelter. Um, across the board, whether we are talking about single adults or families with children, there's a real emphasis with our shelter providers on making sure that they are doing referrals to care in the community. Um, we want uh, people to be connected to medical professionals that they can work with over a long period of time. Um, and for everybody in shelter, um, the goal is permanent housing, right? So we, we don't want the medical care necessarily to be shelter-based because, right. because we want people to be able to maintain continuity of care when they exit. Um, I will say with the 39 emergency sites that I've referenced a couple of times, um, we have stood those up very quickly. We are rolling on staffing, so there is basic staffing there. We are, and we will be getting to the level of staffing that I just required, but that is a work in progress. Thank you, I'll pass it to Council Member De La Rosa. Yes, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I actually do have a question about the hotels that have turn, been turned into emergency shelters. So um, at what point do, do the, op, the operators that have been chosen by the city come in to those shelters? So we are working with the not-for-profits um, that have been selected as, as providers to take over operations as quickly as possible. We think they are the best equipped to do it, but they, we also want to make sure that they have sufficient staff to be able to do it. So um, it depends a little bit on the organization, right? Some of the not-for-profits are very large organizations with really robust staffing operations and sort of the ability to redeploy from elsewhere in their organizations, they're taking over very quickly. Some of the smaller organizations, they need a little bit more ramp-up time. What we are doing in, in the interim is staffing with a combination of, of DHS and HRA um, staff working working overtime, um, you know, really doing everything we can, and some temp staff as well. Um, you know, we are we are moving very quickly, as I've said a number of times. But um, the goal is and is to have the providers take over, and we have, you know, the the sites that we opened early on, the providers have been taking over, and we've been rolling the the um, temp staff and the redeployed. The agency folks to, to the new facilities. So um, at what point if the operator is unable to fulfill the commitments of the contract or is just overwhelmed with how many shelters are, are popping up across the city, at what point are the agencies, the administration reconsidering um, the contracts? So we haven't gotten to that point yet. Our goal, you know, what we are doing, as I said, is really bridging with, with the agency and the temp staff so they can get there. If we got to a point where a not-for-profit raised their hand and said, I can't do it, or we say it's been going on too long, you're not going to be able to do it, then we would um, look to assign the contract to somebody else. So right now, is there an acceptable time period where DHS or any other agency is willing to step in for that operator until they can get um, staffing squared away? Um, we really haven't put a hard and fast line on it because again, we're working with providers, you know, that are massive thousands of people organizations and some that are, are very small and we want to have that full range of providers there. It is, it is such a tremendous need that we are really looking for, um, all of our providers to step up and it has really, we have gotten a tremendous response. We really are so grateful to our provider community. Yes, I agree with you that our, our nonprofit providers have been stepping up um, and towards that, that because of that, my next question is, is there a plan to reimburse some of the nonprofits that haven't been chosen to operate or have contracts with the city that have been putting forth staff to feed people, to transport people, to uh, offer interpretation services and have just been stepping up because they understand the unique needs of, of this community? 
So our ability to make payments depends on contracts, but um, if there are particular organizations happy to dig in with their with you, we, okay. we certainly don't want to leave anybody uh, carrying the water for the city. Thank you. And then my last question is around the Department of Education and funding for um, the new matriculated students who have been entering our districts. Um, I know that there is a policy that after a certain date in October, I can't remember the date is 15th or 30th, 31, there you go, Gail, 31, um, you know, schools are no longer reimbursed. With the uptick in um, newly arrived students, is that policy being reconsidered? And if not, how are we paying schools to provide adequate services, meals, uh, wraparound services to these new students? Thank, Thank you, you for your question, Council Member De La Rosa. Um, so I will go back and have an extensive conversation with our budget team, but you are correct, it is October 31st. Um, and so as students trickle into our schools, uh, trickle is an understatement at this point, the schools are being um, funded for the increase in enrollment. We also have an escalation system in process, um, so that way schools that have 15 or more students in a given grade, um, or they have an additional need for an English um, as a new language teacher or a bilingual teacher, we're escalating those concerns. To your point about October 31st quickly approaching, we will have conversations um, with the budget team around what are, what are our possibilities, and I also know that we are starting our conversations with the state in terms of additional funding, but we will get back to you. Yeah, if you could get back to the council on that, and then also around um, if a child is then moved, if they move from one shelter to another type of shelter, and that switch happens in the mid after this deadline, what, what occurs? That's an excellent, convers uh, an excellent question. Um, to be clear, because of McKinney-Vento, they have the right to stay in their schools should they choose. Um, if a transfer occurs, then we, I can get back to you on exactly what happens with funding. Thank you so much. So the latest mayor's management report shows that in fiscal year 22, placements from shelter into permanent housing are down. Um, an average length of stay in shelters is up relative to fiscal year 21. This dynamic is exacerbating the bed shortage. We need um, more people into permanent housing. And I also wanna note that the average shelter cost for a family with uh, children is $180 per day. A city FEPS uh, rental assistance voucher for that same family costs $72 per day. So this is an economic imperative as well as a moral one. Will the administration lift or revise the 90-day rule that requires people to stay in a shelter for 90 days before becoming uh, eligible for city FEPS? Um, it's something that we are having active conversations with a variety of, of partners about. There are some real reasons why that is in place, but we are, it is, you know, understand the concern and it's something that we're looking at. Um, I will, a couple of notes on those statistics that, that you mentioned. Um, for FY22, the, pop, the family, the population in, in shelter, the shelter census was down. Um, certainly not where we are right now, but at the end of the fiscal year, we actually were at a, at a relatively low census. So part of the reason that the number of placements was down is because actually the number of people to place was down. Not saying that, you know, I am the biggest cheerleader you will find for permanent housing. Permanent housing is a huge priority for the agency, but I think there, um, there are some complicated ways for interpreting that data that I just wanted to put out. Um, similar on the length of stay, but no, that's not the topic of this hearing, So, ha but happy to follow up. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm grateful to know that there that this is being reconsidered or that conversa active conversations are being had about this sort of prohibitive 90-day rule while I understand the challenges as well. Um, are asylum seekers and other non-citizens eligible for city FEPs? Generally, no. Um, however, there's a lot of nuance to that answer. Um, it really depends on where you are in the asylum process um, and, and a lot of very s specific nuances around a, f a given family's um, status. So we are, we are working right now to 
um, make guidance that is as transparent as possible for the shelter staff to, um, to inform when a client, uh, when a household might be eligible, but also recognizing um, that this is something that we are gonna need to collaborate with others um, and to be able to provide legal assistance given how often the answer is, frankly, it depends. Um, I would also, in general, it is not legal for the city to spend ongoing funds on, on those who are undocumented. Again, asylum can, can, that's where you get to the it depends answer, but it would require a, a state legislation for us to be able to provide state fa uh, city FAPs to, to those who are undocumented. So I know that non-citizens are eligible for a number of um, city benefits, and then state law authorizing city FAPs doesn't include any immigration restrictions? The, you know, the caveat that I am, I am not an immigration attorney here, but we are not legally allowed to provide city FAPs to those who are undocumented. Again, there are some exceptions around uh, particular asylee statuses, which is why um, there actually really does need to be a lot of case-by-case -case analysis done. Um, but um, in most cases, in order to be able to pay ongoing rental assistance, even using city tax levy dollars, it requires state legislation. Um, can the administration commit to endorsing the legislation that would make this change at the state level? Uh, it's been on our legislative agenda for several years. Great, so I'll take that as a yes. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I wanna now go into um, understanding how little uh, legal services um, are being um, addressed. So, uh, Commissioner Castro, could you describe the scope of um, legal services envisioned in the request uh, for proposals? And are legal service providers being asked to scale back or limit the scope of their services at this time? Well, we're in the uh, $5 million request for proposals that I mentioned earlier, we asked uh, for those uh, agencies proposing to work with us on figuring out how to provide the, the most uh, uh, assistance to as many uh, asylum seekers as possible, as you know, over 15,000 asylum seekers have arrived and uh, they'll require some level of legal assistance or orientation as, as mentioned. Uh, in fact, this is a good segue because asylum seekers uh, currently are seeking asylum. They're not currently asylees. They'll have to engage in that process, uh, which can be quite a difficult uh, process. And so we're looking for legal providers uh, to be able to do that both at the navigation center and elsewhere. And so the RFP is looking for those kinds of proposals. We just began to process uh, uh, Human Resources Administration uh, is pulling together a team to evaluate the applications that were received uh, to then select a provider for that. So I've heard that at 20,000, when we reach that amount, um, which we're very close to doing so, this comes to only $250 per migrant if we keep to the 5 million. Um, and that the minimum needed for adequate representation is probably four times this amount. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've talked to several providers who have shared just how arduous the process of the asylum uh, application is and needing long, a sort of long-term legal support system to get that done. Um, how was the five million determined? Well, you know, the reality is that it's going to take perhaps hundreds, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to, to provide full legal representation to all the asylum seekers that have arrived and will continue to arrive, and immigrant communities who are already in New York. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the problem is, is that uh, the federal government does not provide legal representation for uh, you know immigrants arriving into the country, leaving it up to the individuals to figure out. Uh, legal representation in localities like New York City. Um, we've invested historic numbers and we're at a historic amount of money invested in legal services 
uh, in the city, we're looking for uh, the state to also supplement this and our federal partners to work with us to figure out a solution to, the, to this issue because people will need support. And as you mentioned, it's an incredibly arduous process. We want people to get, at the very least, access to their work permits. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, they'll need assistance. And then so far, how many bids were submitted? Um, uh, you know, we'll have to, I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, HRA is administering this contract and they're managing the entire process, including the uh, administration of the bids and selection of that. Um, and do you know about any protest letters or no bid responses that were submitted or is that also something that you'll have to yeah, that, that's, have HRA? That's being managed by HRA. In fact, okay. I'm not even in the selection committee. They'll, they'll oh, interesting. <laughs> okay, that, so. that's quite interesting. Um, and then um, the work described in the request for proposals requires collaboration across multiple providers. Um, will Moya consider amending the request for proposals to allow for multiple providers to collaborate to meet the requirements of the request for proposals? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that, but um, you know, the, my understanding is that, that the way that this was crafted by HRA and, and the ACO there, it, it allows people to uh, you know, submit requests for proposals uh, or submit applications, proposals, uh, with multiple agencies, uh, as we did with um, with the request for proposals uh, on the navigation center, we're looking to work with one providers who can work with then many uh, folks who they then uh, regrant to. And then, what is the long term plan for providing representation to these individuals? Again, because we're dealing with an unprecedented moment, a humanitarian uh, challenge and the numbers continue to grow, uh, we'll continue to look uh, and adjust. Uh, you know, the reality is that about a month and a half ago, two months ago, we were talking about one or two buses per, every other day, and now we're talking about upwards of nine buses per day. Uh, so we'll continue to look uh, at the resources available and what we can do for people. Got it. And then um, have you contacted the bar associations, law schools, large private law firms for additional support? Yes, in fact, we're trying to, we're looking at every, every possible way to, to provide support to asylum seekers. I've personally met with a number of legal service providers that work with volunteers, including the bar, including uh, a group called VOLS, Volunteers of Legal Providers. Uh, who've used uh, very, very innovative ways to, to scale up their services. Reality though is that we're talking about thousands of people and possibly tens of thousands of people by the end of the year. And you know, it's a challenge and we're committed to working through this with, with our uh, nonprofit partners. Thank you. And then can you confirm that the administration won't be pulling um, from other funding streams like adult literacy or any other initiatives to fund these emergency procurements? Uh, I, I don't believe that that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I have to get back to you. Uh, I have to speak with OMB about this, but uh, you know, we're, you know, as far as have my discussions, I, we, we are not considering any of that. Yeah, that would be quite devastating to um, some of the other initiatives that we are fully funding or trying to baseline fund. So I'm just gonna do a final run through of any other questions that I should ask as I have you here, um, but I know there are many, many folks from the public who are also here to testify. Um, but I just wanna share, this was extremely informative. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your, your work, your continued work, and um, for being here to respond to the many questions that we wanted to know more about um, and have a, a little bit of a clearer understanding exactly how the administration is um, building out infrastructure. Um, so just one final run through before I open up. And any, Councilman Brewer, do you have any final questions? Um, I, maybe you asked this, because I was downstairs. Cruise ships, are we doing cruise ships? Did that get asked? Something about Staten Island and a cruise ship? We're looking into it. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
And thank you for the commitments you've made to um, some of the follow-up questions I had and some of the numbers that I've asked for. Um, we'll be following up uh, as soon as possible for all of that. So with that, thank you all so much. Um, looking forward to staying engaged and in partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We will be calling a panel of public uh, witnesses next, but please give us a few moments as we shift over. Thank you everyone for your patience. I will now be calling um, our first panel of for public testimony. We'll start with New York State Senator Alessandra Biagi, followed by Jessica Fran Franco Ramos, and then Frankie Miranda. Senator Biagi, you can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Thanks very much. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Good. Okay, great. Wasn't sure about that. Thank you so much. Um, let me know when it's my time to begin. Time has begun. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman and members of the Committee on Immigration. I want to just say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify today and also for holding, honestly, such a thoughtful hearing. I think those questions that you all asked in the previous session were incredible and I learned a lot and I hope that for those who are at home and for those who are watching um, and members of the press that they also learned a lot too. For those who don't know, my name is Alessandra Biaggi and I have the honor of serving as the state senator for the 34th State Senate District, which includes Orchard Beach. And I'm testifying today to express my deep concern for the migrants who will be sent to the planned humanitarian and emergency response and relief center in Orchard Beach's parking lot. It really is my sincere hope that Mayor Eric Adams and his administration will be thoughtful and change course and also pursue alternative temporary shelter options, many of which we've heard today as suggestions. My office and I have been in close contact with organizers on the ground, with mutual aid groups on the ground since August, helping migrants acclimate once they arrive in New York City. 
Many mutual aid organizations and migrants have expressed alarm regarding the lack of resources available upon their arrival to Port Authority. Yesterday, as just one quick anecdote, I was able to hear um, from one of the migrants who came to New York City from Venezuela. And um, I think it was one of the most gut-wrenching stories I've heard in a very long time about his experience. Many asylum seekers are arriving without knowledge of how to access resources in this country, in this city, including food, clothing, phone service, and accessible transportation. We did hear, yes, earlier about the efforts to make these kinds of services available, but it's not happening at 100% effective rate. Our government is not providing the basic necessities that they need to be able to start a life here in New York or to really to reach their final destination. And so we've got to do better. We have heard firsthand the dangerous experiences that migrants are having in our city shelter system, which we understand, of course, is overwhelmed. But the proposed relief center at Orchard Beach feels like and seems like, after hearing a little more today, an insufficient and inappropriate solution. Mutual aid groups and others have raised important concerns about the planned facility, including the lack of running water and adequate bathroom facilities. We did hear, of course, about having different showers and, and different trailers set up, but for the number of people who will be there, we do not believe that this is the sufficient amount. Also, insufficient temperature control, unsafe closeness of beds. Time has expired. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I will have my testimony fully um, given to the committee so you can read it. But let me just end by saying that in the midst of this humanitarian crisis, I really do encourage the city to make systemic changes to an overburdened shelter system because we have to do better in New York City. That is our mandate as New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Biagi. Next, we are calling Jessica Franco Ramos, followed by Frankie Miranda, and then Cassie Keith. Um, if you're in person, you can come up to the dais and have a seat when you hear your name called. Yep. You just um, push the button on the mic. Type thank you. Uh, no, not at the moment, but I'm happy to email it later. Words. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Franco Ramos. I'm Director of Community Affairs and Special Events for State Senator Salazar. Um, she covers all of Senate District 18. Thank you for inviting me to give my testimony at this hearing on behalf of the asylum seekers and on behalf of, the, of New York State Senator Julia Salazar. I want to thank Councilwoman Hanif and the entire City Council for uh, its concerns about the lives of our newest members of New York City. It was not that long ago where, in my own journey to this country, I traveled by foot across the U.S. border in pursuit of freedom and a better way of life for myself and my siblings and for my future family. In my 2,550-mile walk was fueled by hope and the knowledge that those on the other side of the border would understand how much more we had in common in our ambitions and dreams for a better future. My journey, one filled with fear, pain, and ambition, and much determination would not be in vain. On September 22nd, a group of asylum seekers were physically assaulted at a shelter site uh, in Brooklyn North, over at 193 Cook Street, which is, which is in uh, Senator Salazar's district, District 18. Fearing for their lives, the four families that were physically assaulted fled in the middle of the night. Some went to a shelter in Queens, and others remained um, and two families walked over to the uh, PATH assessment shelter in the Bronx. And I'm going to repeat, they walked. There was no train, there was no bus, um, they're very new and so they don't know how to do uh, mass transportation. The team at the, uh, at the office of State Senator Salazar and I personally have been in contact with the families. Currently they are in stable condition and in semi-permanent housing. The next steps are making sure that the children are attending schools located in proximity to their new communities and for the families to learn their rights as asylum seekers and the protections they're entitled to now that they're here in New York City. These attacks are traumatizing and unforgivable, a sign of complete failure and neglect. A full and independent investigation must take place for this shelter over at 193 Cook Street by the provider of Acacia. To leave this incident without an, a full investigation and understanding of what took place is to guarantee that it would happen again. Many families have shared that they have faced xenophobic 
uh, discrimination based on their immigration status, uh, that they've been made fun of and threatened that ICE will be called if they complained, they've been served moldy food, um, and many times uh, not, uh, have not been provided equitable translation. As New Yorkers, immigrants contribute imaginable time and expense to make the city great. For this reason, we expect and deserve more from our government and the institutions that represent them. This is a city built by and for immigrants. It is interwoven and in part expired. of the multicultural tapestry of New York City. Thank you for your time. Please do a full investigation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Francesca Peron. I'm a policy analyst at the Hispanic Federation and I'm presenting this testimony on behalf of our president and CEO, Frankie Miranda. Thank you, Chair Hanif, and all other members of the Committee on Immigration for allowing me to present this testimony on behalf of the Hispanic Federation, a nonprofit organization that's seeking to empower and advance the Hispanic community. As the largest Latino umbrella organization in the nation, the Federation collaborates with a network of 500 nonprofits in 41 states, Puerto Rico and the, the District of Columbia. More than 174 of our members and partners are here in New York City. Could you speak directly into the mic? Yes, sorry. I'm here to, today to discuss how we can continue to, to support asylum seekers and migrants in New York City. In order to complete my testimony in the allot allotted time, I'm going to shorten our submitted, submitted written testimony and be as direct as possible. The individuals arriving at our border are abiding by US and international laws and have every right to make their claim for asylum. Many are escaping unimaginable horrors, including civil strife, environmental disasters, extreme poverty and physical violence, and so much more. They deserve to be treated with respect, dignity, and compassion when they arrive in our country. Sadly, we have shameless politicians such as Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis that choose to exploit the most vul vulnerable among us, including children, pregnant mothers, and families all fleeing persecution. They're trying to fearmonger and trying to score cheap political points. Here in New York, we stand ready to do what we have always done, which is to bring communities and institutions together to welcome and help those most in need. This summer, the staff at the Hispanic Federation has traveled to Port Authority on many mornings to join the Mayor's Office on Immigrant Affairs to welcome those being bused from Texas. At Port Authority, nonprofit organizations and city staff are the first people to welcome individuals and offer resources such as personal hygiene products and clothing. We've seen firsthand the importance of culturally and linguistically relevant assistance. This group has been able to connect these individuals with essential resources, including health insurance, shelter, food, and legal services. The city council and mayor's office must lead by expanding resources and partnership with these trusted community-based organizations to deliver culturally and linguistically competent care. Migrants deserve the right to receive information in their native language, and these community-based organizations have proven their ability to efficiently connect with high-need individuals and provide services. We encourage city government to minimize duplication of efforts by partnering with the Hispanic Federation and our network to ensure that incoming migrants continue to receive timely, high-quality care. We hope city government can provide additional investments for these organizations to meet the influx of asylum seekers and help them achieve the quality of life, life that they have fought so hard to attain, obtain. Addition, additionally, while New York City must remain committed to providing services to those who are seeking asylum, we must be mindful of the wants and needs of our migrants. There are many asylum seekers who wish to reside in other states and to be reunited with family or loved ones. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. We look forward to continue uh, working with you to provide support for migrants, and we will continue to ad advocate to ensure that their needs are being met with dignity and respect. Thank you. Is there anybody else on this panel? Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to Cassie Keith, who is joining us via Zoom. Cassie, you can proceed when the sergeant's call time. Time has begun. Hi, my name is Cassie Keith. Thank you for taking my testimony today about the ongoing migrant crisis. As you know, there's currently a tremendous strain on the shelter system. But despite the rhetoric coming from City Hall, the strain existed long before the arrival of migrants out of state. People have been entering the shelter for years due to eviction crisis created by an uncontrolled rent hike. And many like me have been stuck in the shelter for many years because they are undocumented. Unfortunately, over the coming month, many who arrived recently will become undocumented. And when that happens, they will have no pathway out of the shelter system. 
The mayor has requested the right to work permit for migrants who are coming in. This is misguided. When you search for a job with your address as a shelter, many employers won't give you a chance. I have lost many job opportunities because of the prejudice people have toward the homeless. These asylum seekers may stay away from criminal record. This is difficult because we have fully criminalized the homeless and being in a shelter means being subjected to violence. People will attack and when, you, when they defend themselves, they will be arrested and risk deportation. More security will not solve this. I have never seen staff attack residents, but they do put residents in situation where they know fight will happen. If the shelter will make it worse, even the people who attack me are in the shelter system. The mayor plans to open up massive density uh, to deal with the influx. For those in the shelter know they will not be temporary or reserved to new arrival. In the shelter next to me, we have people, men and women, sleeping on lounge chairs. This has been true since long before the asylum seekers came in. This um, is asylum seekers today, but anyone getting evicted um, over the coming month now run the risk of being placed in one of these tents. There are two pathways ahead of us. One, on the one, one hand, we um, this challenge us to live up to the promises we already made as a city. We can use this opportunity to open up pathways for folks who have been in the shelter a long time to get a permanent dignified home. On the other hand, this could represent an end to the right of uh, right to shelter as we know it. If you walk away to the hearing one thing, it should be this. There is an aging and vulnerable population of undocumented people living in the shelter. They have, um, they have no pathway to permanent housing. We need people to understand that once people become undocumented, they are not eligible for programs that can get them out of, uh, that can get them out like city felt. They will join me and thousands like me who are getting older and sicker and running out of time to get out. I urge the city council to do everything in its power to open city up to undocumented New Yorkers and create the desperately needed shelter capacity by moving people out uh, who, uh, who have been stuck in the shelter for years. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Nilbia Coyote. Uh, Nilbia, you can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Time has begun. Good afternoon, my name is Nibia Coyote. I'm the ED at New Immigrant Community Empowerment NICE, one of the largest CBOs in Jackson Heights, Queens. I will deliver this testimony on behalf of hundreds of asylum seekers that are now members of NICE, but who do not want to reveal their identity or participate in this hearing out of fear. NICE's mission is to organize new immigrants, day laborers, and families in New York to build their collective power. To achieve this, we combine the strength of workforce development training and education on worker rights, advocacy, and programs tailored to immigrant workers. We have always supported recently arrived immigrants and asylum seekers, and we have become one of the, a safe haven for all. However, in recent months, there has been an exponential growth in demand for our services, mostly our workforce development services. Why does that matter for asylum seekers? Because the reality is that these new compañeros and compañeras are in dire need of a stable situation dignify housing, food, clothing for the winter, and to plan for the future. To do that, they need a steady, a steady job and save income. Without legitimate work papers and information on how to, save, to stay safe and protect themselves, our asylum seekers are at great risk of workplace safety violations, injury, and even death, as thousands of other undocumented New Yorkers are already. This is why hundreds of asylum seekers are coming to our centers and offices every week. Just last night, we had over one, 350 new people coming to our orientation. What is for sure is that asylum seekers are now joining the ranks of the very vulnerable workforce of new immigrants, day laborers, and undocumented workers looking for trabajitos or small jobs in the construction industry to make some money. And that's how eventually at the paradas or corners and worker centers like ours, they found out about the OSHA card, worker rights, and what they need to do to work in the informal market of the construction industry. Currently, our OSHA and SST trainings, skills development trainings, and wage tech clinics are filled out by asylum seekers and new immigrants. At NICE, we are concentrating our efforts on workforce development for asylum seekers because the long-term economic integration is often an invisible barrier no one is talking about. New immigrants are already being exploited by wage theft and unscrupulous employers who have used their desperation. 
We cannot let that happen. In the coming year, NICE has the ability to train new immigrants and asylum seekers and give them the tools they need to thrive regardless of their immigration status. But we can only do this with the continuing support of the city and other governments. We nevertheless ask the city council members and the administration to continue the conversation on these other needs of asylum seekers and thousands of immigrants workers in the city, along with legal services, food, housing, dignified jobs and worker rights are fundamental to the integration and contribution of new immigrants to our city. Lastly, we, we ask to continue fighting for the thousands of immigrants who have been fighting for legal status and immigration reform for years in our city. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. I have, can I go into questions? I have a question for um, Senator Biaggi, if she's still on. Senator Biaggi, are you still available? No. We can come back to her. Go ahead. Thank you very much for all the work you're doing and NICE is doing. So my question is, because I am very concerned, as you heard, I want working papers, I want the federal government to do what they're supposed to do, et cetera. But in the interim, how are you able to get people jobs? Is there something else the city could be doing to be of assistance? The I municipal ID doesn't help. Is there any other, is the, <clears throat> does this working internship mean anything when people don't have working papers? I, I just, I, I know you're the expert. Thank you. Thank you for that question. We actually need a lot of support and resources. Uh, one of the dire needs of these newcomers are the lack of IP number. This is not a legal practice, but this is a practice that a lot of companies in the construction industry allow um, workers to have so they can get jobs. Uh, another situation is that once um, asylum seekers are uh, graduating from OSHA SST training, we need the government, the federal and the local government to accelerate the process to get those cards. Um, otherwise, people are not allowed to uh, work in the construction sites and the issuance of those cards can take one to two months. That's a long time. Um, we have been noticing that people need to work. They need to work, you know, it. they need to work right away. Um, so I would say IT numbers, collaboration of federal government and local government for these uh, workers to have their OSHA and SSD cards, and obviously opportunities of jobs in the construction industry will be um, mostly appreciated. Working with um, either employers, subcontractors, and probably even unions to be able to get jobs for uh, more and more immigrant workers in the city. Thank you. And while I have Nilbia on, um, could you share how many asylum seekers um, NICE has been supporting and how much more funding is required to meet the organizational need to continue supporting asylum seekers? Thank you, um, Councilwoman Hanif. We, as I did mention this, but we have seen new waves of new immigrants uh, coming to our city for the last two years. This is not this is nothing new, as probably my compañera Yesenia will share from La Colmena. Uh, however, we have seen a lot of new cases in the last months. But for the last two years, we have been referring over 500 individuals to the shelter system. Um, additionally, right now, um, we have been probably receiving over 150 individuals per day at our centro. Half of them are what we call new immigrants. As um, the members of the administration were explaining, we don't have accurate information to say that all of them are asylum seekers because many people arrive and um, they're asylees. They, they haven't like started the process. That's why we, we call them newly arrived immigrants because we don't have that specific information. But if you, if you, if you make a calculation over 100 people per day, it's like almost more than 500 people per week. Um, we hold monthly orientations for new members at NICE, and we have seen since July an increase of individuals. In July, we had over 100 
people in our orientation. In August, we have uh, 150 people. And last night, we had 350 individuals arriving to our orientation. We had to turn away 100 people, and we had to provide two orientations, each one of them to 125. 90% of these individuals are newly arrived immigrants to the city. Currently, wow. just to give you another indicator, we are holding OSHA classes this month of September. Um, I was in one of these classes last Wednesday, and we have a maximum amount of 40 people per class. This is what is legally accepted by OSHA. And 21 of these students are newly arrived immigrants. They come from Venezuela, from Cuba, from Colombia, from Ecuador, and I would say 80% of them are, um, you know, are in their track of asylum uh, process. Thank you, Nilvia. That's really, really helpful to know. And for the folks who you've had to turn away, um, where have they gone? Well, they, they're going to have to come back for another uh, orientation from NICE. The situation is that Obviously, all these people need to work, and for us, at least, we need, we need to have a process because we do have a demand for OSHA and SST classes, so we ask them to come to, to these orientations. What we are trying to do now, because we are do working with the city, is to ramp up our trainings, um, since we know that the construction industry is, is one of the you know, places where people are gonna be looking for work, they are already um, at Las Paradas, the corners, that's what we know. And, um, but nobody's gonna hire you without the ocean SST training. Um, so we ask them to come back. If they cannot come back, we refer them to our sister organizations such as La Colmena, who is gonna be talking also today, and um, other, other trustworthy places where they can get their certifications, but it is important to mention that Ocean SST cards are one of the biggest uh, frauds and abuses among the, the immigrant community. So obviously that makes this population very vulnerable to scams and frauds in everywhere in the city. Right, right. Thank, Thank you, you so that. much. Appreciate that and appreciate your continued work here. Um, to Senator Biagi, Hi. Thank you so much, first of all, for testifying and being on today. As an elected in the area, were you engaged in any conversation about the selection of Orchard Beach um, as a HERC? Unfortunately, I was not. Um, and had I been, I probably would have mentioned that Orchard Beach is considered not just a low-lying coastal area, um, but it's in the middle of a hurricane evacuation zone one, which is the highest risk category for flooding um, in all of New York City emergency management zones. So now that you know we've caused some noise around this and have repeatedly talked about the uh, flood prone area, et cetera, um, what are the conversations the administration is engaging in with you and other local electeds at this time? So I will say that I think this is an area where they are, I think, at least in, in my experience, uh, trying to communicate as much and as frequently as possible. So um, I was able to communicate and have a conversation with Commissioner Iskall um, actually this morning. My team has been included on a lot of the calls that they're doing um, with elected officials. There was one yesterday. Um, but what I will just say is that these conversations are helpful. They are important because nothing can be done without communication. But an important theme that I think is resonating throughout these conversations is the theme of what feels like impossibility. And what I mean by this is that there is almost a sense of um, determination to erect these tents in, um, in Orchard Beach and in other places. And I think there's, there's a little bit of a blind spot, if not a lot of bit of a blind spot, um, around the impact that this is having on the migrants. And so from the conversations that I've had in addition to the administration, but also with some of the migrants, we know that they're calling these tents Yalera, and I apologize if I did not pronounce that 100% properly, um, but that term refers to the detention facilities on the border. And so the simple fact that these tents remind them of 
the trauma that they have just encountered entering our country really feels outrageous. And it cannot be the standard that we set for lots of different reasons, but we don't want this to be the precedent. And I think that it is imperative that we find alternative locations that are true brick and mortar that will provide safety for the long term. If it is that someone has to stay beyond 96 hours, because we know the reality is that that probably is a likelihood. So um, I'll stop there because I'm sure you have other questions, but just wanted to give you some additional background. No, thank you so much for that. Um, what is your hope moving forward? Well, my number one hope is that um, as government <laughs> officials um, and as government partners from city, state, and federal, that we trust each other, number one, to be able to communicate what is going on. Because I think one of the worst things that can happen is that we find out when either something has already been decided or we find out in the press. I think it's something that doesn't set the tone of the relationship that we all are aiming to have. So that's number one. So open communication and decision making that includes us before the decision is actually final. That's number one. Number two, we have got to find alternative locations. I know that this is a situation that is happening in New York City because these are migrants that are coming through Port Authority. But this is not a New York City sole problem. This is a New York State issue that we have to deal with collectively. And so that means that when we're looking for alternative centers, we should be looking beyond New York City to places like Westchester County. I know that there are campuses. I know that there are empty facilities. There's the Westchester County Center. I'm sure there's lots of different events being held there, just like there are events being held at Javits. But here's the thing. In New York, we have done the impossible in so many situations and times when people counted us out. And this is one of those situations where we can't get this wrong because people's lives are at stake. So communication, alternative location, and then at the end of the day, I think that really what we have the possibility to do here is to actually set the standard of what it looks like to succeed. Because at the end of the day, we all want to make sure that every single human being, because I want to just remind those who might dehumanize the migrants that these are human beings who are coming here to New York, that every single human being that sets foot into New York State is treated with the same amount of dignity that we would treat anybody else. That is the standard that we set as New Yorkers, and we cannot just write people off simply because of the, the way in which they've gotten here or their immigration status. I think that we have to move beyond that, and we got to do it urgently. And, and honestly, in a situation like this where we have an administration, I think there are a lot of staff members working very hard, but at the end of the day, our mayor sets the tone and the tone right now is not a good one. And so we've got as elected officials to really continue to call out the needs and the desires that we think are important. And those things include not putting people in tents because at the end of the day, you can call it whatever you want to call it. That's what they are. And if they're going to, tr if they're going to trigger more trauma, it's our responsibility to prevent that from happening. So those are my hopes. Thank you for asking those questions. I think they're incredibly important. And I really, I have faith that we can do this. I know we can, we did, we pulled the impossible off during COVID. We can do anything in the city, but we have to, we have to want to. And I think that right now, my question is whether or not this mayor actually wants to do that. Thank you so much. You bet. No more questions for this panel. Thank you. Um, next, we will call Pedro Perez, Murad Awade, Aracelis Lucero, and Camille Mackler. You can come up to the dais um, and just flagging for anyone who might need language interpretation services. We do have those available. Just reach out to the sergeants and they can help you out.
So, Pedro, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Pedro Perez, and I'm proudly from Venezuela. Uh, myself, as an immigrant, I know at first hand what is going on uh, really in the whole situation of the shelters, and I want to uh, bring to the table what's really happening uh, about the LGBT community. Okay, so as a member of that, uh, I have seen by my own eyes and have listened from many members of the community that are suffering uh, all types of harassment, uh, sexual harassment in general. And as I heard, I learned a lot, and there's some blind spots about this whole situation. Uh, we are not being able to choose where we want to be. It's, that's my case. Uh, this is my fourth day trying to get to a shelter of the LGBT community, but I wouldn't be able, and I don't know why, uh, because I have testified in front of them what is happening, and they won't listen to me. So uh, I think we should point this out because this is a very, very uh, delicate point because uh, people are getting deep depression uh, by going through this. And I do believe that uh, a society uh, mentally health with uh, a great mental health is a great society. So whenever the worst conditions are being in the shelters, the worst is gonna be the results of the mental health of, of every member of that shelter, no matter what are your sexual orientations or situation right now. Uh, I think we should point this out and take into account uh, all the communities, all, all the people that are getting through this. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for, for uh, letting me expose this point. And I really uh, want you to take this in account and I'm sure, I'm sure we all make it the difference and that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, next, we'll move on to Murad Awade. Good afternoon, almost evening um, to everyone. Congrats on your marathon hearing, chairperson. I um, want to just point out that there's no one here from the administration um, and no one actually listening to the stories that you're about to hear. So the fact of the matter is, is that you know we sat through over three hours of testimony. Um, I don't even know how much time that was, but yes, of hearing a lot of dodging of questions you know, humanitarian, we've never seen a humanitarian urgent moment like this. Um, and I think hearing from folks on the ground is critically important in this moment. Uh, my name is Murad Wauda. I'm the executive director of the New York Immigration Coalition. We're an umbrella advocacy and policy organization that works across the state with over 200 members uh, serving immigrant communities. Thank you to the chair, uh, immigration chair Hanif and the members of the city council for convening this important hearing and allowing us an opportunity to testify. New York is facing a pivotal moment in its long history of welcoming newcomers. Since May, we've been responding to the humanitarian crisis with the sudden arrival of more than 15,000 immigrants to our city. This crisis is caused by both our broken immigration system and the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, using human beings as political pawns by busing them and their families directly to New York City. Um, even before the first buses started to arrive, um, organizations like ours, Catholic Charities, and many others started receiving notices to appear uh, for folks, which are immigration notices. 
um, and people started arriving to our offices. Not, we did not receive as many as Catholic Charities, but folks started to come seeking support. Um, by early August, the, the buses started coming directly to Port Authority. That does not mean that the buses were not coming before. And I want to give a huge shout out to um, Team TLC, New York City, to artists, um, athletes, and activists, uh, and the amazing volunteers who've held it down, welcoming buses at Port Authority, not at Port Authority, welcoming people at airports, which is happening. Um, you know, Adama Ba, Power Malau, um, Lila Mejia, and everyone else who's really stepping up in this moment to make sure that our folks are welcomed with dignity and with respect. Um, this moment calls for a, ro a robust, coordinated response from the federal government down to the local one. We need to step up in a different way than we have been. And while the city has been taking steps to ensure that asylum seekers are welcomed, just welcoming people is not enough. And I'll be wrapping up shortly. Um, I wanna highlight uh, some really top priorities that we, we want the city to take um, and are demanding in this moment through our Welcoming New York campaign, which is allocating $10 million for emergency immigration legal services, an additional $10 million for community-based organizations to provide wraparound services, organizing mobile vaccine clinics at shelters, expanding the eligibility of city FEPs, and providing rental assistance to individuals regardless of immigration status, filling the vacant units within the CHIP program, the Community Housing Improvement Program apartments across the city, and providing $500,000 million, $500, in emergency funding to immediately place additional interpreters at enrollment centers and pop-up sites for the next two months, place newcomer youth in schools where staff have training in supporting newcomers um, and English language learners. Bilingual mental health supports are read where they are also readily available and providing robust wraparound services for our youngest, newest New Yorkers. And we wanna ensure that asylum seeking families and their children have access to continuous educational, social and language based support services throughout the academic year. We have an opportunity to help New York respond in a way that provides a path forward, not just for the city, but for the country. And in order to meet the overwhelming and unmet needs of asylum seekers, New York must act swiftly and strategically. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. You can go ahead ourselves. Hello. Um, so thank you to Immigration Chair um, Shahana Hani. I had a thank you also to all the remaining <laughs> Um, administrators, but they're not here. <laughs> uh, my name is Araceli Lucero. I am the executive director of MASA, a community-based organization in the South Bronx, who for the last two decades has a history of working with immigrants, especially recently arrived immigrants, providing them with critical services around education and wraparound family support services, as well as advocacy and leadership opportunities for youth and parents in the areas of education and immigration. MASA is a member of the New York Immigration Coalition, the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice, the Language Access Collaborative under the New York Immigration Coalition, and also the Education Collaborative under the New York Immigration Coalition. As the asylum crisis has unfolded, we did not have to wait for too long to start seeing people, more people continue to trickling into our centers requesting services and help. Due to capacity concerns, we have not been publicizing much of the support that we can give. However, daily, about three to five families or groups of people from shelters, schools, or referrals come to MASA looking for basic help like jobs, food, cash, basic necessities like hygiene supplies, clothing, ESL classes, health resources, um, especially mental health resources for young children, um, and earlier on, enrollment support. We've also been seeing families just come for even laundry money. Um, when we ask what kind of support they're getting from the shelters, they seem lost and confused and simply say that the person that has been helping them no longer has resources for them or simply don't know how to answer. Most recently, many have walked in looking for winter coats and clothing and food. As a response, we are reinstating our food pantry program that we ended in late June and starting a winter clothing drive, as we know of very few places providing clothing. 
Every person or family that comes through our door has a minimum of three to five things that they need help with, which we are trying our best to do. And we expect more to be coming through because of word of mouth, um, and especially as a winter months um, approach. Today, I'd like to share some recommendations that MASA, along with other fierce advocates and coalition members, have been advocating for for years, and which, quite frankly, if they had been funded, would have made the city more equipped today to handle situations like these, especially in times of crisis and especially in support of immigrant communities. The first that I'd like to address is language, ac language access. I truly disagree with some of the things that were said here around the language line. It is our community members' experience that even with Local Law 30, many times even information in Spanish isn't available or interpretation is not available in key places like schools, hospitals, clinics, and with large social service providers. Furthermore, many people refuse to use the language line or are not happy with it because often they say things are lost in translation or the wrong variant of their language is being used. This is especially important for asylum seekers where their stories really cannot be lost in translation in order to create credible cases for them. For this reason, the Language Access Collaborative comprised of MASA, the New York Immigration Coalition, Asian American Federation, and African Communities Together have been advocating for the creation of language worker cooperatives for languages of limited diffusion in order to meet the need. We need culturally competent and well-trained community members that are more equipped to build trusting relationships with those who need it most. Historically, marginalized communities and those recently arrived who are struggling to navigate complex and large New York City systems don't get that type of support. The other area that I'd like to address is education. We've seen how English language learners have severely underperformed through really no fault of their own because schools have been ill-equipped to support them. One group that has been forgotten are older newcomer or undercredited Ls who have very little school options that will provide the level of support needed for them to succeed. And most of those schools that do provide the support are actually in Manhattan and very few in the boroughs, which is concerning. For the past three years, the New York Immigration Coalition Education Collaborative has asked the City Council to fund $2.1 million to support the creation of 400 additional seats to support these youth. We know more has to be done as only 60% of English language learner students are graduating compared to 81% for the general population. We already know that thousands of school age youth are already in our system. The last count, I believe, was 4,600. Furthermore, parent engagement of limited English proficient parents is also poor. And I fear that without a proper engagement strategy to involve parents, student performance and their social emotional well-being will suffer. Last but not least, I'd like to flag that as part of the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice, not only did this parent-powered group advocate for a culturally responsive education definition and anti-bias training, but the creation of a culturally responsive curriculum, which under the prior administration was named the Mosaic Curriculum. I would recommend that the City Council ask the New York City Department of Education how this new curriculum will specifically support English language learners and ensure that they are feeling welcome and see themselves and their families, not just in chapters or in monthly celebrations and Taco Tuesdays, but as meaningful, whole, and contributing members of their school communities every <coughs> single day. For years, we've been advocating for resources to address systemic barriers and systems of oppression that continue to keep black and brown communities marginalized. We cannot continue to just meet the status quo, but instead realize that when we are doing our best by the most marginalized communities, then it serves to uplift all of us, and we are a greater city for that. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Camille, you can go ahead. Thank you. I speak fast. so. Um, I'm Camille Mackler, the Executive Director of Immigrant Arc. We're a coalition of over 80 organizations that provide immigration legal services throughout New York State. I'm here to speak specifically about the legal needs and how the administration has absolutely failed to meet them. Um, sadly, our immigration system is designed to make anyone who tries to go through it fail. And it is a system that, at this point, <coughs> excuse me, requires a lawyer or requires legal assistance to navigate um, and to be successful. There are numerous statistics all in my testimony of the impact of having legal representation. At this time, legal service providers have for years now been pivoting every single year to meet the latest demand, the latest crisis. We know how to do rapid response and we are stunned that our expertise has been dismissed by the administration in favor of creating programs that limit the level of services that people receive to the bare minimum and do not engage in our ability to shape a, a legal delivery service system 
legal service delivery system, excuse me, that would meaningfully help people protect their rights and assert their right to apply for asylum. Um, there have been many stakeholder engagements. It does not appear that any of the feedback that was in, that we gave was incorporated into it. Um, the latest procurement does not allow for meaningful legal service delivery. It also um, is, seems premised on an assumption that lawyers can simply walk away from the cases that they currently represent. Lawyers have been scrambling, legal services I should say, it's not just lawyers, um, have been scrambling to meet this need, but at the end of the day, an attorney has an ethical obligation to represent its current clients, but also how can we walk away from those who are already receiving our services? And no attorney wants to say no to somebody who needs their help. And no attorney wants to know that somebody is going through the, the process without their assistance, but they need resources to do that. And there are ways to do it. And for some reason, they don't seem to have been listened to. Um, we also applaud the initiative to go to the state and the feds. Um, with the state, if the city would like the support of the state, the, we would ask that they come out in support of the Access to Representation Act, which is a bill that would create a right to counsel for anybody facing deportation in New York's immigration courts. Um, at the federal level, money from the feds would be great. Of course, it is long past time that the federal government should be providing an attorney or a legal representation to anyone going through the immigration system, but they could also be helping us advocate for extensions of parole, because right now these individuals are in the country with at most 60 days to to figure it all out and get their applications filed. And the reality is that they can't even file their case until they get to court, and that's gonna take four to six months. So an extension for two years would allow these individuals to come to the United States, to apply for a work authorization, to orient themselves to their new communities, and to get the services that they need without the fear of deportation hanging over their heads. Um, so we echo the ask of the um, New York Immigration Coalition for $10 million. I would also say that our current funding structures are such that they've responded to crisis after crisis and are siloed in the way that they can deliver services. So when we think of funding, we need to think of the short-term rapid response funding that is needed in any emergency situation, but also long-term funding to create sustainable resources that will go on for the years that it takes to get an immigration case through. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, Aracelis, I'd love to um, uh, get to know a little bit more about the language access needs. We're having a hearing um, on October 19th on a package of bills that would advance, strengthen language access in, in our city. Um, one of the bills in that package is mine for the creation of the Office of Interpretation and Translation under the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. In this budget cycle, we put in the investment for the worker cooperatives for language services, which has not been rolled out yet. Um, we're waiting to determine what that's gonna look like, but of course it's not gonna happen without the coalition um, that had been pushing for many, many years to move towards a worker cooperative model to provide language services. So if you could just talk a little bit more about why it's so critical um, to not outsource or do it through language line and rather focus on in-community talent and skills, paid folks, um, to, to really do language access right? So there's several components. I think it really also depends on the community members that we're serving. There's different levels of literacy. There's also culturally a lot of like oral um, tradition communities that are coming over that feel the most safest with actually com like there may be something with like women or experiencing something that they only feel comfortable to talk into another woman or in somebody that looks like them. We've had several instances, and this is not new, this is like years and years and why we've been advocating it, and really it was also in response to when the city put in money for um, NIFA for, this is like years ago, um, because what we were realizing is a lot of legal service providers were reaching out for to community-based organization for culturally responsive um, support and translation to have these interviews with the um, with asylum seekers, with people who were going through their immigration case, because it wasn't always the case that they were being 100% um, truthful or felt comfortable. And so with immigration, with health especially, I have a personal experience with my dad, that unfortunately he passed away, um, where he wasn't comfortable with language line, and I went to 
help support him. Um, I really do that, that do think that that made a difference with him being comfortable telling the doctor um, what was happening with his situation. Unfortunately, he passed away of a massive heart attack a week after I was able to accompany with him to um, uh, Lincoln Hospital. Um, and so it is critically important because for the lives of the families that are coming here, it is truly a life or death situation. Um, we cannot miss a beat, we cannot miss a step. And I am telling you that there's things that we hear in our office that we ask them, um, why didn't they say something or this would be an important thing for their case to share. Um, and it, it, it's because there was no trust. We've also partnered for a very long time with organizations like Unlocal, where MASA staff would step in to provide interpretation, um, or we already had built trust with the community, and so we would sit with the lawyer and sit with the community member who we'd already had heard their ca case several times, but we weren't lawyers to help them, um, to help support that process in documenting their cases and in making sure that we were able to collect all of the things that they needed in order to have a strong, um, case whenever they would present in court. Um, there's many, many instances. Um, people will take their children, right? And you're re-traumatizing children. Um, again, the language line, every single system, we help the education, the health and hospitals, um, the um, legal system. Every single time we talk to community members and we um, work specifically with a large um, indigenous speaking community, who has a lot of oral traditions, they're not gonna be comfortable. Um, and also, whenever they don't know their rights, whenever they don't know who to really trust, that's another problem. So they're not gonna completely be transparent about what their issue is. Thank you so much for that. And then, um, Pedro, thank you so much um, for uh, just lifting up how critical it is to have uh, resources and services and a very hands-on approach to folks who are part of the LGBTQ community. Could you share, have you been able to, um, have, are you right now placed in a shelter that is meeting your needs? Yes, I'm currently staying in Brooklyn. A shelter that is, is located in Brooklyn. And uh, basically what we have to do to uh, sly, let's say, uh, in that uh, that jungle, I mean, just express some words, uh, is to stay quiet, try to be invisible, try to not show up so much, and just in the first time that you had the opportunity to just leave and, and be out there as many times as possible because uh, the more time you spend inside, the more probably it is that you're gonna suffer uh, any type of harassment. So you're not in a, a, a queer-friendly shelter right now? No. And how long have you tried to get transferred out? Today is the fourth day. Fourth day, so for four, the last four days you've been trying to get transferred out. Yes. And what are they, like, what have they said to you? Okay, so, uh, I even say that in the shelter that I want to uh, be transferred to, uh, they say basically that I'm too old to get in. I'm, I'm 22 years old. And uh, I heard also that that shelter allows from 18 to 25. So uh, there's clearly something that is missing. Somebody is not doing their job because uh, it's not just me. There's a few people that I've, are experiencing the same thing. So yeah, basically that. And then outside of the shelter, have they at least connected you to resources or communities um, where you can receive um, uh, the friendship or be in community with other LGBTQ folks in our city? Well, in my case, uh, what I do when I go out of, of the shelter is uh, hang around with the Team TLC and have some volunteer. That, that's what we're doing today. Um, uh, basically, yeah, there is uh, a few people of the community and we just hang out, uh, just being away from the place that we, don't, we do not want to be. What my point is that 
we should figure out a way how to spot the LGBT community and bring in to a place, to a, sa a, a safe environment where they can be uh, uh, truly what they are or who they are, I'm so sorry, uh, dress like they want to dress, do whatever they want to do, act like they wanted to act, and not being hurt physically and mentally for that. So, yes. Absolutely, thank you for that. No more questions for the panel, but if Murad, uh, Camille, if you have anything to add, would appreciate. Um, so d just to echo and piggyback off of this brother's uh, comments on his experience, there's actually specifically two, a couple, a queer couple who was uh, thrown out of the shelter last night. Um, and then there was a rapid response moment where folks from artists, athletes, and activists were trying to, uh, you know, triage the situation, and pretty much we're told they do not meet eligibility. What is the eligibility that they do not meet? We do not know. So we've been asking those questions, and they are. N it's not a unique situation. Sometimes people are placed in temporary shelter, and then for some reason are told that it, these are folks who are like actually recertifying, following in, signing in, being in in time and are still having issues with navigating the shelter system. So I think that there's, uh, yes, there's the, the system is overwhelmed, but there's a way to do this where we're actually treating people with respect, dignity, and giving them the shelter that they need, right? Um, but I do think that there's a, an enormous amount of additional issues that we're, you're going to hear in this hearing um, from other folks who've been supporting that work, um, uh, specifically about the shelter and how people are being treated in it. I'm gonna defer to the other, co my colleagues in, who are gonna be testifying next on legal services. Awesome, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we'll next be calling Joshua Goldfein, Natalia Aristis Bal Betancourt, Yesenia Mata, and Lorena Corsias. I apologize if I butchered anyone's name. And thank you all for bearing with us. We have quite a few uh, witnesses signed up. Joshua, you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I just wanna say again, thank you to the chair and the committee for this hearing. Um, today we got some answers to questions that we've been waiting for for a long time. Um, the uh, concerns about whether the new facilities are compliant with Callahan and other rules around the right to shelter are important, not just because these are technical requirements, but because they are common sense rules that ensure that people are safe and secure. And if, they, if people do not feel safe and secure in these new facilities, they will leave them and all of this effort will have been for naught. So we want to make sure that um, people feel comfortable in the places that we're sending them, and it seems like, at a minimum, the city should be using the standards that already exist um, so that people don't feel like they're getting something less than when they would get in another system. Um, it was also uh, very important to hear the city say that they do not intend to place children in congregate settings and to have them on the record about that. Notably, they did not say they would not do that. They said they did not intend to do that. They don't want to do that. We appreciate that that is um, their view, but of course we have to um, make sure that uh, as this plays out that that, is, that, that, that does not happen. Uh, we have seen time and time again, we have litigated for decades to prevent the harm of children being placed in congregate settings. Um, also wanna thank the committee and the chair for asking the questions about housing subsidies and streamlining the ability of people to move out of the shelter system. Um, we see that the stay of many people at these new sites will be very short. We ex given the relatively low rate of what they call diversion of getting people connected to some other place, uh, it seems like the majority of people will be coming into the shelter system and so the shelter system has to be ready for them, has to add new uh, beds to make room for them if they don't move people out. It might be a lot easier um, to move people out of the existing shelter system into permanent housing, better for everyone, also create new space for the migrants and save the city money. 
Finally, I just wanted to note that the, in the answers to the questions about legal services, that the city pointed to the navigation center as a place where people could obtain an appointment to receive assistance with their asylum application. They're currently scheduling only 25 appointments per day, hoping to ramp up to 100 appointments per day per family. Uh, one family would get one appointment. So if you can do the math there, given the numbers they're talking about, um, it's, it's clear that that will not be sufficient to provide legal services to all the people who need it, especially given the testimony of the previous panels um, about how crucial it is to have a lawyer uh, for your case. So we're setting people up for failure if we don't provide them with that assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Natalia. Uh, Natalia, you can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Time has begun. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Natalia Aristizabal. I'm the Deputy Director of Make Zero New York. I'm going to be summarizing our testimony that we will submit in full. On behalf of our 25,000 members and staff, we thank the, com the committee for the opportunity to testify today. We believe that New York must continue to serve as a welcoming city for immigrants, and that includes ensuring that individuals can access and participate in our society, regardless of immigration status. And to pre prevent further harm to the people who walked miles to get to the city, um, to get to, to the US and then bus to the city, we must develop community-based infrastructures and services that allow them to rebuild their lives here. Over the course of the last two months, um, we started arriving at Port Authority. And then when the new uh, facility was created, we have then shifted there. We have provided MetroCard phones and cash assistance to folks who have recently arrived. Um, and additionally, we have held orientation sessions at our Jackson Heights and Bushwick office um, to make sure that these folks have connections in the city and give them a little bit of like 101 of New York City and services and to feed them and um, help them na navigate their lives. Um, I'm going to be highlighting three main pieces around immigration uh, services, housing, um, and food and transportation. So um, obviously, we're concerned about the ways in which they were brought to New York City. Um, and we, uh, we have concerns for their care and health and personal circumstances. Some of them share that they were offered free rides to New York, even though they had uh, immigration appointments at a places like Utha making matters worse. Many of them were dismayed to hear that they now needed to file motions and other paperwork to transfer their immigration cases to New York to avoid dire legal consequences, such, such as uh, starting deportation proceedings um, or having to face all of this without legal representation. Um, the city decided to incorporate in triage services as part of the, as, at the navigation center that it opened a few weeks ago, but the city must develop a community informed long term plan to ensure that these individuals have legal assistance they desperately need. These individuals need as much information as possible about the immigration proceedings because Texas is not explaining what happens to them and if they and what happens if they fail to attend the hearings or appointments with immigration authorities um, in another state. Likewise, this committee is well aware of how important it is to ensure immigrants do not fall to pray notarios. People have been asking me personally because I've been helping folks, where do they buy a social? because they've been offered or that they don't have the money to buy a social. This is actually a very important piece um, that immigrants need to know that that's not how the process goes. Uh, so this population is particularly vulnerable to unscrupulous practices. Um, and then as the last person just shared, the legal uh, appointments are very little and currently actually today the website was down. So even though we were trying to help people get appointments, um, we weren't able to. The city needs to develop a better long-term plan. First, assessing the navigation center and the city's legal in the city's legal services. Most Time has expired. People have not been able to do appointments on their own, and they have to do it through um, community members. Um, I guess I'm gonna uh, submit this uh, testimony so that folks can see the full part. But we're also very concerned about the housing part. We think that people should be able to um, be able to go right away and be in and qualify for um, permanent housing and not just be held in uh, shelters and then very quickly food is very important a lot of the people that we see on a daily basis um, like today for example we had 40 people at our office while these hearings were happening and they were telling us that that was the first warm meal they were getting in a really long time I'll leave there and submit my full proposal I mean my full testimony Thank you. Next, we will hear from Yesenia Mata. Uh, you can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Time has begun. 
Good afternoon, and thank you to Chairwoman of the Immigration Committee, Councilwoman Hanif, and to your entire team for holding this important hearing. Um, at La Colmena, we are helping asylum seekers from Venezuela and other parts of South America with essential services, and most importantly, a community. Supporting new immigrants with these types of services is not anything new for La Colmena, as NICE has mentioned, as every day we enroll immigrant workers to our construction site safety and OSHA classes, carpentry classes, and provide worker know your rights training for free. These types of services allow new immigrants to join the workforce and feel confident about it, plus provide them with the support they may need if they become victims of wage theft. What is different now, however, is the amount of asylum seekers coming to our center in need of these services. And due to the training that La Colmena staff, staff has, we have been able to respond and keep up. Many come to our center saying, me contaron que aquí pueden ayudar para prepararme a trabajar, meaning I heard this is where I can get help to get prepared for work. Many are traveling from across New York City to Staten Island, and because our center is very accessible as we are near the Staten Island Ferry, it just makes it easier for many to come to Staten Island. Additionally, because we have been at Port Authority and at the Navigation Center, we understand the needs of asylum seekers as we are culturally competent and understand the role that La Colmena plays when it comes to workforce development. Now La Colmena could, and, and to say all of this, La Colmena could not have responded so adequately if it wasn't as well for the amazing organizations that testified here today. It has definitely been a team effort as we all provide unique services and resources. As La Colmena, we remain committed to supporting all workers, regardless of their immigration status, to ensure they can join the workforce with dignity and respect. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't have any questions for this panel. Thank you. Um, we will now be calling the, oh, sorry, yes. Um, yes, we will call uh, Lorena, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for um, this opportunity um, for listening to me. I'm actually Viani Romero, Director of Programs at Mesteca. Um, on behalf of Lorena Cruz, I will be um, presenting and testifying today. I'm here to speak on the importance of providing services with dignity and compassion and love to new asylum seekers and migrants. As an immigrant myself, I know the challenges for handling of navigating many systems newly arrived to the United States. I arrived at the United States at the age of three. Push factors forced my parents and I to leave our country, and my well-being and safety were the number one priority. I am glad and proud of being part of Mixteca and working alongside with many colleagues as my colleague from La Colmena has mentioned, it has truly been a team effort to work together and provide services to many new asylum seekers and migrants. At Mixteca, we provide resources and services with dignity and empathy and heart. We have been present at Port 30 and welcome new asylum seekers and migrants. And I will never forget that the first family I helped was a mom with her three-year-old son. It reminded me of when I first arrived with my mom at the age of three and how I wished that someone had been there for my mom and myself, provided me with support and validating us as humans rather than a number and a burden to society. I'm beyond proud of being part of this team who we provide currently with direct services from emergency need of food to navigating school systems and workforce development like OSHA training, ESL classes, and skill building, serving three family shelters in our area. We're the only Latinx organization in the area. At Mixteca, we feel, we listen, and we connect. We provide with dignity and we love to resources to not just the new asylum seekers and migrants, but to our community members that are still struggling and surviving after the effects of COVID-19. Mixteca is a home away from home to many. And this, um, this crisis has been a struggle for all of us, for many nonprofit organizations that with little to men, um, no resources at all have been a struggle for us to provide 
to our, our services to our community members and new community members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. No questions for this panel. Thank you so much. Next, we'll be calling Jody Zeismer, followed by Rex Chen, then Ligia Gual Gualpa, and C. Mario Russell, I believe, with Deborah Presti. If you're in person, you can come up to the dais. Uh, Jody, you can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Great, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Jody Ziesmer. I'm the director of the Immigrant Protection Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Program. And I just wanna give a little bit of context before we start with talking about legal services and the need there. The, the current crisis really stems from federal policies that have closed our border to most asylum seekers over the past three years while failing to put in place strategies or resources to safely, effectively, and humanely anticipate the influx of, of vulnerable migrants who cannot be subjected to rapid expulsion. So this has created a lot of confusion and chaos at the border and really inconsistent treatment of asylum-seeking families. Um, because this population has no set destination or addresses when they arrive in the U.S., um, ICE and CBP does not know where to file court documents, they have no addresses where to send follow-up paperwork, and they cannot effectively direct people to the resources they will need to navigate the removal process. Instead of confronting these barriers, ICE and CBP have employed a variety of deceitful and legally pre prejudicial policies, such as fabricating addresses on charging documents, sending cases to far-flung jurisdictions, and supplying nonsensical or contradictory information and instructions. Funneling people to a, large, to a small handful of sanctuary cities has also, also overburdened the systems in those cities, such as New York. Our ICE enforcement and removal office, for example, ha, is overwhelmed and people cannot even get access to the building, let alone the office where they're located to attend appointments. Um, I also just mentioned that the federal government has elected to surveil and monitor these migrants, often putting them on um, ankle monitors, on phone surveillance, GPS systems, and other enforcement mechanisms, and has subjected all of them to removal proceedings instead of other options that they have at their discretion, such as parole, which they have employed for Afghans and Ukrainians and other vulnerable populations. The legal need really is twofold and must be addressed with two distinct programs and funding structures. The first is the need for information, individual engagement to provide guidance on the posture and next steps of the immigration process, and assistance in changing address and venues to New York City. Because of the deep confusion and inconsistencies and the nuances in individual cases, group orientations and general information packets are insufficient to address this need. Migrants want and need individual guidance and counsel on their options, next, step, next steps, and process. Although this information giving should be overseen by legal employees, lawyers should not be the primary on-the-ground staff for this element of the response. The need is too great and too broad for staff line attorneys and nonprofit legal services organizations to cover, and it is not an effective use of the limited human resources in our city. Time expired. Okay, it is burnout work for attorneys. NILAC has been at these centers and it is trying to give a stream of triage information um, without any ability to take on cases or actually provide representation is not sustainable. And I'll also just mention, because this was talked about before, we are not assisting people actually applying for asylum or even beginning this process. We are basically giving basic triage information and that needs to be, um, there needs to be more resources put in for actual representation. Thank you. Next, we will call on Rex Chen. You can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Starting time. Hello, um, my name is Rex Chen. I'm the Immigration Director at Legal Services NYC. Our nonprofit provides free immigration legal services. I'm just gonna make a few points. Uh, one is that as Jody was pointing out, uh, you know, counting how many asylum seekers get some level of legal assistance can be a limited measure. 
because having to get a little bit of help one day at a navigation center is very different from getting support for preparing their asylum claim and having a lawyer in court to win asylum. Uh, very different. Uh, another thing I want to emphasize is uh, we've seen that with many traumatized asylum seekers, uh, social worker support is extremely important in preparing a case. Uh, they've received trauma from what they're fleeing from, trauma from the travel to the U.S., and also trauma from mistreatment by the U.S. government and also by some uh, states of the U.S. Uh, at the border and afterwards. And, uh, and Jody uh, touched on how the work at the navigation centers is high risk of burnout. I just want to point out that uh, th just even the, the later phases of the case and lawyers representing people seeking asylum is also an area where there have been a lot more studies in the last few years of the large amount of burnout and trauma for those representing asylum seekers all the way through to immigration court. And we've seen that it is actually difficult for us to retain staff in a healthy manner and also to uh, recruit and hire new staff. So that's important to understand in the context of uh, if we could just find the money, can we just put it out there and there may be so many people so eager, we can just hire a ton of people that actually might be uh, much more challenging than it might seem on paper. Uh, and then uh, my last point I'll just uh, uh, highlight is uh, just to give a feel for some things that are a bit unexpected about what it is to work on uh, an asylum case uh, these days in the uh, dysfunctional immigration court system. Uh, one is that cases take much longer than people would expect to complete. There's a very large existing immigration court backlog before the recent uh, arrivals of asylum seekers. And as Jody was referring to, even just other parts of the process, checking in with the deportation officers has a huge, massive backlog. And so there's even going to be a large backlog even to start the immigration court case for many of these asylum seekers. It could take four years or more to resolve these cases. So it's, it's quite a commitment and an important commitment to take on these cases. And as Jody touched on, these cases are harder to win than you might expect. With the government writing bogus addresses of asylum seekers that are supposed residences, they're tricking the court to think that the notices they're mailing out are actually going to get to these asylum seekers. These add extra obstacles that you might not expect for these asylum cases. Thank you very much for holding this hearing today. Thank, thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to the people who are in person. It doesn't look like Ligia is here. Um, Mario, would you like to go ahead? Sure, absolutely. So good afternoon or good evening. It, I notice it's 10 after 5, so I'll, 10 minutes beyond your scheduled time, I suppose, but I'll do my best to, to not add too many more minutes to your afternoon. Uh, Chairwoman Hanif, nice to, nice to see you, and thank you for hosting this meeting. Um, I am the Director of Immigrant Refugee Services with Catholic Charities, and with me here is Deborah Presti, who is our Senior Director of Case Management with Catholic Charities. Um, in late April and, and May of 2022, recently arriving asylum seekers from the southern border began to arrive at our administrative offices on First Avenue, where our executive management, human resources, and other fiscal functions are located. Many of those asylum seekers then arrived, as we see now still, disoriented, confused, and really effectively stripped of all of their personal belongings, holding nothing really but an immigration document that was often fraudulently and improperly issued, as you've heard. Um, beginning at just a few individuals over the months, that number came to about 200 a week, um, seeking assistance of all kinds, and which we provided in that time on First Avenue in the front line, food, basic needs supplies, legal screening, of course, at least in a moment to triage what were the cases that needed particular attention. Um, at our administrative offices alone, and prior to our work at the Navigation Center, we saw over that period of time about 2,000 individuals. And since the Navigation Center has opened its doors, basically, I'm giving you data that's about four weeks worth since the end of August, that number has risen to about 3,000, with two-thirds of the population being adults and the remainder of children. As the arrival of buses, which we, of course, are so deeply and concernedly aware of, we have choices to make. Um, how will we welcome, how will we support those who come to us from afar, seeking a home and protection? And I would say this simply, yes, we've done a job of standing up some services and we've begun it, I think, in earnest and as well as we can. 
We've heard, of course, many contours and shadows in that process, but we need to do more, and I think we need to do it, we need to do it with a long-term perspective. We are really on the cusp at some level, I think, of a change over time in how immigration and refugee policy will be administered, and whether we've seen this through Syrian, ex the experience with Syrian refugees, Afghan refugees, uh, the Ukrainian parolees, unaccompanied children, right? We've seen all modes in which America receives those in need of protection and safety. And now, from the South, um, the welcome and resettlement is a 50-state issue. It's as much about the interior as it is about the border. It's as much about New York City as it is about El Paso. And I think we need to bend our imagination deeply and urgently in that way and think in the long term. Um, to talk about just some needs or some migrants or some issues is not enough. We've been doing this work in partnership and we are very grateful to the city for the work we've done with them and the council as well too, but I think it's time to step up our game and our response. And I just wanna say four things that are specific to today's conversation and to what I think we need to do in order to move this forward better. Specifically, the Navigation Center in terms of legal support on the legal side, the current RFP that we did not submit a proposal for is deficient and it needs to be rethought. We need to divide it into two sections. One is group orientations, group know your rights informational sessions and section, and then a separate multi-year baseline legal representation program. Clearly, as you've mentioned yourself, Chairwoman, the case rate is unacceptable and the math does not work. This RFP is a bandage, band-aid proposal. I'm almost done. Workforce development, if we think and are serious about welcoming refugees to our, to our, to our city, then we have to enhance our OSHA safety, site safety training. We have to think about creative ways in which we can, in fact, plug so many talent people, talented people into perhaps, yes, day economy, day gigs. We see this at our day labor centers, but we can do more there. At our navigation center, critical, and I think Deborah can speak to this, the need for clothing, access to essential products, and of course, transportation. And then finally, I would say this, we need your help in advocacy. I think the broader question about how can people work when they're here is key to this whole equation. And I think if we push and make a case for well-articulated policies around humanitarian parole that become a predicate for employment, then maybe we can start to think something differently going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. So a question I have is just so folks who are still watching and we have this on the record, I mean, we've talked a lot about the asylum process being one that is a tedious one. It is a multi-year wait. Um, can Jody, Rex, and Mario, either one of you or you can chime in, describe what the asylum process is like right now? I'm happy to, to take that on. I think part of the issue is that this process is not functioning the way even that it is set up to function because of the confusion at the border. Um, and so, you know, in an, in an ideal situation, somebody comes in, they're issued a charging document that is filed in court. They have a hearing in which they can file an application for asylum as a defense from deportation um, and then have a trial where they present evidence and have to bear the burden to show their eligibility for this type of relief. The problem right now, you know, so that in and of itself is a burdensome and cumbersome process that, as many of my colleagues have mentioned, really requires a lawyer in order to successfully navigate. The problem right now is that even that process is getting delayed, is getting off track because of the confusion at the border, because of the overwhelming numbers, and because this administration, this federal administration has elected to place everyone in an overburdened court system. And so people are not even being given their charging documents, are not being given court appointments in a consistent manner, and are not even having a forum in which to file their asylum application. 
And then what are the conditions for de denying asylum? Like, could it be possible that any, everybody who's arrived uh, um, from Venezuela applies for asylum, gets rejected? Well, that, so asylum is often very political in terms of how we adjudicate cases. I think our main concern, and this is not ineligibility, if somebody actually goes through a trial and is able to fully present their claim, but that there's so many administrative missteps that can cause somebody to get an order of deportation without the opportunity to actually present and fully have their asylum application heard. And what that are, is like what are those conditions? Reason. Like what, what could be? So if somebody fails to receive a hearing notice because the immigration at the border has made up an address for them or is sending their notices to the Catholic Charities administrative offices or because they have their case filed in Utah, even though they're being put on a bus to New York City, if they miss that court hearing, they will be ordered removed in absentia without the opportunity to apply for asylum. If they don't file their application for asylum within one year of their arrival in the United States, that can be a barrier for them receiving relief. And then there's a number of other concerns. So would you say that it poses an issue that um, the folks who are gonna live or stay at a HERC or are currently staying at a shelter um, could potentially miss mail coming to them about their case? Yeah, that's a, that is a concern that we have. So we've been, I like has been at the Navigation Center along with Catholic Charities and other service providers. We are providing changes of address to notify courts for people who actually have their cases already filed in court of where they can receive mail. But of course, in the shelter system, it is, I think, both difficult to receive mail in a shelter, but also the movement of people between shelters um, and the, the obligation to update the court after every single move and then to receive mail um, can be uh, can definitely cause people to miss their hearings to miss mailings um, and to cause the, the like I was talking about this the um, really to delay to derail the whole process for their asylum case thank you if, did you want to add if on? I could yeah go add, for it. add a little um, I agree with Jody. Another way you can use lose your asylum case is you don't follow the specific strange instructions only in English to prepare for the hearing, such as mailing certain pages of your asylum applications to the Nebraska Service Center. Uh, I, I know you're not following me. It's right. It's a very weird process. Also, critical is having evidence to support your case. And if the border officials threw your stuff out, when you the U.S. officials threw it out when you came through the border, or you lose it in the course of being moved around to different shelters, your case is going to be in much harder shape. And then another issue uh, that people have written about refugee roulette is that traumatized asylum seekers often will uh, say slightly inconsistent things. And that the danger there is judges who are and you know very much against these immigrants have the discretion to say, I just don't find this person believable. And there's so much discretion because no traumatized person can tell their story perfectly every single time they have to tell it. Uh, so there are a lot of ways that people can lose their cases. Thank you. Did you have a final comment? Yeah, I wanted to add that I think, you know, there's a, also the arc of the case. And I think if we think that a person who is navigating this time period is unemployed, then that is a further shackling and a binding of them to really no way to move forward. And frankly, if a person were to come in to my office today, let's say, it probably wouldn't be for another six months that they can actually get a lawyer, and I'm saying this somewhat conservatively. After that, probably three to six months before they can actually file an application for asylum. After that, it's 150 days before they can submit a work a work authorization request. And then after that, it's about eight and a half to 12 months before they actually get the card. So when you add all that up, you're looking at two to two and a half years before a person can actually, from today, can actually legally work. That in itself, existentially, I think, you know, adds to all of these problems and these conditions. Yeah, thank you for uh, elaborating. That is very, very helpful to know, and I'll definitely be reaching out individually to just get a better understanding on 
the legal ramifications here and um, just how critical it is for us to have funding allocated that really meets the need of every single case. No more questions for this panel. Thank you. Next, we will be calling uh, Ilze Carolyn Thielman, followed by Judith Goldner, Vianney Romero Mendez, and Sia Hegde. You can go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ilza Thielman. I am the director of Team TLC NYC. You've heard quite a bit about um, our activities at the uh, Port Authority today, and I'm glad to finally be able to give our perspective on what has been going on down there. Um, we have been uh, the only uh, nonprofit at Port Authority, along with one other group, for the last several weeks. A lot of uh, organizations have testified here that they have been at Port Authority, and that's true, but they have been for a few weeks at a time. Uh, we have been there since day one, since before the city was there, since before the city ever took a part in uh, greeting and helping these migrants. Team TLC was on the ground. Um, and then the city has been playing catch up ever since, to be honest with you. Um, my partners at, at Port Authority who have been there day in, day out, we are literally there seven days a week, and I try to be there six days a week, but uh, my partners are there seven days a week. I personally, Team TLC is always there. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier, artists, athletes, activists, uh, Power Malu is the, um, the individual who's there literally every single day. I don't know how he does it. And Adama Ba, who's also been mentioned here, she is um, a, a, an equal partner among Team TLC uh, athletes, artists, athletes, activists, and Team TLC. She is a powerhouse, uh, she, and hopefully she'll be able to come here and testify today. The, these three partners um, are the ones who are every day down there uh, greeting, feeding, clothing, assisting these people, rest assured that every single person who has been reticketed to another city was reticketed by Team TLC, okay? Team TLC NYC is the one who is sending these people to meet with their families, whether it be by an Uber, whether it be by a bus, a train, a plane. We are the ones who are reuniting those families through that transport. Um, the city has, you know, testified earlier today, oh, people are getting transported from the, uh, wel from the Welcome Center at, at Port Authority. They're being transported by me, sometimes literally by me, because we have no funding. We have zero funding from the city, from the state, from the feds, from anybody. We are getting uh, grants that are being given to us by other charitable organizations. And we are bearing the burden of relocating these people to be with their families. Um, it's interesting because there was also a mention of the uh, DHS program to relocate people when they want to be in, uh, you know, need to be in other cities to be with their families. And that system does not work. I don't know of anybody who has gone to DHS, a DHS shelter, and has been relocated. In fact, uh, two days ago, I got a text from a city employee saying the, the uh, Queensboro president uh, has a family that is in a shelter in Queens, and they would love for you to help them get to Chicago. This actually happened. I said, how can they even ask that when I've been begging for funding? And the Queensboro president's office asked me to send these people to Chicago. And I said, you know what? That's what we do. Please come down. And I said to the representative of the Queensboro president's office, I don't know how how the office has the, like, the audacity to do this. However, and then the person said, we have no funding. And I said, I have no funding. Team TLC has no funding. We are deeply, deeply in the red. We have about, I wrote it down, I just checked my, my bank balance, $1,642.72 in the bank at the moment. And every last penny of that, plus about 20 grand is owed to me to my volunteers, to other people who have helped out. So we are deeply in the red. And yet, 
city city organization, city city you know, the, the the Queensboro president is asking me to send these people to Chicago, which I did, and it went on my Amex, my personal Amex. So what we really need, obviously, to be able to keep doing this is funding. We need funding. And the city has not stepped up in any way, shape, or form. The city has not bought a donut at the Port Authority for these people. The city has not put, put, a, put a person in a cab and paid for it, okay? My organization is doing all of that. Uh, athletes, artists, athletes, activists are, do, are, do, are doing the legwork and making sure these people are getting into the shelters and doing the, the, the troubleshooting after the people are in the shelters and get kicked out in the middle of the night. Adam Abba is on the phone all day. I don't know when she sleeps. She's on the phone all day, every day, running around trying to help people who have been kicked out of this broken, broken shelter system. And she will hopefully be here soon to testify as to how broken that system is. But I, would, I just want to address some things. That's kind of what I prepared to say, but I wanted to address some of the things that were said here earlier by the administration. The administration says that the reason why they're opening this tent camp is because they, they, they need the time to be able to triage these people and, this, and the, the work that is being done at the Port Authority, it's just not working. It's not the right place for it. Well, that's ironic because when we are at the Port Authority doing this work, the only reason why we ever have any problems with getting the work done is A, the funding, and of course, we just go into our own pockets to, to address that problem, and B, that we are being rushed by city employees to wrap it up and get these people out of here. We, I was told today that if, if somebody is going to be picked up by their family member, they have one hour, one hour, for that family member to get there and pick them up and get them out of there. Because why? I still don't understand why. We are told, you heard a bunch of times today, we have 45 minutes to an hour to triage these people and do what needs to be done. There is no such time limit. The Port Authority is not putting a time limit on the time we spend with these people. The city is doing that. Every day, I am pulling people off lines that are being taken out to be put, brought to the shelter, people whose family members are on their way, people who I'm trying to send to, you know, to, to Chicago, people I am trying to triage because they are in the LGBTQ community and should not be put in the, to the general population. I have to go and like physically pull people off the line because the city members, the city employees are trying to just get them out the door in that 45 minutes to one hour time period. So when the city says, oh, it's not working at Port Authority and we need to have, you know, 96 hours to figure out what happens with these people, it makes me want to either laugh or throw up because they're the ones who are putting time limits on what we do at the Port Authority. And if they gave us the funding and the space to, the, uh, space and time, I don't mean space physical, but the, the just get out of our way, stop trying to interfere. And the time to do it it would be a lot more successful, and it has been very successful. We have reunited many, many, many families physically at the Port Authority, despite the city's best efforts to get us the hell out of there when, when we're trying to get people there to re be reunited. We've sent them to other cities. Many, many, I don't even have the numbers, but, but yesterday, I think there was 25 families were reunited. We they're at Port Authority. We have sent people, every day we're sending you know, 20 people to other cities to be reunited with their families. And I don't understand the imperative that the city seems to feel to get these people rushed off to the shelter when all we're hearing today is how overburdened the shelter system is. Why would we send people to the shelter when they have family they can be with? Why would we not, why is the city not paying the $135 it takes to get somebody on a bus to Chicago when they, and choosing instead to have them placed in a shelter where they're paying $135 a day to keep them there. Why are they sending people to different shelters, family members to different shelters, so that you can spend $135 a day here and $135 a day there, instead of putting the families together in a family shelter where it costs $190 a day to keep the family together? So I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed at the logic behind we're going to separate families, we're going to put them in this, this absurd tent camp, and that's supposed to be a solution. It, it, that's not the solution. We have come up with a solution. We just need the city to support the solution that we have and to provide the funding, to provide the assistance, to stop interfering, and to get out of the way. Thank you. 
Hi, good evening, Chair Hanif, uh, staff, members of the council who've supported this very, very important hearing today. Um, my name is Sia Hegde. I'm here as Housing Policy Counsel to the Bronx Defenders. Uh, we are a holistic legal uh, public defender organization that serves over 20,000 clients across the Bronx um, in various uh, legal system contacts. And, um, you know, I'm here to speak from an intersectional frame. Uh, the political weaponization of newly arrived asylum seekers in our city is not an indictment of our system, is not only an indictment of our system of immigration and social services, but it is a multi system failure of government at every level. The right to shelter in New York City continues to be under assault. Since the courts articulated it in the 1979 Callahan decision, successive mayoral administrations and city councils have created all kinds of costly and easily exploitable systems of temporary shelter that do not provide homeless individuals and families with meaningful, safe, affordable housing solutions. The result is a city with over 60,000 New Yorkers who sleep in temporary shelters, including over 15,000 children, a city with nearly 43,000 vacant housing units across all its five boroughs. And while laws and policies have been passed with the intent to make this human warehousing system humane, there are countless stories that we can add to what has already been said about how basic rights to food, water, linguistic and transportation services, and public assistance never materialize. Sadly, this result is not unexpected. The people who need housing and care the most, including newly arrived migrants, belong to a disproportionate demographic of black and brown families with children. Not only do they continue to suffer the harms of heightened xenophobia and racial biases in the wake of this humanitarian crisis, but through government intervention and neglect, they are over-surveilled, policed, and caged as political pawns. As just one example, city officials, as we've heard, are in the process of turning a Bronx parking lot into a temporary encampment zone, and there is clearly no plan in place as to where the thousand or so estimated migrants will be permanently housed. We are troubled by reports of proposals to increase the NYPD presence in the area as a response to the creation of an encampment, and this is in a community that's already faced severe divestment of resources. Um, this type of temporary human warehousing must be abolished as it does not meet any common sense definition of a right to shelter. We ask that the council find the courage to do something truly transformational rather than spend money criminalizing poverty. In the short term, it must use every means it has to turn vacant units into housing for asylum seekers and homeless New Yorkers. And in the long term, it must use its budgetary and legal powers to create a real capital plan for building safe, affordable, permanent, and dignified housing for all. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much, and I really do wish that the administration was here to I listen too. to you. Um, but this is all recorded, so we will make sure that they receive this. Um, Ilzi, could you speak uh, more about just like the financial, like how much money has gone into uh, reticketing? I would say at this point it's approximately eighty to eighty-five thousand um, dollars. I mean, and that also includes. Ubers to get people to where they're to where they're going here in the city or or you know over the you know New Jersey border or something like that. But yeah, it's it's been a lot of money. I haven't had the time to <laughs> to gather up my receipts and 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 give a, a final total. But the sixty thousand dollars that was quoted earlier uh, was just through you know the beginning of the beginning of September or the end of August. So this you know we're we're much further along now and the, the money is going out much more quickly than it's coming in. So, reticketing. This refers to like plane fare, um, train, Uber. Yeah, I mean reticketing. We generally call uh, plane, train, and bus. Um, but you know, I'm saying we have spent you know more than that. Just that that segment um, of getting someone to a different city. We've actually also spent additional dollars on um, on Ubers and, and taxis and things like that. And then I know you've made appeals and have asked for funding mm -hmm. from uh, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Could you share what those conversations have, have looked like? 
Um, generally, what we're told is, yes, we know, it's, you know, you, you, you absolutely deserve it, you absolutely deserve to have some money, we're, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're going to connect you with people, etc. Um, what the, the, the main response that has actually borne any fruit is that um, uh, some people from Moya have connected me with the United Way. Uh, which of course is not a city uh, agency. So I have recently been awarded a grant from uh, United Way. I don't even know how much that is, um, but uh, that's you know hopefully going to get us through a couple more weeks. And we have also received a grant from uh, Save the Children, another nonprofit, obviously. So you know we've been talking to Moya for nine weeks about you know needing some funding, and basically what we're told is you know we'll we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure it out you have to be a contractor you have to you know you have to uh, submit for an RFP and so of course we're competing with you know organizations like Catholic Charities and the Red Cross who are uh, huge and well already well funded um, and are able to speak up front a certain amount of money to for example open up this navigation center um, and so they were granted millions of dollars to do this. They were also given millions of dollars to provide legal services. Um, and yet, we have people who we have seen at Port Authority who then go to the navigation center, are given a slip of paper that says come back in 10 days or 13 days or whatever, and they come back and, are, and tell us that they have been told at the navigation center, you know, if you go back to Port Authority, they'll help you over there. So this multi-million dollar center that is being funded with taxpayer money is sending people back to little old Team TLC and artist athletes, activists, and Adam Abba, who finally, I'm so glad that you guys finally just arrived because you have to hear from these incredible individuals. But we are being burdened even after Catholic Charities and the Red Cross is, is given all this money to open this, this navigation center, they come back to us and they seek more help. And guess what? We give it to them. We always give it to them. And not only are we ready, willing, and able to give it to them, we are oftentimes in conflict with the city employees at Port Authority because we wish to give them this assistance. We are told, listen, these, you can't keep having these people come back. It's not like we're inviting them back. They're coming back because they know this is the one place or one of the few places that they can come back and actually get assistance. So then they, the, the, the city employees are telling us, you're messing with our numbers, you know, that we can't, this is just gonna delay things further. And we're, we say, what are we here for? We're here to help asylum seekers. We're going to help asylum seekers. And you can work with us or you can work against us, but we're gonna do it with or without your help. So that is the, what we have been up against. <laughs> for weeks, for weeks, and, and, the, and the, 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 the audacity for people to ask us for more help or to try to stand in the way of our helping these asylum seekers who are seeking that help or to try to rush us out the door and get these people to, to shelters when they should be with their families. It's, and then to sit here, to have the city, the, the mayor's office sit here and talk about all these incredible things that they're doing for asylum seekers and I'm shaking my head the entire time because they're not doing it. They're not providing these services. They're certainly not providing them at Port Authority. They've left us behind at Port Authority. And this navigation center is really, you know, you have to win lotto to get any assistance there because you, you have to get an appointment. You can't get an appointment online. You show up, you get sent away, and there's no help for these people. They go there and they say, I need legal help. I have an ICE check-in coming up. I have an as asylum appearance that's coming up. I need legal help. And they're told, come back in 10 days when their ICE check-in is in three days. So they come back to us, and with no funding and with the city trying to stop us from helping these people, we're facing an uphill battle. If the city would just give us the funding and give us the assistance and give us the, the, the kind that, you know, we need people who care about these people who are not seeing them as a, as a problem to be shunted off to the shelters. You know, we are dealing with people who really just seem to be interested in one thing and one thing only is just getting them out of the way as soon as possible. And that's not what we do. And we're not going to allow the city to stand in the way of our doing what we do. But it'd be really nice if they would stop trying to stand in our way. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we will be calling Ann Pillsbury, followed by Patrick Boyle, Terry Lawson, and Juan Diaz. And you can go ahead when the sergeant's Starting time. 
Hi, um, thanks for inviting this, all of us to this hearing. I've been helping this Central American Legal Assistance. We've been helping Central American asylum seekers for about 30 years. And even though there are a lot of defects in the city's response, I have to say that all of our clients that came across the border probably spent their first few nights in the city sleeping on the trains. So it's nice to see everybody working together, trying to come up with a solution to help this artificially created surge in people. But most of us have been working with this same population for, for many, many years. And there's we've got to all take a deep breath and step back and try to understand the process a little better. Um, I appreciate the fact everyone's been referring to everybody as an asylum seeker. The, the sad fact is that it's a mixed population. Some of them are what the law recognizes as legitimate asylum seekers and may have a chance at winning their cases. The majority probably aren't. And so it's a the real tough problem here is trying to figure out who has a shot at asylum and who doesn't. There are a lot of legitimate reasons people leave their home countries from a human standpoint, and it's right that we should try to welcome them here as neighbors. But in terms of deploying legal services, we have to focus on people that under our narrow statutes have a shot at asylum. And that's probably only about 20% of the people that we have had landed on our doorstep. So how we identify them and then how we help them is really tricky because we, those of us that do free legal services are already swamped helping this same population. You know, the Central Americans, the Venezuelans, the Nicaraguans um, are mostly the people that we see. Now, you know, it's statutory. It's not a matter of will, but you cannot get work authorization when you're newly arrived. You cannot get work authorization unless and until you apply for asylum. And that, of course, invites an, a perverse incentive to apply for asylum, even if you're not eligible. Most of the legal service providers won't do that. We want to make sure it's a legitimate case before we apply. But they're still going to wait, as, as uh, Mario Russell pointed out, many, many months before they're going to have work authorization. So that's just a non-starter. And there's that's statutory, and we can't change that. The one-year filing deadline is statutory, and we can't change that. So at least unless we get control of Congress and, you know, life gets much, much better. But we have to work with the, with the reality that we're Time against, expired. which is that we can't represent everybody. And the RFP the city put out was ill-conceived. Thank you so much. Could you it. wrap up? Yeah. So we need to work more closely together with the mayor's office to come up with a realistic way to provide legal services. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to call Patrick Boyle. You can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Thank you to the chairs and to the members of this committee. My name is Patrick Boyle. I'm an assistant vice president of public policy with Volunteers of America. Uh, we're a a nonprofit dedicated to ending homelessness in the New York region by 2050. Um, and we uh, run four family shelters, uh, an intake assessment shelter, a uh, number of DV shelters, um, and other transitional housing where beginning over the summer, we started to see a large uh, number of asylum seeking and migrant families coming to our shelters in need of services. Um, and uh, we immediately got to work on these folks and we are uh, proud to and honored to be serving them, many of whom have come from unspeakably difficult uh, circumstances and a really arduous journey to get here. Uh, so we thank the council's attention to this issue. Uh, we also want to just, uh, you know, give a thanks and uh, some attention to the DHS team who's been working under incredibly difficult circumstances. So we do we do want to acknowledge our, our government partners in this, as, as well as the council. Uh, for all the attention that you're bringing to this and, and to the individual council members who have been very helpful to us um, where we have had uh, sites and a lot of these folks coming through in their districts. Um, you know, I don't really have anything beyond what you've heard today, but I just want to uh, acknowledge and uh, sort of uh, second a lot of what has been said in terms of the need 
we have immediate uh, needs for essential items, um, toiletries, culturally appropriate foods, um, kitchenware, uh, things, clothing. Um, a lot of these people have come here with, with just the clothes on their backs. Um, so we look forward to a coordinated effort uh, by the city to really link donations and philanthropic efforts with nonprofit providers like us. We really need that that ramped up and we need it very quickly. Um, of course, longer term, we're going to have a need for um, a greatly bolstered legal services uh, infrastructure to meet the needs of these of these families who are here applying for this. Um, you know, everyone we're trying to partner with right now, as, as you've heard time and again, is very, very oversubscribed and, and under, under capacity for that. Um, we also uh, stand ready to work with the federal government, our congressional representatives on anything that we can be advocating for from a federal perspective, whether it's funding or whether it's policy changes to help process folks, whatever is needed from the advocate community to really uh, push for, uh, please use us and, and other nonprofit partners like us to, to help advocate. We're going to need a, a major response to this as a humanitarian crisis. And, um, you know, we know it's going to take some federal help. Um, so again, everything I've said, you've heard from many other speakers today. I just want to say that, you know, it is our mission and our honor to serve these people. It's been challenging for us as a provider and certainly for the city. Um, Time expired. We look forward to partnering with everybody to, uh, to make it a positive, a positive end for these families. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Juan Diaz. You can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. Starting time. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Chair Haniv and City Council Immigration Committee for holding today's hearing. My name is Juan Diaz and I am a policy and advocacy associate, a citizens committee for children, a multi-issue children's advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Over 3,000 asylum seeking children and their families have recently arrived in New York City, seeking safety and an opportunity to have a better life. The city's housing crisis, lack of shelter capacity, and fiscal constraints have further exacerbated their struggle. We applaud the city's efforts to establish a migrant navigation center and to partner with community-based organizations to open more. However, so much more must be done to adequately address the urgent needs of asylum-seeking families. As we all know, families are struggling in DHS shelters due to lack of Spanish language access, the school supplies for their children, clothing, cash, aid, and legal assistance, just to name a few fundamental resource barriers. Earlier this week, it was brought to CCC's attention that over 80 ch migrant children residing in a DHS shelter were added to a District 10 Bronx Elementary School. These children lacked essential school supplies and clothes. Teachers and schools officials generously purchased a few essential items, and community-based organizations like the New York Immigration Coalition stepped in, stepped in to help. However, community-based organizations have limited resources and need the city's help. It is critical that the city develops a robust and coordinated approach to, pro to the provision of emergency support services for these migrant families. The city must fund and provide essential items such as clothes, toiletries, cash assistance, and transportation assistance. Ensure that all contracted programs have access to transportation services, both written and verbal. As many partners have said, the city needs to fund legal assistance for these migrant families as the um, immigration system is very difficult and complex. Additionally, intercity communication must be improved to connect migrant families with services and social, su and social supports. And for as the long-term solution to improve the well-being of migrant families, the city FEBS voucher eligibility should be expanded to include undocumented households. This city must also proceed with the hiring of shelter-based community coordinators as create critical liaisons between families, shelters, and school personnel for all homeless families. Additionally, the city must, in, must fund and staff in, in need more staff is needed for city social services in all areas of the city government. To this end, the 90-day rule of shelter stay prior to city felt eligibility must end in order to move families from shelter to permanently housing quickly. As a formerly undocumented from Ecuador, a documented immigrant from Ecuador who arrived at the age of 12 to New York City, I understand the struggles to assimilate to a new culture and time life. expired. However, I had the, the the assistance of family and 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 
social networks. Thank you so much. I look forward to submitting a written testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair, do you have anything? No questions. Thank you. We'll move on to the next panel. We'll call Peter Malvin, Ariadna Phillips, Adama Ba, and Power Malu. Okay, Ariadna Phillips, South Bronx Mutual Aid, part of the Mutual Aid Collective. The Mutual Aid Collective, which includes many mutual aids, allies, faith communities, and autonomous activists working alongside arriving migrants, has been handling ongoing care and support for thousands of asylum-seeking migrants since early August, every day. We've spent tens of thousands in crowd funds on food, phones, migrant transportation, medical care access, medication, essential supplies, home goods, clothing, supply transport, 24-hour rapid response for those left unsheltered by the city, legal and court services, workforce preparation, support for queer refugees, family reunification travel, and sanctuaries across the city, as well as respite sites. This does not account for the endless translation work and thousands of hours of unpaid general labor. We have done this completely outside the scope of government and affiliated nonprofits as unpaid organizers in coalition with arriving asylum seekers. We do not, on principle, partner with racist and harmful entities. Before asylum seekers arrive in New York, most have their identity documents taken from them at the border by immigration officials. Many are forcibly separated from their families without phones to even know where they are. Migrant families and individuals have been consistently abandoned to our care outside of Port Authority and outside shelter intake. This includes emergency medical transport upon their arrival, which we coordinate and do accompaniment to city hospitals, as many who are arriving are injured and ill from Texas detention encampment centers, which, according to migrants, the new Orchard Beach encampment closely resembles. We tirelessly pick up asylum seekers that have not known where to go, and we're left on the street walking to addresses printed on immigration document, churches and shelters that have no idea who they are. Dozens of migrants have attempted to talk from city airports in areas like Newark, LaGuardia, JFK, and White Plains, who we find and escort to safe shelter. It is through this organizing we've realized the depth and breadth of shelter abuse and general negligence to all unhoused New Yorkers. Belongings are constantly stolen or repossessed by shelter staff, including, in some cases, immigration paperwork. Queer asylum seekers are often assaulted and now within our sanctuaries. We've heard from hundreds of migrants that they prefer to sleep on the street than the shelter because of the danger. Despite the omnipresence of DHS police, migrants trying to report abuse in shelters are told simply to vacate the shelter. Migrants have been beaten and tased by large groups of shelter police and NYPD in retaliation for speaking out. Families, including mothers, have been explicitly threatened by shelter officials for reporting ongoing trafficking and other corruption that occurs with simply the blessing of certain shelter officials. When we speak to recently arriving migrants outside Port Authority, in some cases they're only given information on how to get to a shelter. They did not get to the multi-million dollar navigation center. According to an arriving migrant, it felt like the city shook his hand, took his photo, and he was led through the back. The navigation center is of little use to migrants if they can't get there and they don't know it exists. There's over a month wait for appointment and only 25 people can be seen a day. Countless others walking for hours to assign shelters are often sent again and again to different locations, told there are no beds available, and they walk, across, they walk back across boroughs. They sleep on floors and waiting rooms from early morning until late at night. The food they receive in the shelters is frozen. At PATH shelter intake, they are bussed in the middle of the night, told to walk across boroughs with their children without support, and made to leave again at 7 in the morning, only to spend the whole day and evening sent back to PATH again, over and over, pregnant women and children. We testify here today to give you a sense of the gaps and, frankly, abuses in shelter, food, safety, and dignity that thousands of asylum seekers have faced upon arrival in our city. There is nothing humanitarian about the existing shelter system, and the plan to place migrants in outdoor tents in flood zones as temperature drops is cruel and potentially fatal. We are here to say our city must do better. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, I guess uh, next we'll go to Peter Malvin. Or thank you. Thank you. Peter's not here, so I'm going to speak on his behalf. Uh, thank you, Committee Chair Hanif, and to the City Council for holding this important hearing and the opportunity for to testify in front of you today. My name is Corinne Walker, and I work for the Safety Net Project at the Urban Justice Center. We are submitting more detailed written testimony, but we feel it's important, imperative that we get the verbal testimony to you as, as quickly as possible. Since the new administration came into office in January, we have witnessed a steady, increasingly aggressive assault on, uh, on homeless people across the city, across the five boroughs. The construction of a refugee camp through the creation of a giant tent on a, in a flood prone zone uh, on the margins of the Bronx as we move into fall and winter clearly indicate that, there is, that, uh, that this is a runaround. We are begging that the city, that these plans are clearly intended to undermine the city's sacrosanct right to shelter, something that's been in place for four decades and, has this, and that countless thousands of homeless New Yorkers have relied, have relied upon. We are this is yet another effort by the city to hide rather than help people of color as well. The city is scapegoating migrants as the cause of a homelessness crisis that they've failed to manage. The city has seen an increase in asylum seekers, but we've also seen eviction, domestic violence, and, and affordability crises that are causing large numbers of people to enter the shelter system, to, uh, to enter shelters. Moreover, by creating a new system only for asylum seekers, the, the mayor has clearly, is clearly opening the door to providing lesser care to those in need. There is nothing humane about the city's plan. In fact, it's downright barbaric. What the city is doing is part of a long line of efforts by different mayors to try to act, limit access to DHS shelters rather than focus on getting homeless people into permanent housing, the only true solution to addressing homelessness. The mayor has available to him significant housing resources as HPD, NYCHA, and elsewhere, as well as the ability to challenge widespread source of, source of income discrimination that brokers routinely use. The, the city could also prioritize, prioritize, prioritize excuse me, placement of people into permanent housing in all of these ways. They could also open new hotels and facilities as they did during COVID in, res in response to the pandemic when people need to get out of the out of congregate shelters. They could do this, but instead of having, instead of having to talk about the painful reality of them opening shelters in a flood prone zone on a parking lot in the margins of the city as we enter the winter season, our cooler temperatures. For most of this year, thousands of people have been shoved from subways into the, sh into the streets by city agencies, DHS, NYPD, sanitation, parks, et cetera though very few have gotten housing. Our, our office works with the homeless individuals who sleep on subways and encampments and in the shelters. We know firsthand that these, sweeps end up with the, that these sweeps end up with people losing key belongings, chief among them medical, and, other, medical and, other, and paperwork, such as their birth certificates, maybe even their uh, IDs. The, uh, the, thank you again. Thank I, you. Uh, again, you can all submit longer testimony. Uh, we accept written testimony up to 72 hours after the hearing. Okay. And thank you so much for being here with us since 11 or earlier when we started the rally. So I see you and I deeply, deeply appreciate all the work that you're doing. My pleasure, Counselor. Thank you. Next, we will move to Adama Ba, followed by Power Malu. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Adam Abba. I'm an immigration advocate. I'm also formally undocumented. When I first heard about these buses, it was very important for me to step up and assist because I knew the city will fail these folks like they have failed me. I'm gonna talk about what's going on in DHS. I sat here and listened to a lot of lies that DHS has said. These migrants are being abused by DHS. The process of what happens is once they are left Port Authority where we are every day, they, we shuttle them to the shelter where they're then sitting there for hours, sometimes 17 to hours sitting just waiting to be intaked. Once they aren't intake, they're given a metro card, one-way metro card, instructions in English how to get to their destination. They are not instructed how to get there in another language at all. Once they get there to the shelter that they are supposed to be at, they are told there's no bed for them, they must leave, and they are escorted by DHS police. 
if they do not leave, NYPD is called on them. And folks leave because they cannot risk being arrested because they are not undocumented, they're still asylees waiting to be processed. Once they leave these facilities, they're sleeping in the streets. They are calling my team, they're calling South Bronx Mutual Aid, they're calling Power, they're calling Hennessy, and they're asking us to pick them up. We have been in the streets until 1 a.m. trying to house these folks. We have 18-year-old migrants with adult males in the shelter. There's so many ongoing safety issues at this DHS shelter. I have sent countless of emails to every elected official for help, but I am constantly ignored and told that this is not going on. Um, DHS has been truly in denial about what's going on. African migrants aren't allowed on these Abbott buses. So when they do arrive, which they are arriving in other routes, they're not adequately being taken care of. Their halal meals are not being taken care of. Their dietary needs, sorry, their dietary needs are not being taken care of. Their religious needs not taken care of. Another issue that's happening in the DHS shelter is clothing. These migrants are coming off the buses with just the clothing on their backs, sometimes shorts and flip-flops. For weeks, they would have the same thing on with no support. These DHS shelters do not have social service or social worker to work with them. The city has not prepared for this. There is no social service for undocumented folks, and we're trying to build that, but we're met with a lot of pushbacks. For um, the intakes, the being kicked out is constantly a thing. Every 10 days, undocumented folks have to recertify. If they do not recertify, they are kicked out of the shelter. We had two migrants that were kicked out of the shelter last night at midnight. We recorded, well, the migrants themselves recorded their interaction because no one believed them as to what is going on. The welcoming center is not so welcoming because they're being returned back to us for us to help them. We have proof of everything that we're saying. We have countless of pictures, videos, and emails. So I'm not, I'm, I'm upset and you could hear it in my voice because I'm, they're making me sound like I'm a lunatic. But we're not, we're advocating for folks that have been silenced. Thank you. Uh, Power, you can go ahead. Oh. My name is Power Malu. I um, represent artists, athletes, activists um, based in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, our team has been at the Port Authority um, almost, I'm going to say, every day. Um, you hear my voice like this because it's a result of constantly trying to advocate for the migrants, the asylum seekers that are coming in. Um, at the same time, when they do arrive on the bus, we are not sugarcoating anything. We are letting them know that their journey has been long, and unfortunately, it's going to be long, it's going to continue to be long here in New York City, as because we say that we are a sanctuary city, and as representatives of New York City, we have to make sure that we advocate for these people and we tell them the truth. And they are faced with a lot of pushback. There are not enough translators at the centers. As Adama um, has been mentioning, um, we actually go to these spaces and we try to translate and we try to help out and we get met with aggression and pushback. Um, we're not met with any kindness. We bring food um, to these places and they rush people inside. They tell them they shouldn't be outside, go inside when they see us. They know who we are. We meet them with love and empathy at the Port Authority and we see that there's also a show that happens when a lot of uh, well, politicians or whoever wants to take pictures with people, they come to this space to do that. And we want to make sure that it's not just, hey, welcome to New York City and that's it. We're actually going to the airports. We're following up. We're going to Randall's Island to pick people up that are stranded, that are told at 11 p.m. that they have to go to another shelter. Or their excuses, well, they arrived at 10 o'clock. We had this paper for them waiting at 5 o'clock. You can't wait till the next morning. You you know that these people are new into this country. After 10 p.m., we know as New Yorkers how messed up the train system is with all the train work that goes on. So you're trying to tell these people how to get to another place where we know that they're going to get turned away. So for us, it's all about how can we continue to represent New York City as it is put on the map and, and 
and being told to the rest of the world that we do welcome people, but yet we're pushing them away. Here, at, when we're at the Port Authority, we provide food for them. We're asking other organizations to pull from their budgets to help us out. And that's all based off of the relationships that we have. We're providing food, as Team TLC has, has um, testified. We're helping to reticket people. We're doing all of this work that we don't have the funding to do, but we have friends and resources that we're counting on to help us because we know that if we're not there, these people are gonna be abandoned. They're gonna be shipped and pushed into these buses from one bus to the next bus, and then they're gonna be left stranded in New York City trying to fend for themselves. So all we're trying to do is represent this city as is supposed to be a sanctuary city. We're trying to do the right thing by these migrants because all of us are migrants. If you weren't born here 500 years ago, and you didn't have family members that were here 500 years ago, you are an immigrant. I was born and raised in the Lower East Side. My parents were born in Puerto Rico, but I consider myself an immigrant, and I tell that to these people, and I thank them for shining a light on a system that has been in shambles. This housing system, this, 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 this shelter system, we have unhoused people living on the streets because they rather live on the streets than in these shelters, and now the migrants that are coming in are doing us all a favor by shining a light on this system that has had no accountability for years and years and years. Since I was about seven or eight years old, I remember my mom going to HRA to get food stamps and how they disrespected her because she didn't speak the language. Now, at my age, I'm going to these shelter systems trying to represent for these people, and I see how they are to be, continue to be disrespected. And I'm disrespected because at first they think that I'm coming for shelter. And I say, no, I'm trying to help you with this process. We, we know you don't have translators here. I'm just trying to help you smooth out this process, and I'm still getting met with this, 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 this disrespect and this, like, we don't care. There's, nobody's going to do anything to us. No matter how many emails you send, nothing's going to happen. And I'll just leave it at that. I'm very passionate, and that's just off the top of my head, but there's way more, and we have film and footage and pictures to prove all the lies, to debunk everything that they've been saying. They always say, oh no, we provide beds to everybody, we provide clothing to everybody, we provide food to everybody. Then why is it that it takes these un these nonprofit organizations, unfunded nonprofit organizations, to do their work? Yes. Thank you. Well, I did want to learn a little bit more from uh, uh, Adama about the African migrants who, I remember the several weeks, you know, were taken to a mosque, a community center, and then the community figured out a meal train and uh, clothing and um, other expenses for them. Could you just speak a little bit more about um, how our African siblings are being treated in this process? Sure. So African migrants are arriving in New York City just like the Venezuelans. But once they, receive to, once they arrive to Texas, they are held in detention center and then transferred to Atlanta detention center. Atlanta has a lot of strict rules. Once they are released at detention center, they're dependent on black-led organizations to pay their way here. We pay for their flight and their buses here. Once they arrive, they are not welcomed in the shelter. There's no language access whatsoever. You do not have Wolof. They're, they're, they will sit them to the side and tell them there's no way we can help you. Um, they also turn them away from the shelter. Once they leave, they go to the mosque. There are thousands and thousands of African migrants sleeping in a mosque. The, the borough that has the most African migrants is the Bronx. The second is Harlem. Um, the third is Queens. I am not, uh, I cannot say which, what mosque they are. There are only two mosques that said that I can expose them. Well, not expose them, sorry. I can tell which they are but um, they're not being taken care of. They're dependent on organizations like, like South Bronx Mutual Aid, Power, um, so, uh, what is the other organization? Sorry, but they're just dependent on the community to help them. The city has not assisted in any way for African migrants. Rap, uh, Rap of the Bronx. Thank you. No more questions for this panel. Thank you, and again, um, any other testimony you have, you can definitely email it over to us. Uh, moving on, we will call Terry Lawson, followed by Scott Hutchins, Charisma White, and Dimitri Daniel Glinsky. Terry, you can go ahead when the sergeant's call time. 
Starting time. Good evening. My name is Terry Lawson, and I'm the executive director of Unlocal. We provide community education, outreach, and legal representation for New York City's undocumented immigrant communities. Since we were founded 10 years ago, we've always been devoted to advocating for those seeking safety at our borders. I'm also the co-founder and steering committee member of the Bronx Immigration Partnership. Thank you, Chair Hanif, the Immigration Committee, the Council for holding this hearing. As providers, it is critical that we provide our communities with accurate and the most up-to-date information as these puzzle pieces keep shifting. While we applaud the centralized efforts, some of the centralized efforts testified about today, <clears throat> we have been forced to ask ourselves why it has taken the city so long to undertake an effort of this nature, given the fact that, as Councilmember Hanif shared many hours ago <laughs> at the beginning of this hearing, we have always been a place where immigrants seek safety and stability. We ask why so many of these current efforts have been unfunded, under-resourced, and reliant on volunteer time. We know that the work of showing up for crises like these so often falls on BIPOC and impacted individuals who are too often underpaid and overworked. As providers of immigration legal services, we at Unlocal know that we operate in a racist and xenophobic system that causes harm and one that we sincerely hope will be abolished. As an organization, we refuse to perpetuate that harm by asking our staff, many of whom are BIPOC and impacted, to overextend themselves to meet a timeline to respond to a crisis created by political actors. We believe that the legal services RFP released by Moya does not come close to covering the true costs of providing legal services the city says it plans to offer, as Councilmember Hanif noted. We heard Dr. Long testify that legal services are provided at the Asylum Seeker Navigation Center. And while we do applaud some of our colleagues who've been working diligently there this past month, the RFP, which we also did not submit a proposal for, does not come anywhere close to funding legal services for the new immigrants in this city, certainly not for the 100 individuals per day as the RFP contemplates. I want to underscore the point made about the urgency of creating long-term plans made by both Councilmember Gutierrez and Chair Hanif. And I also thank Chair Hanif for her questions regarding the RFP and look forward to Moya fully answering them. We too are troubled by the low rates of funding and, and the rate of 250 per case. And we know that that rate is going to plummet. We, dis we disagree with C Commissioner Iskol. This is not an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Those of us here today have been doing this work for decades. It's not unprecedented. The city's long overdue efforts covered here have been prompted by political wins. And while we understand that later is better than never, we again urge this administration to listen to the experts with deep experience, both here and across the country, and specifically members of impacted communities, organizers, advocates, Time social workers, case managers, and educators. We heard the commissioner almost done. We heard the commissioner testify that they spoke with Bronx stakeholders on the same day they decided on the location of Orchard Beach, which is deeply concerning. The Thank testimony you. regarding separation of families goes to show how much trauma accompanies the migration patterns forced by our inhumane policies and that our city agencies do not operate in a vacuum. This is a time that requires deep collaboration and coordination with community members and stakeholders and a critical rethinking of how we treat all immigrants in this city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to Scott Hutchins, followed by Chris Mawai and Dimitri Daniel Glinski. You all can go ahead. I'm here testifying on behalf of myself and Neighbors Together. My name is Scott Hutchins. I'm a formerly homeless, physically disabled college graduate who has spent over eight years in the New York City shelter system. As a member leader with Neighbors Together and other groups, I have advocated for homeless New Yorkers and vulnerable tenants across the state of New York. In 2018, I Picture the Homeless produced The Business of Homelessness, on which I was the co-author, but our recommendations for how the shelter system should change were ignored. I languished in the New York City shelter system for 99 months. I was verbally abused and intimidated in the shelter system, was impacted by unsanitary conditions and unhealthy food, developing gout, impetigo, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol, and was once physically attacked by a fellow resident. I desperately wanted to get out of the shelter, but couldn't. I was expected to leave without reliable employment and was given no help other than threats of failure to comply if I didn't apply for disability, which was consistently denied because I can do desk work if businesses would just respond to my applications. 
Faced with source of, source of income discrimination and landlords who would not take my city FEBS voucher, I needed to seek the aid of nonprofits outside of the shelter system to finally secure housing. The homelessness crises and the current context with asylum seekers are products of a lack of political will to make housing a human right in New York State. If we house New Yorkers in weeks instead of having individuals wait for years to secure housing like myself, the city would not be violating the, its right to shelter mandate with, a, with the vulnerable asylum seekers. If the shelter system is overcrowded, let's empty it. The city should house individuals quicker by vigorously combating source of income discrimination and fixing issues with a city FEPS voucher. The city should end the 90-day rule that forces individuals to be in a shelter for three months before they can gain access to a city FEPS voucher. The city should get rid of utility allowance that lowers the purchasing power of the voucher, making it harder to find an apartment. I applaud any effort to help asylum seekers gain access to social services, and I hope the committee sees the link between the homelessness crisis we have been in for years and this influx of people into the shelter system. The city must create a voucher that works to effectively and efficiently move people into housing. By fixing the issues with city FEPs, we can help combat overcrowding and needless delays with shelter stays. We can establish housing as a human right. This is a matter of, political, of if we have the political will to do so. I would like to thank the Committee on Immigration for the time to testify today. And I want to say that all these sweeps and these tent cities and everything, um, the, the mayor destroying people's property, that's fascist and it needs to stop. Thank you. Um, Charisma, you can go ahead. Hello, my name is Charisma White. I'm here testifying on behalf of myself, Neighbors Together. I am a housing and homeless advocate for over seven years now. I have been in and out of shelter system myself since I was 16. The shelter system is overcrowded because the city of New York makes it extremely difficult for people like me to gain access to stable housing not because of migrants, it's the city were able to house people quicker, it would free up shelter space to help vulnerable migrants. The city has to see the connection between homelessness crisis and it's failed to address the, the current situation with migrants. It took me three years to find an apartment with a voucher in New York City shelter system due to source of income discrimination. Shelters are supposed to be temporary faculties for emergencies. To have the voucher denied for years was extremely taxing on my mental health and my family. <clears throat> because of that, <clears throat> I recently lost my son within the shelter system because he was in a abusive relationship and I referred the young man that was trying to stay with, with me and my household to a SRO and he lured my son to his room and overdosed him. Most of these places they send you to and try to set you up in are not safe. They're separating families. Adult, even if you have an adult child he is still your family and they might need to be in a family setting, not separated in shelters that are, um, how would you say, unclean, unsafe, and the staff is unscrupulous. Okay, yeah. now it's better. All right, thank you, Chair Hanif. Our American Russian Speaking Association for Civil and Human Rights is the oldest active organization of political exiles from Russia, including Azalis and asylum seekers and their friends and allies from other post Soviet countries. Uh, mostly for lack of time, I will limit my remarks to uh, my own community picture in this overall bigger. Uh, humanitarian and moral crisis. And I will um, address some things that are different in focus, but that is this hearing is not just the best, but perhaps the only place where our community can come and address them at this time. 
Uh, since I spoke here to since I testified here in March, CBP reported uh, 12,000 encounters with arrivals from Russia on the U.S.-Mexican border only, and this is 95 times more than two years ago. Uh, this was before the exodus of the past 10 days that you might have read in the news. Uh, and, uh, about a quarter or a half of them are likely to end up in New York City or in the area. Yet my community, the third largest linguistic minority in New York, is a social service desert. Uh, the CBOs that have the cultural competency, that know uh, the community from the inside, are not funded, have not, no staff, no volunteer, volunteers to respond to this crisis. They certainly would be disqualified for any of the RFPs that were discussed, and we have that experience in the past. One of the major reasons for this situation is, in fact, uh, the influence of the other kind of newcomers from my part of the world in the city in the past 20 years. And these are the Kremlin-connected oligarchs and their local enablers here who control the narrative and the logic of funding of anything related to Russian Americans. They invested billions plundered from my country, not just in Park Avenue houses, but in our most influential philanthropies and our politics to push their agendas and to silence those who opposed their rule, denied them the opportunity to rise and to be heard in places like this. Uh, just Google, for example, the Genesis Philanthropy Group that was set up by the Kremlin's bankers right here in New York and how much it gave to my beloved UGA and other agencies to buy that influence. And our people have seen this influence staying power in social service agencies and local government offices from Brighton Beach to Washington Heights and beyond, wherever our people uh, live and find this door shut in their faces. I have four recommendations for our city council. One, urge our Department of Homeland Security to give TPS to Russians temporarily in the states who have not been affiliated with sanctioned entities. Start recognizing those Russian Americans who fought for peace, human rights, and justice back home. Honor anti-war leaders in Russia who have a connection to New York, such as the world-famous political prisoner Vladimir Karamurza. He spent a lot of time in our city. For full disclosure, he and I worked for the same employer here 10 years ago. Many in New York remember him warmly. Pass a resolution in his support. Make him an honorary citizen of New York. Hold hearings on the impact of the Kremlin-connected wealth and oligarchs and their enablers on our public life, on the Russian-speaking community, and how to mitigate its consequences. Set up an interfaith, interethnic task force on rebuilding social services from scratch for immigrants from Ukraine, Russia, and neighboring countries of the region, so that our exiles, including many high-class professionals, could finally both get services and serve their community. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry that I had to step out, step away. Um, as you know, we've been here since 1 p.m. and neither of us had breaks for the bathroom. Um, I, will I will follow and listen to um, your testimony. Sorry, I missed yours and the rest of yours, um, but no questions for this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we'll call Nara Milanic, David Miranda, Stephanie Rupp, and Yajaira Saavedra. <laughs> and I apologize if I killed anyone's name. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect it to talk, so. Hello, my name is Yahaira Saavedra. I am from La Morada Restaurant. We are a group of undocumented family that runs a restaurant in the Bronx. We have also been in the uh, forefront of the immigration um, movement for decades. Uh, my brother um, famously self-deported to infiltrate um, in detention centers just to bring light on the abuses of, of the detention centers under the Obama administration. So I personally know um, through my family um, history um, how much, and through my own history as a, as a dreamer, as a DACA recipient, what it is to be undocumented and what it is to be abused by this country. Um, I also know that um, what a detention center looks like uh, from the many detention centers my brother infiltrated and from just um, constantly advocating for immigrants um, across the nation. Um, so what is being built at Orchard Beach right now is a detention center. 
and I have little to no faith that um, after this is built that it will end there. So it's scary to think um, that detention centers are now being allowed um, in sanctuary cities. I also want to say that uh, through my plight of doing radical um, changes in the immigration system, I have yet to see Manuel Castro in the forefront with me. So um, I find it odd that he is here as <laughs> leading Moya. Um, I also uh, questioned uh, why is it that a small business like La Morada, uh, who, whose budget doesn't exceed one million, <laughs> not even close to one million, um, we are still feeding migrants every single day and um, not a poor authority because that's where we have been excluded, where we have been violently threatened um, <laughs> that we will be arrested if we're at poor authority. Um, so we go to the shelters um, because migrants call us and tell us that they haven't eaten in days. So we visit them at the shelters. Most of them are hotels all over the city to bring hot meals. And this is coming from our po pocket and our budget, again, does not exceed the millions, not even $1 million. And you have all these non-for-profits who have close ties, personals and donor ties, to the mayor receiving millions of dollars. And they are doing a whole lot less than we are. Uh, we are working close to the South Bronx Mutual Aid and the uh, Mutual Aid Collective. So everything that we do, uh, we have receipts, we have proof of. Uh, we have pr been present at shelters. Just yesterday, I was at a shelter hotel near um, LaGuardia Airport and counted easily four migrant children who had high fevers and were asking for medication. And uh, this is us continue being in the front lines, providing um, whatever help we can immediately with our own budgets, um, not receiving any help from the federal government, from the state government, and being excluded in all ways by Moya. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Miranda, and I am the senior staff attorney at Covenant House New York. Um, I would like to thank the committee for um, allowing me to testify today. Uh, I am here on behalf of the entire Covenant House community. Uh, please refer to my written testimony for more information on Covenant House. I do want to talk about uh, the, re the, the effect of the crisis on uh, young people, particularly the young people that we serve who are experiencing homelessness and are under 21. Uh, we are proud to be on the front lines at Covenant House, helping these vulnerable young people by providing food, safety, shelter, and other essential services. We are grateful to be able to help, but we are finding that the situation is stretching the available resources available in New York, especially with immigration legal services. Our proximity to Port Authority and our youth-specific focus lead us to be an obvious choice. Those who are already staying with us will go to Port Authority to meet the arriving buses and bring back groups of youth in the hopes that we have available beds. Other times, youth are first referred to churches or shelters in the adult homeless system. Caring staff at those shelters seeing their young age will send them to us. I have heard stories of a young man who was 18 years old who was at the 30th Street shelter who was sexually assaulted in the middle of the night and, and left that shelter, slept in the street that night, and luckily was able to find a bed with us the next day. I first noticed an increase in immigrant youth in the early summer before the buses. Prior to the buses, we already saw an uptick in the number of undocumented youth at Covenant House. In the past, we had a handful of undocumented youth in need of immigration legal services throughout an entire year. Since the buses began arriving, we now have 38 immigrant youth from Central and South America. We would be seeing more if we had beds. So I understand the DHS's characterization that there are beds available and anyone has a bed if they want one. That is not the case. We want to be able to accept every young person that comes to our doors, but unfortunately, the, our beds, the number of beds that we have is finite. And sometimes we do have to turn young people away because there are simply no beds. 
Most of these young people are fleeing persecution, parental abandonment, and starvation. Prior to July, the number of young people who we referred elsewhere because we were at capacity on any given month was in the sing single digits. This month alone, there were 58 youth who we were unable to shelter, 58 youth that we had to turn away, youth that came back, some of them were eventually able to get a bed and some were not. We have implemented Spanish-speaking mental health groups and life skills. My role at Covenant House is to provide legal representation for these youth. I am the only lawyer in, in the Covenant House crisis shelter and for Covenant House youth. And I might be the only lawyer in New York City exclusively dedicated to helping young people experiencing homelessness. That's why I'm here, so the youth can get the help where they are. Until recently, most of my caseload was not immigration. It was name changes. It was for, for victims of, of trafficking and transgender clients. Those issues now have had to go to the side because I have to focus, I have to triage, and make sure that my immigrant clients are served if they're in deportation proceedings. Thank you. Um, I know that you've uh, submitted your full testimony, I and I look forward to touching base with Covenant House. I believe we're doing that. Um, we're going to be reaching out on Monday to schedule some time to learn a little bit more about what you've shared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're calling Stephanie Rupp. You can go ahead when the sergeants call time. Thank you for everything. Starting time. Good evening. Um, thank you to everyone for holding on to this uh, very uh, long, throughout this very long hearing. We are so grateful um, that you have been able to hang in there for the whole afternoon. My name is Stephanie Rupp, and I'm a resident of the Morningside Heights Manhattan Valley neighborhood. We have heard from so many wonderful organizations today, and we are very grateful for all of the work that's going on on the ground at Port Authority and in communities throughout our city. Four weeks ago, our neighborhood received over 95 families in the shelter at 107th Street and Central Park West, three blocks from where I'm speaking now. As community members, we provide empathetic, immediate, and informed support to our newest neighbors. We can't and shouldn't and don't try to reinvent the wheel of providing comprehensive immigration services, which we rely on from city agencies and Catholic charities, and as we have heard, most importantly, from all of the amazing NGOs and grassroots organizations in our city. But as networks of neighbors throughout our city, which bring together ordinary citizens, just residents in our, on our streets, people like me, faith communities, charity groups, community groups, food pantries, local businesses, and more. We are all rallying to support the new families have, who have joined our city. We are not an NGO, we're not a charitable organization, we are just a neighborhood. We have provided essential items to the 95 families who are our new neighbors and have also been supporting families who have come to us seeking resources here in our neighborhood coming to us from shelters throughout Manhattan, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, because these families have not been able to access crucial supplies that they have needed over the past month through city services. The neighborhood level out outreach efforts have been crucial. These families have walked from other places to our neighborhood just to find a pair of shoes, some warm clothing, or a hot meal. With the incredible outpouring of logistical and volunteer support from our growing neighborhood network, in Morningside Heights, we have received, organized, and distributed tens of thousands of articles of clothing and toiletries, including much needed diapers, feminine hygiene supplies, asthma medication, um, all kinds of over-the-counter drugs for fever treatments for children who are sick, yeast infection medications for women with, with infections. We've supplied school supplies, toys and books, fresh fruit, and hot meals. All of these outreach have, activities have unfolded each and every day over the past month. We're not an NGO, we're just a neighborhood. We have, yes, um, our na neighborhood network has been actively engaged in meeting families' needs for communication, informa information sharing, and guidance, accompaniment to appointments and meetings throughout the city. Drawing on small donations from many individuals in our neighborhood, we have purchased phones and phone plans for every family that needed one, negotiating a fair price with a local mobile phone store. Time expired. Um, 
we have so much to do and we need communication and we need connection with all of these amazing organizations and with our city. Thank you for holding this important meeting and for hearing our voices. Um, we need boots on the ground and we're grateful to everyone who's here at the end of the meeting for helping to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll call Kareem Walker and Eric Lee, followed by Amshula Jayaram. And since I only see Eric Lee up here, you can go ahead. <laughs> Starting time. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Lee. I'm Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Uh, thank you, Chair Hanif and members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. Um, we are grateful to uh, the chair as well as members of the council for defending and reaffirming the right to shelter. Um, every person in New York City should be afforded this right regardless of immigration status. Um, while we appreciate the difficult task before the mayor, we must continue to uphold the right for every person in New York City. Um, with regards to the uh, emergency management intake process we heard today, it was troubling to hear that people would not be explained that they have the right to shelter until they first take a bus and go all the way out to the tent facility. Um, this just highlights that the new process they're putting in place is really more for the ease of institutional processes rather than being a client-centered approach. Um, while no one could have foretold the migrant crisis, um, the city's shelter capacity crisis could have been avoided altogether, um, as contributing factors were completely within the city's ability to address, um, including longer lengths of stay within shelter due to bureaucratic delays in processing rental assistance and public benefits cases, um, lack of new shelter capacity because of nimbyism, and delays in DHS contract registration and reimbursement processes, which have weakened nonprofits' abilities uh, to respond to the city's request to stand up new shelter facility sites. Rather than creating an outdoor tent facility within a flood zone during hurricane season, um, HSU recommends that the city continue to locate empty blocks of hotel rooms, stand up traditional shelters, or convert other suitable structures which can quickly be stood up to meet the immediate need. While utilizing their creativity to locate underutilized sites such as dorm rooms, vacant offices with shower facilities and gyms, which can quickly be repurposed through DHS's emergency proc procurement contracts. Um, to address the longstanding issues that have led to DHS's current shelter capacity crisis, we recommend that DHS focus on three priority areas, expanding eviction prevention and legal services to prevent more people from becoming homeless, establishing a reliable DHS shelter pipeline to create purpose-built service-rich shelters and normalize the fiscal operations of DHS contracted programs. Um, there was uh, comments earlier from, I believe it was Councilmember Gu uh, Guillotes um, regarding shelter staff shortages. And we wanna like echo that. Um, shelter providers regularly experience fiscal delays um, individual providers are awaiting budget authority to use their accruals for hiring and retention bonuses given that they have high turnovers, turnover and burnout right now. Um, and to Councilmember De La Rosa's comments around HRA and DHS vacancies that is absolutely leading to delays processing rental assistance and public assistance uh, applications and they really need to staff up in order to actually get through the workload. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It, um, if anyone who has not testified at this point wishes to do so, <laughs> please either you know, consult the sergeants or use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no one, uh, Chair, do you have any other questions or? No questions, I can give my closing. Um, well, thank you all. I mean, everybody's gone from chambers. Um, but for the folks who are still tuned in and for the folks on Zoom, to everybody uh, who stayed with us throughout the day, uh, starting at 11 with our rally, just thank you. It is a Friday. It is nearly 7 p.m. And um, what was demonstrated today uh, just shows the commitment New Yorkers have to asylum seekers, and I'm particularly talking about uh, the folks from the public who testified. Um, You've heard me ask some heavy-hitting questions to the administration. 
around right to shelter, um, how exactly the HERCs are gonna be built up, um, to mental health services, to uh, probing uh, about legal services and the asylum process, the costs uh, that will be needed to meet the needs of our newest students in our schools, and much more. Um, but of course, we didn't cover many, many topics, including those pertaining to youth, in particular, and youth in shelter, um, LGBTQ in shelters, um, and then African migrants, which we only got to touch on briefly. So um, my hope is that we will continue to use the council's um, hearing authority to be able to engage in further investigation and conversations. Um, I wanna thank the countless organizations the advocates, the neighbors um, who showed up to share the work they've been doing since uh, before the administration got involved. Um, thank you for sharing the deep frustration um, by the mismanagement and uh, the delays in services being procured, um, the lack of funding to our community-based partners and so much more. Um, I'm committed as the Chair of Immigration to continue to have these conversations and to push the admin to do better. Um, we have to get this right and I deeply know that New York City can get this right. So thank you all so much and I will gavel us out.